Honourable Senator, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous people. Are there any documents to be tabled? Clark. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. So we um, thank you, Clark. And ah, Senator Watt, are you seeking the call? Oh, Senator Cox. Yeah. I seek leave to move a motion in relation to opening new gas fields and emission reductions. Pursuant to Is contingent leave granted. Pursuant to contingent notice Senator standing Cox. in the name of Senator Waters, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that a motion in relation to opening of new gas fields and emission reductions may be moved immediately, determined without amendment and taken precedent over all business for 30 minutes. In the Northern Territory, Approval for Empire Energy to frack the Beedaloo was recklessly stitched up yesterday afternoon. Today is the last sitting day for the Senate before the PM goes to Glasgow and embarrasses Australia on the world stage by not only refusing to lift 2030 targets but expanding coal and gas fields. Yesterday, on the eve of world leaders descending on Glasgow to lift the 2030 targets, the Northern Territory Labor government approved fracking to open the Beedaloo Basin in the Northern Territory. Shame. Mr President, this is urgent. There is nothing more urgent or more important for this Senate to be debating today. The federal government, with the support of the opposition, voted to give $50 million to gas companies and donors so that mining interests could take precedence over traditional owners' rights to their land and safe groundwater. Shame. In August of this year, the Gadigi, Yanawu, Garawa, Jingli, Mudbara and Alawa nations came to this place to vent their fury to the federal government for the fast tracking of gas fracking on their country instead of us helping Indigenous people. The Beedaloo Basin is important in the climate fight because the basin is so massive. It would cause us the single biggest jump in Australia's pollution, and the Northern Territory government has said it will blow up Australia's emissions by a staggering 6 per cent a year. We need to suspend standing orders right now and debate this motion today, our last sitting day, because we need to hold this government to account. Gas is as dirty as coal and the Beedaloo gas project will be worse for the climate, worse than the Adani coal mine, which itself is a climate bomb. Our climate crisis is the most existential threat to our well-being and the well-being of all life on this planet. This new Labor climate bomb threatens our chance of stopping global warming. Scientists say no more coal and gas, but Labor isn't listening. We've been drawing attention to our climate crisis all week, but still haven't got any sense out of this government about how on earth they can justify going to Glasgow without a commitment to slash our carbon pollution by 2030. After this announcement, it's clear the only way we'll get climate action is to kick the Liberals out and put Greens in the balance of power where we'll push the next government to actually take this climate crisis seriously. Australia's carbon emissions could increase as much as 23 per cent from this project which is a slap in the face for all Australians who are fighting every day for the climate. This is urgent because you know what? 
They can't justify their climate denialism. After the Duke and Gorge disaster, you would have thought that the governments in this place would listen to traditional owners. But we see time and time again Labor siding with their mates in the coalition. They fear that chemicals used in the processes could contaminate their groundwater. This comes directly from the traditional owners who told, told us in inquiries this is what's going to happen. These are the skies, the water and the land that must be protected. Scott Morrison gifted the Beedaloo Exploration Drilling, drilling Grants in March to help speed up gas production in this region. Well, here we are in the middle of a climate crisis. Shame. The basin is one of five gas fields of Commonwealth plans to develop for the gas-led recovery of the COVID-19 crisis, which I don't know how they could even justify. They said that the money would be better spent on housing, education, um, health and opportunities to lift Aboriginal people out of the grinding poverty inflicted, inflicted on many of them. Beedaloo traditional owner Johnny Wilson told a Senate inquiry into oil and gas exploration and production. He said, I still live in a tin shack. My floor is bare ground. When will I get money for housing? When do I get a house? He said many Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory were struggling to access basic services in their communities. All week, the Greens have been calling to debate the carbon targets that our Prime Minister is taking on behalf to Glasgow in just 10 days' time. Oh, Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Um, Labor will. Uh, this is, the, I think, the third um, time, fourth time that we've had a suspension motion moved by the Greens, and Labor has um, supported the suspension uh, on each of those occasions, um, but I, I would say that the motion that's being moved um, that the Greens seek to debate today is just another demonstration of the desire of the Greens, I think, to keep the climate wars going um, in their political interest as opposed to actually doing something in the national interest. Um, I think the Greens' political party, as a protest movement, have made it clear that they want to stoke division on every side. They want to have a go at them. They want to have, it, have a go at us. Um, the, the actions they took 10 years ago to vote down an ETS, they have not learned a thing from it. In 2019, when they did their convoy and, and picked fights wherever they went, that worked so well, didn't it? That worked really well. That delivered the outcome. And in a week, where we have this government fighting itself, tearing itself apart, the chaos, the disunity, the pressure that the Senate should be putting on this government to actually get a position Order. to take to Glasgow on behalf Order. of the nation, the Greens political party come in here and want to pick a fight with everybody. Yep all for their social media, not about an outcome, not about the national interest, nothing like that. We think the suspension Order. should be supported so that this chamber can debate a matter of national importance that is in front and centre of every member of this chamber's mind. We do agree with that. What we disagree with fundamentally is the way that the Greens conduct themselves around this debate. And it's all about their political interest. It's all about continuing the fights not resolving everything, not having a position, Order. not bringing people together, not having a consensus view, not putting the pressure on the government. It's all about trying to pick a fight with the Labor Party. And again, as I said yesterday, it didn't work so well in 2013, it didn't work in 2016, it didn't work in 2019. So how about you reflect on the way you conduct yourselves? and actually work in the national interest as opposed to your narrow political interest. Because it hasn't worked picking a fight with people who want to deliver real action on climate change is not going to work. You might get, you might get your membership um, endorsing this approach, but think a bit more broadly about the matters that this nation needs, and do they need the Greens picking a fight with the Labor Party every morning at the beginning of the sitting Order. week? Senator I would, I would submit, Mr. President, that that is not the most uh, constructive way to pursue 
uh, this matter. What I would say is that the division, the disunity and the chaos of the government in its inability and Mr Morrison's inability to lead his government and resolve his position two weeks out from climate is, should be the focus of this chamber. The single focus should be on having a government that actually can represent the Australian people in two weeks' time, because at the moment we don't have that. That should be the matter that this ch chamber is trying to resolve, not trying to just blow up everything and pick a fight with everybody and run a political campaign in your narrow political interests, because that is what you're doing. We support, but support the suspension. We support the ability for the chamber to discuss the matters uh, raised uh, around net zero by 2050 and the position that the government should be taking to Glasgow. So we do support that. We do not support the way the Greens conduct this debate or the divisive motions they move in this chamber at the beginning of uh, business every single morning. It's tired, it's lazy and it won't get you anywhere. Order, Senator Thorpe. Minister. Uh, I'm Sorry, Senator Roberts. I did see Senator Cash first, and the motion has been moved. So I do apologise. Um, uh, the question is: the question now be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells. Four minutes. Apologies, Senator Roberts. I didn't. I saw you after Senator Cash.
stop the bells. The question is that the question should be put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Davey, teller for the ayes, and Senator Urquhart, teller for the noes. Okay. 25, 23. Very uncomfortable. There being 25 ayes and 23 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. So I will put the motion as moved by Senator Cox. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for. This is the. This is the motion to suspend standing orders to consider the motion. Four minutes, I think. I've got no indication otherwise.
stop the bells. Uh, the question is on the motion as moved by Senator Cox. Uh, the ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Ruckett, tell her for the ayes. Senator Davey, tell her for the noes. There being 23 ayes and 26 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative, and we shall return to the order of business. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, National Disability Insurance Scheme Amendment, Improving Supports for At-Risk Participants Bill 2021, in committee. The committee is considering the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Scheme Amendment Improving Supports for At-Risk Participants Bill 2021 and the amendments on Sheet 1443 revised, moved by Senator Kim. Senator McKim, the question is that the Are you seeking the call, Senator McKim? The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Could you um, I, I do apologise. Could you um, clarify the question that you've just put, please, in terms yes. of which amendments? So the Thank amendments you. you moved yesterday, which were um, sheet 1443, you moved, you sought leave to move them together. So it's my intention to put those. Thank you, uh, Minister. Are you seeking the call? I'm just about to put the amendments. Thank you. Uh, just to in indicate that the government will not be supporting these amendments. Thank you. So the question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. So the question is that amendments one to three on sheet 1443 uh, by leave is moved by Senator Kim be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes. Order, there being 21 ayes and 25 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. <clears throat> Senator McKim. Thank you, uh, Deputy Senator President. Um, I uh, move um, the amendments standing in the name of uh, Senator Steelejohn and uh, Senator Farrell uh, on sheet 1444 revised. Thank you. So the question is that a minister. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to indicate that the government will not be supporting these amendments. Are you seeking the call, Senator Farrell? So the question is that um, the amendments as moved by Senator Kim on sheet 1444 number 1 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. So the question is that the amendments number one on sheet one triple four is moved by Senator Bakim be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator McGrath as teller for the noes. Order, there being 23 ayes and 27 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. <coughs> Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I uh, seek leave to move the amendments uh, standing uh, in the name of Senator Steele John and Senator Farrell on sheet 1426 by leave together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted, Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, we President. I move the motion. motion. I move the amendments. Thank you. Minister. Uh, the government won't be supporting these amendments. So the question is that the amendments on sheet uh, 1 to 13 on sheet 1426 by leave moved together be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? 
I believe the noes have it. The ayes have it. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. So the question is that the amendments 1 to 13 on sheet 1426 by leave as moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator McGrath as teller for the noes. <coughs> Order, there being 23 ayes and 27 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. <clears throat> Uh, senators, if you're not participating in the remainder of this debate, please leave quietly. So the question now is that the bill stand is printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The committee has considered the National Disability Insurance Scheme Amendment Improving Supports for At-Risk Participants Bill of 2021 and has agreed to it without amendments. Minister. That the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is, a motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I, I move that the bill now be read a third time. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the National Disability Insurance Scheme Act 2013 and for related purposes. Aye. Government business order of the day number two. Customs Amendment Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement Implementation Bill 2021 and a related bill. Second reading debate. Uh, Senator Wong. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak on the Customs Amendment Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement Implementation Bill 2021 and a related bill. 
Labor will be supporting the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement implementation bills. The partnership, RCEP as, as it is known, was signed on 15 November by 2020 by 15 countries. It is an agreement or partnership that includes the members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations ASEAN, Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand and Vietnam, as well as five non-ASEAN nations of Australia, China, Japan, New Zealand and South Korea. These are nations which make up 29 per cent of world GDP and 30 per cent of the world's population. RCEP is, quite simply, the biggest trade agreement in history. And negotiations for it started at the 21st, in 2012 at the 21st ASEAN Summit in Cambodia, and the negotiations were commenced by Labor, by Prime Minister Julia Gillard and Trade Minister Craig Emerson on behalf of Australia. From the beginning, Labor has supported Australia being actively involved in the negotiation of this partnership. Importantly, it's a process that has been led by ASEAN. RCEP includes nine of Australia's top 15 trading partners and economies which account for more than half of Australia's total two-way trade and more than two-thirds of our exports. Ratifying RCEP will mean Australia is part of the biggest trade agreement in the world. As Dr Geoffrey Wilson of the Perth US Asia Centre has argued, RCEP will be the world's second most important trade agreement on arrival, ranking behind only the WTO itself. In essence, RCEP creates new regional architecture for economic integration and strengthens the rules of many of Australia's existing free trade agreements. Importantly, RCEP includes core investment protections, rules requiring payment of compensation where investment is expropriated, minimum standards of treatment of investors under international law and compensation for losses due to conflict and civil strife. The agreement provides avenues for reducing non-tariff barriers, including in, in areas such as quarantine and technical standards, by promoting compliance with World Trade Organization rules and further improving cooperation and transparency. And finally, it supports economic capacity building, and in particular provides a dedicated chapter addressing the capability of small and medium enterprises in the region to benefit from the agreement. These protections and transparency provisions provide will provide greater certainty and confidence for Australian businesses looking to invest, and they will be helped by the partnership's single set, set of rules for exporters to use, rather than having to rely on the multiplicity of different rules and procedures under existing free trade agreements. So, this will cut or simplify a great deal of red tape for Australian SMEs and open up opportunities for Australian firms looking to utilise and integrate with regional supply chains. There are aspects of RCEP that we think should be vet, bet, better, and valid concerns have been raised, and I'll propose to go through some of these. RCEP, as it stands, does not have an environment chapter or labour chapter. And it, when Labor was last in government, Craig Emerson, as Trade Minister, sought to include these provisions. Regrettably, other RCEP members were not amenable to this. But opting out and retreating to the sidelines was not an option, and to do so would have set back our relationship with ASEAN nations significantly. A number of other concerns have been addressed, including ensuring that the partnership does not expand waivers of labour market testing for foreign workers. Further, the government has provided assurances that RCEP does not restrict domestic procurement arrangements in Australia at any level of government. It does not require privatisation of Australia, any Australian public services. It does not undermine the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. It does not undermine state or Commonwealth workplace laws or occupational licensing arrangements. It does not undermine Australia's anti-dumping regime. And it includes provision that limit, pro provisions that limit the right of the Commonwealth to regulate in the interests of public welfare or in relation to safe products, and RCEP does not include investor state dispute settlement provisions. Labor commends the work of civil society and, trade union, and, the, and the trade union movement in steering the government away from implementing ISDS as a basis for dispute settlement in all trade negotiations. The fact that we are seeing ISDS less and less in our international treaties is a testament to the campaigning of of the ACTU, AFTERNET and other organisations. Recent media reports that Clive Palmer is exploring the use of ISDS mechanisms to sue the Australian government reaffirm our opposition to them as a general provision in international trade deals. Having already forked out a million dollars on legal fees because the Prime Minister supported Mr Palmer's attempt to sue Western Australia, 
Australian taxpayers certainly don't want to be stung again by another vexatious suit. Unions and other civil society stakeholders have also expressed concern regarding the potential for public regulation to be constrained under RCEP. DFAT and Minister Tian have clarified this is incorrect and that there are reservations in RCEP, like in any FTA, that allow Australia to regulate in the public interest, which includes for aged care or climate change action. Labor doesn't support agreements which would inhibit the government's uh, ability to implement in, the full, in full the recommendations of the Royal Commission into aged care and uh, into aged care services. But while aged care and other concerns have been responded to by the government and resolved, the Morrison Joyce government still needs to respond to community concerns in relation to Myanmar. Myanmar, as an ASEAN nation, is a signatory to RCEP. But the actions of the Tatmadaw to undermine Myanmar's democracy, to detain thousands of political prisoners and crack down against peaceful protests and opposition are unacceptable. They are completely unacceptable. Labor condemned the military coup of the 1st of February and the subsequent violence engaged in by the Tatmadaw. On the 2nd of February, we called for the Australian government to review its military cooperation with the Tatmadaw, and over a month later, this cooperation was suspended. Labor has also called for targeted sanctions against those responsible for the coup. In April, Labor called on the government to provide visa pathways for at-risk Myanmar nationals to remain in Australia. And once again, a month later, the government said those on temporary visas could apply to extend their stay. But the Morrison-Joyce government has still not implemented any additional targeted sanctions against those responsible for the coup and for human rights abuses in Myanmar. This is despite many of our like-minded partners taking strong action. And it is despite the government chaired Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and Trade recommending sanctions against the Tatmadaw in June. And in August, the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties embarrassingly having to remind the Morrison-Joyce government again of the need to act. Labor members of the J. Scott worked hard to amend the final report to reflect stakeholder concerns on Myanmar. I thank all of the Labor members, and I especially thank Senator Ayres and the Deputy Chair, Mr Khalil, for their tireless efforts on this committee. In the committee's report, the government was urged to make a declaration at, to, uh, as to Australia's response to the situation in Myanmar at the time of RCEP ratification. All the minister has indicated is that he will consider it. Well, we say the time for consideration is well past, given ratification is assured with the passage of the bill today. And we urge the government to make a declaration as the, J the J Joint Standing Committee on Treaties urged, urged. More broadly, the Morrison government's refusal to implement any sanctions since the coup sends precisely the wrong message. It sends a message that we don't care that we are mere bystanders to the democratic backsliding in our region, in a nation where many Australians over many years have worked so hard to support Myanmar's democratic transition. So it is time for Mr Morrison and Minister Payne to act. The morrison Joyce's government's failings on Myanmar reflect their border failings to understand the region and to sufficiently deploy our diplomacy to shape the region we want a region that is stable, prosperous and respectful of sovereignty. Labor recognises that Australia's security and prosperity relies on our continued economic engagement with the world and engagement and integration with our region, including through trade and investment. International trade creates jobs. These are facts that sometimes some in this chamber and some in the community fail to recognise. One in five Australian workers is employed in a trade-related activity. That is more than two million Australian jobs. And as an open trading nation, Australia has not just been a beneficiary of the multilateral rules-based system that has operated for decades, but we have helped shape it and we have worked to shape it for our interests. We have to understand that our recovery and the region's recovery from the pandemic requires open trade based on agreed rules of the road. Of course, our ongoing success in, as an exporting nation also demands that we better diversify what we export and where we export. And despite all of his tough talk, Prime Minister Morrison has overseen Australia becoming more dependent than ever on one market, that is China, for our exports and for Australian jobs. 
that we depend on the Chinese market more than any other country in the world. Under Mr Morrison's leadership or prime ministership, trade with India and Indonesia has gone down. And when trade diversification should be the highest priority for this nation, Mr Morrison has put at risk our trade agreement with the European Union. We all know in the context of his flashy announcement on nuclear-powered submarines that Mr Morrison neglected to do any of the diplomatic legwork around ending Australia's contract for the attack-class submarines with the French. It really highlights how perilous it is for Australia and for our economy and for the national interest to have a man in the office of Prime Minister who really only cares about the photo op and the politics. Trade diversification and more open trade are in our national interests. Our economic welfare, our strategic opportunities, our national security, our cultural dynamism will all depend on how it deeply and well we integrate with the fast-growing economies of Asia, not only in traditional goods trade but also in investment, tourism, services, supply chains and people-to-people -people links. And what is so often lost in the trade discussion in this country is a recognition of the benefits that open trade has for working people. Trade benefits working people by contributing to economic growth. Trade benefits working people by improving national productivity. Trade benefits working people because it creates better paid, more rewarding and more secure jobs. And it benefits working people by offering lower prices and greater choice for working people as consumers. You see, we don't pursue trade opportunities out of blind adherence to abstract theories. We in the Labor Party pursue it because it delivers real benefits for the people we represent. Trade raises living standards. So because I'm a progressive, I support trade, and I support free trade. But I also recognise trade places uneven pressures in our society. That is why we have to have pro proper social democratic institutions and progressive economic policies, and it means existing on high quality trade agreements that maximise local employment. It means ensuring that trade agreements do not undermine public policy, for example, in the areas of healthcare, environmental labour rights. And it means trade agreements must be supported by policies that have at their heart the expansion of opportunity, investments in health, in education, in innovation and in infrastructure to ensure the Australian people continue to prosper in a more open economy. This combination of tra open trade supported by government investing in its people is central to how we ensure Australia and working Australians can be the beneficiaries of a changing region and a changing world. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting um, Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution to the Customs Amendment Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement Implementation Bill 2021 and the Customs Tariff Amendment Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement Implementation Bill 2021. These two bills implement Australia's obligation under Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, or RCEP for short. The agreement was signed between Australia and 14 other states—China, Japan, New Zealand, the Republic of Korea and 10 other members of, of ASEAN, the Association of the South East Asian Nations—Brunei, Jerusalem, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, People's Dem Democratic Republic, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand and Vietnam. The Greens won't be supporting these bills as we oppose binding treaty action be taken, being taken, as is consistent with our approach to free trade agreements. We continue to hold serious concerns around the transparency, consultation and human rights regarding trade agreements processes, as I will articulate uh, further. There are no additional market access benefits for Australian exports that come out of the RCEP. Australia already has free trade agreements with the RCEP um, members. India's withdrawal from negotiations means that the agreements offer no additional export markets for Australian businesses. Even the, Austra even the government acknowledges the minimum value of RCEP. The regulation impact statement prepared for this bill clearly states, given the relative quality of Australia's existing free trade agreements with its RCEP partners, um, parties, including the CPTTP, 
We do not expect that RCEP Goods Markets Access commitments to provide Australia with additional market access with our current free trade partners. The government also acknowledges that under our existing free trade agreements, Australia will already have eliminated tariffs on imports from RCEP parties by 1 April 2021. So no additional market access nor any benefits in the form of reduced tariffs. So I have to ask why is Australia actually entering into this agreement in the first place? The government has not commissioned an independent study of the economic or social uh, costs and benefits that will come from this agreement. So we have no way of independently verifying the government's claims. As usual practice, the RCEP trade negotiations were conducted in secret. Neither Parliament nor the wider community have had any input into the development of this agreement. The final text of the agreement was not made public until after the government made a decision to sign it. While the community and civil society are kept in the dark, business groups get the advantage of having a seat at the table. The EU has developed a more open process when it comes to negotiating free trade agreements, and this includes the public release of documents and proposed text during those negotiations and the release of the text before they are signed. Australia can and should strive to have a more open process when it comes to our free trade negotiations. This includes not only the publication of our negotiating text, but also the independent evaluation of the economic, health, gender and environmental impacts of agreements before we've made a decision to sign these agreements. The community and civil society should have a role in providing feedback through an open and transparent process. The RCEP continues, uh, contains no minimum requirements for signatory governments to uphold human rights labour rights or environmental protections. This is not entirely unacceptable when it comes to put in the context of climate crisis the significant human rights violations occurring in states who are signatories to this agreement and the inconsistent approaches taken by signatory states in the implementation of labour basic rights as defined by the International Labour Organization. Unfortunately, global trade models encourage competition to provide the lowest labour and environmental costs for exports. This model suits global corporations and big business, but comes at the expense of labour rights, especially in low-income uh, countries. We should be using trade agreements to improve workers' rights and conditions, not eroding them. The absence of commitment to human rights and labour rights means there is no obligation on signatories to take action to end human rights abuses. The Greens echo the deep concern of Afternet and the ACTU and others about entering an agreement with Myanmar. As noted by Afternet, the RCEP would legitimise a brutal military regime in Myanmar at a time when the US and other allies are implementing serious sanctions and withdrawing from economic agreements with Myanmar. The RCEP also ignores violations of human rights and labour rights in China, the Philippines and other RCEP countries. Australia should not be entering into preferential trade deals with Myanmar and should, we should be imposing targeted sanctions and showing our support for the return of a democratically elected government. The, grant, the Greens strongly support the inclusion of our international uh, labour standards and human rights standards as part of our free trade agreements. This agreement is also represents another missed opportunity to include commitments by governments to implement international environmental standards. This is not a new suggestion. The Korea Australia Free Trade Agreement, including the environment chapter in which parties made commitments to not reduce environmental standards. The RCEP does not include an environmental chapter, and this, has serious, this is a serious shortcoming in this agreement. We cannot afford to entrench bad climate policies and sell out workers' rights through our trade models any longer. Now is the time to include enforceable commitments to climate action in our trade agreements. There are many concerns that have been raised with the RCEP rules on trade in services as they will apply to aged care. The current rules freeze regulations at current levels for most services unless they are listed as exempt. 
Unlike other publicly funded essential services, aged care has not been specifically exempted from those rules. The Greens are deeply troubled that these rules will lock in current levels of regulation and restrict further changes. This places significant and unnecessary limitations on any government to be able to regulate in the public interest and could restrict the implementation of, of the recommendations from the Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety. Our trade agreements should not restrict the provision of essential services like aged care. I want to move now to the issues around investor state dispute settlements. While the RCEP does not include investor state dispute settlement provision upon ratification, this will be considered in two years after the agreement comes into force. These provisions allow foreign investors and corporations to bypass national courts and sue governments directly for compensation if a, law in, in, if a change in law harms their investment. They do not serve the interests of the community, but instead protect the interests of multinational corporations. If investor state dispute settlement clauses are agreed in the RCEP in the future, Australia could face both state-to-state -state disputes and ISDS disputes from international aged care companies if it increases regulation, particularly in the aged care sector. The RCEP provides no clear economic benefit to Australia. It fails the human rights test, the environmental standards test and the transparency test. For too long, free trade agreements have come at the expense of human rights, labour rights and environmental rights. I know that we can do better. We can implement free trade agreements that are grounded in democratic transparency and accountability. One that serves the interests of our communities, not greedy multinational corporations. I urge those in this chamber to stand with the Greens in opposing the ratification of the RCEP. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cox. Senator Ayres. Thanks, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. I want to make a couple of comments from the perspective um, of uh, my participation in the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties Deliberations uh, on the RCEP Agreement. I want to thank those Labor senators who participated in that committee, senators and members, who have done careful work in the Labor interest, in the Labor movement's interest and in the national interest to continually improve Australia's participation uh, and, the, and indeed the quality uh, of these agreements. Um, and I want to deal with a few facts. Uh, the debate about trade is too often a fact-free debate. The key issues that we prioritised in the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties were firstly aged care. Firstly aged care. Legitimate issues raised by people in aged care wanting to ensure that the impact of the RCEP wasn't to limit the Australian government's capacity to regulate in aged care. It is crystal clear that there is no impact from the RCEP on the capacity of the Australian government to regulate aged care, to implement, if this government or a future Albanese government chooses, to implement the full recommendations of the Aged Care Royal Commission no impact on labour mobility and the capacity to regulate temporary work, no investor state dispute settlement procedures and, despite what we heard a few minutes ago, a commitment in writing from this government that is binding that Australia will not pursue investor state dispute settlement procedures at the two-year review. The issues around Myanmar, top priority for the Labor members of that committee, in no way is Australia's participation in the RCEP in any way a legitimisation of the Tatmadaw regime in Myanmar. It is an assertion of ASEAN centrality. And if you're concerned about issues like the takeover, the brutal takeover in Myanmar, and you want a pathway to resolve those issues, uh, ASEAN centrality is critical. Collective action in the region is critical. Now we do have some criticisms of the government's approach on Myanmar. We do, on the Labor side, believe that a stronger statement at this point 
would be of value. We would support Magnitsky-style sanction regimes that would allow more targeted, agile and effective sanctions of Tatmadaw figures. But in no way should Labor's support for the RCEP be taken as tacit endorsement or legitimisation of that regime. Environment, labour, human rights are all those provisions supported by Labor when it commenced negotiations for this agreement. Uh, and we will continue to seek improvements in those areas. Now, ASEAN's, our region is not composed of entirely democratic countries. It may be a news flash for uh, people in this place. Some of the language about you know, alliances with like-minded nations, it may be a news flash for people in the government and in the Greens, but you know what? The region's a bit more complicated than that. And diplomacy and seeking peace and freedom and relationships in our region and security in our region involve deepening relationships with countries that are very different to ours, very different styles of governance to us. Uh, and we should be focused on that. Uh, if you're interested in security and peace, that is the strongest argument, in fact. Th there is not a very strong economic argument for RCEP. Not even its principal proponents would argue that there are any significant advances in RCEP in economic terms or market access terms. The strongest argument for RCEP is continuing to build our relationships in the region. That's, that's the strongest argument. Um, if you're interested in peace and security in our region, you cannot be against our participation in the largest piece of regional architecture uh, that's been developed in recent times. And it does lead me to making a couple of observations about the government's approach to trade agreements more broadly. It is the case that the government has at the very least overstated the economic case for each of the agreements that it's participated in and led. RCEP, the closest the government I think this week's going to get to achieving net zero is RCEP, where there's net zero economic benefit. Uh, no, no real benefits, no real costs. They won't get much closer to net zero in any other terms this week. There is no independent economic analysis, and it is a problem with building confidence in the Australian community that the government's secret deals approach to trade agreements is actually in the national interest when the government can't demonstrate one extra job from its trade agreements. In fact, the reverse. There have been too many cows for cars agreements. There's been too many agreements that privilege the export of raw commodities and don't actually act in the interests of jobs. Australia has been forced further down the value chain over the life of this government, further down the global va value chain, become less and less economically diverse. I mean, you have these jokers like Mr um, Christensen, chairing this Joint Standing Committee on Trade, Investment and Growth, worried about our economic diversity, the diversity of our trading relationships. If you are actually remotely interested in Australia's economic sustainability and our diversity, you would be focused on lifting us up the global value chain and making our economic exports more complex, not less. So what have we seen? We've seen the car industry close down. We've seen incomes decline. Uh, we've seen no wage growth. And it's because of the free market ideology that's attached to the government's approach. The second element of the government's approach that is a problem here is a focus on ribbon cutting and announcements and not delivery. That's why you see people performing, putting a big amount of emphasis on agreements like the Uruguay Agreement. I mean, our, net, our, our trade volume with Uruguay is $24 million at its highest a year. But we devoted resources to pursuing an agreement with Uruguay. The ISEPA, the most recent significant bilateral agreement supported through this place by the Labor Party. Well, big announcement, 
all the razzle-dazzle, all of the press conferences, all of the claims made about the economic benefit, where is the follow-through from this government? Where is the increase in commitment to resources from trade offices to supporting Australian businesses to participate in economic activity uh, in Indonesia? The short story is nothing. Zip. So the government's focus is on the instrument itself and not the objective. Now, we've seen, I think, a government that's approach to trade agreements has let Australia down. A government that's approach to trade agreements is stuck in the 1990s and the 2000s, and that we've slid much further. We're, we're repeating the certainties and sureties of the 1980s and 1990s, and things have been uh, uh, allowed to slip and decline and deteriorate since then. And what people in the Australian community have seen is, for example, on issues like temporary migration, an association in people's minds with the amount of temporary migration in the trade agreements. Well, the truth is trade agreements are now irrelevant in temporary migration terms. It's this government's approach to temporary migration that is the problem. No effective local training, uh, no regulation of temporary migration. Former Treasurer Peter Costello said in the early 2000s that Australia would never become a guest worker nation. Well, I don't think you could travel in the streets of Sydney or Melbourne or in our agriculture sector and say that that is still the case. There is a deep complacency that has infected the government's approach. It's still stuck in the, two, in the early 2000s when we had essentially a benign economic environment. We had a benign geopolitical environment. And that complacency and that sense of confidence in that the, the, the coalition government has not caught up with the big shifts in the region. What would be different about the Labor approach in government? Well, the first thing is we would be results-based, not measuring our effectiveness on the number of trade agreements or the number of press conferences, but a focus on actually deepening trade and market access, uh, particularly, particularly for Australian firms up the value chain, supporting businesses rather than just signing the agreements and saying, job done, which has been the approach of this government. The second thing we would do to rebuild confidence in these issues is clean up temporary labour. We would be focused on permanent jobs and permanent migration and eliminate the abuses and the rorts and the rip-offs that have been perpetrated by this government in temporary labour. We should be prioritising permanent migration. We don't want a guest worker economy. We want to be supporting permanent migration. And for temporary workers who come here, their experience of life in Australia should be a good one. They should be able to come here and work in confidence and be able to return to their countries and tell a good story of their lives in Australia, not a story of desperation and hunger and lining up in food queues, which has been the experience of temporary migrants over the last couple of years fix agriculture, train apprentices, look after temporary workers, make sure we actually recognise the soft diplomacy asset that there is in our region if we actually look after Pacific workers properly when they come here, instead of all care and no responsibility, which is the current approach. What do you think people say when they return about their experience if there have been 14 people stuck in a flat in Inverell? paying exorbitant rents, working in a meatworks. What do you think they say about the Australian government's commitment to the Pacific when that happens? Now, we have to improve that. There will be no ISDSs uh, under a Labor government in terms of our trade approach. They're not an RCEP. They're a declining feature of the global trading environment in any case. We will not permit them. 
no agreements that undermine our sovereign capacity to provide and protect public services or to regulate in the interests of Australians. An Albanese government will build local. We will use the power of our government procurement capability at the Commonwealth level and encourage the states to build locally. Just like President Biden, we will say in the COVID recovery we will build back better and build Australian industry. That means more trains in Queensland, no more Campbell Newman approaches to outsourcing or, or Mr Baird approaches or Ms Berejiklian approaches where all the trains and buses and ferries were built offshore, billions of dollars, local jobs in places like Maryborough and Newcastle, defence procurement, supporting our small to medium enterprises. We will rebuild Australian manufacturing under an Albanese Labor government. Under the government opposite, good jobs in manufacturing have declined, the car industry has gone offshore, and manufacturing now sits at 5.7 per cent. You can't wander around this place wittering on about national security and pretend that it's sustainable for Australia to be strong and secure in the region when our economy is diverse and hollowed out and manufacturing hovers just above 5 per cent. It's completely inconsistent. Uh, it's completely reckless and it will leave Australia a weaker and impoverished place if we allow it to continue. An Albanese Labor government will support good quality trade agreements, but we will not allow free trade ideology to capture our approach to industry policy or to regulating and protecting the Australian national interest. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I say that One Nation supports fair trade agreements. Fair trade agreements. Is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement the spawn of the Trans-Pacific Partnership? And is it free trade or fair trade? It's certainly not free trade. Each of the signatories have carved out substantial areas of their economies for the, from the agreement. This information is tucked away, hidden away in annexes where it would, where it would seem not enough have looked. Tariffs are being defended. Schemes that protect the power base of local politicians are being defended at Australia's cost. There are hundreds of pages of carve-outs in this agreement. Many of them are ours, so that's probably a good thing. But the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement is not a free trade agreement. It is at best freer trade slightly freer trade. In the Productivity Commission submission dated July 2020 to the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, inquiry into certain aspects of the treaty-making process in Australia, the Productivity Commission comes out and basically supports what I'm about to say. The government prepared a national interest analysis on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement and found it did provide a net benefit to Australia. This was relied upon by the Joint Standing Commission Committee on Treaties and subsequently endorsed by the Morrison-Joyce government and the alternative Albanese Bant government. This consensus of the establishment parties is disconcerting. Despite their name, free trade agreements are never free, never free. These agreements always come at a cost to someone, and that's usually everyday Australians, workers and business owners. Underdeveloped countries do not sign free trade agreements with industrialised nations in order to give away what they have. It's the industrialised nations that give their wealth, our wealth, away through lower tariffs, greater market access of cheaper goods and greater incursion of foreign workers into our Australian economy. They're facts. Free trade in this situation is a race to the bottom. The nation with the worst environmental protections, the lowest wages, the worst working conditions, the, the crudest and most unsafe working conditions, will win every time, in effect dragging our conditions down at the same time as dragging theirs up. Our environment loses. Our wages lose. Everyday Australians 
lose. I saw nothing in the national interest analysis that constituted a genuine attempt to identify who the winners and losers will really be. That's probably a design feature to allow the establishment parties to take all the electoral gain and protect themselves later from any electoral loss in this election cycle. Because all too often in this country, in this parliament, it seems to be about looking good, not doing good. Once signed into existence, these agreements are not subject to sufficient scrutiny. The last Productivity Commission inquiry into a, fair trade agreement, into a free trade agreement was in 2010. The last review into Australia's most important free trade agreement, the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement, was in 2018. Before Australia enters into future trade agreements, this parliament must address the lack of transparency in the trade negotiation process and the signing of an agreement before this parliament ratifies it. My concern next is to the reg new regulatory environment that this agreement will create. In his submission to the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, Brian Clark from the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry highlighted, quote, there are five separate trade agreements with Malaysia. Businesses are getting very confused trying to work out how to use these agreements. And the best outcome for Australian business would actually come from sorting out all this red tape and creating clearer rules for Australian businesses. I agree completely. Here's a specific example of this, thanks to the Australian Fair Trade and Investment Network. The United Nations Central Product Classification System, used by the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, it's always a mouthful, isn't it, with the UN? They twist and turn and hide and bury and camouflage in, in acronyms and long titles that confuse people. So I'll start again. The United Nations Central Product Classification System, used by the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, has a separate classification for aged care which implies that, without a specific reservation by Australia, any increase in the regulation of aged care would be a breach of this agreement. So if we find something we need to improve and regulate it, it could be a breach of this agreement. The Australian Nurses and Midwifery Association of New South Wales agreed that, and I'll quote again, at worst, aged care is exposed to the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. At best, there is sufficient ambiguity to allow overseas companies to exploit the framework for their own benefit. The globalists, the elites, moving our industries, whole industries, whole sectors, workers, farmers, as pawns in their game of central, of control and money. And parliaments in this country, without accountability, are their tool. They work through us, this parliament. The government has responded that there is provision for review of unexpected consequences, so we should not worry aged care standards will drop under the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. There is, though, no framework in place to ensure this action actually occurs. In the years ahead, we will read stories that the parliament's mates, be they union bosses or crony capitalists, globalists, are exploiting loopholes in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement for their own benefit. That's how they get through unaccountable parliaments. Resolving that will be at the discretion of the minister. This is a terrible system. The benefit of a free trade agreement must be tested annually, and I call on the government to introduce a system of annual review of the economic gains and losses for each of the agreements. Australia will not restore its position as a world-leading economy, as a leading world economy, by exposing Australian businesses to unfair competition and multiple layers of red, green and blue tape. And for those not familiar, red tape is about the bureaucracy, green tape is about pseudo-environmental tape, regulations, impositions imposed under the guise of environment, but really with the intent to control. Then we have blue tape, 
That's easy. That's UN policies on behalf of the UN's masters, the globalists that move industries and people around at will, around the globe. Australia will not emerge from our self-inflicted COVID-19 recession by destroying businesses and increasing reliance on government welfare. To restore the wealth of everyday Australians, we must let the government get the government out of the way and let free personal enterprise create wealth again. Ideas, effort, energy, heart, that's what brings life to an economy when it's a free economy with fair trade. Fair trade has an important role to play in that process. Fair trade. Thank you, Mr. Act Mr. President. Uh, Senator Bragg. Terrific. It's uh, great to be here earlier than I expected, but uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, Mr. President. Um, I just wanted to make a few comments about trade policy and where the RCEP uh, fits in. It's um, like many of these things, not a great acronym, but it is what it is. Um, um, over 75 years, the Liberal Party has been a champion largely of free trade. Um, this goes back to the Menzies government opening up trade with Japan uh, with the commerce agreement uh, that was delivered in the 50s, uh, which led to predominantly iron ore being shipped to, to Japan. So Australia's pivot to Asia um, in a trade and economic sense started under the Menzies government. Um, over this period of coalition government, you'd have to give great credit, and I give great credit to Prime Ministers Abbott, Turnbull and Morrison, for pursuing an agenda on free trade, which has seen us deliver Senator the Shelman. TPP, the RCEP, but also bilaterals uh, with a number of key um, Asian partners. And of course, the point of free trade is that it's about opening up markets for Australia. I mean, this is a, a wealthy country with a s relatively small domestic market, and therefore we depend on our ability to trade offshore to pay for our lifestyles. Now, Australia, I've said many times that Australia has uh, re relied upon foreign people and foreign capital and access to foreign markets for the past 240 years. Um, that is a fact. Uh, and so the job of government is to ensure that the Australian people can trade into these markets, which we can now do at a much greater rate thanks to these new trade deals. Uh, so I think the RCEP is setting Australia up for another generation of prosperity. It builds on the bilateral trade deal agenda. Um, and I think just, just as uh, we're trying to set up the country for a decarbonised uh, economy, uh, trade is a very key economic lever. And it's always easy to run an agenda against free trade uh, through a protectionist lens, uh, but the reality is that we will not be a wealthy nation selling stuff to ourselves. And that it's the same for goods and services. And what I like about the RCEP is it goes beyond just cutting tariffs for, for goods. It also opens up the prospect of Australian services exports uh, into the Mundi Asian region. And it is important uh, that, uh, as a diverse economy, which is predominantly a services economy, uh, that we can look to export financial services, that we can look to export uh, accounting services, professional services. We can look to export architecture and engineering through mutual re recognition, um, through the creation of schemes which allow qualifications and regulatory systems to be recognised in other jurisdictions. We have a lot to gain uh, from services exports as well as goods exports. Um, but um, in closing, I'll just make two points. That the thing with these trade deals is it really is the end of the beginning. Uh, I mean, yes, it's true that the signing ceremonies and the media coverage is important. Um, getting the legislation through means that there will be uh, eventually uh, lower tariffs and more access for goods and services. 
but it is a real grind to get the, the gains of these trade deals. And that relies upon the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade engaging closely with the industry and making sure that the real gains are being achieved, that we are getting access into these markets, that when the cameras move on um, and the caravan moves on, so, um, so on and so forth, uh, that the real work continues, because that is, that is the key of the free trade deal. Uh, finally, I just say, without risking uh, being accused of being too partisan, that um, I, I don't believe that the Labor Party would have delivered these trade deals. Um, they are too frightened of uh, ISDS um, and sort of union bogeymen. Um, and unfortunately, um, Labor wasn't able to deliver big trade deals with, with Japan and with China when they were in government because um, they weren't allowed to because their union bosses said no. So um, I hope in the future, if there's ever a Labor government, that they actually use their own brains and assess uh, the relative merits of trade deals, not being told uh, what to think by people who aren't elected. But in our case, um, we always act in the national interest, and these are uh, good developments, and I commend this legislation to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Sheldon. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you, President. Let me just take a couple of issues up just on the previous speaker, just before I st uh, start on more the substance of my speech. Um, I always, I always find it intriguing when Menzies gets um, included, particularly when it comes to trade matters, because I still recall him as being taught at school um, that, it was, he was, that his nickname was Pig Iron Bob because he actually fueled at that time the non-democratic Japanese army's imperialistic um, intentions on the rest of uh, Asia. So if you're trying to recite that one as a, you know, an example of successive uh, capacity of the Conservatives, it's uh, certainly wanting. And of course, um, when it comes to the other comments, I'll, I'll leave them in a moment but, that you made. But regarding, um, as you would recall, um, as the Senate would recall, and that is that uh, the Prime Minister at the time, Gough Whitlam, uh, was the one that actually uh, began a very important process of engaging with China. By rise to speak on the Customs Amendment um, and Customs Tariff Amendment Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, Implementation Bills 2021. The RCEP uh, countries include nine of Australia's top 15 trading partners, accounting for 58 per cent of our two-way trade and 67 per cent of our exports. It includes our near neighbours, the ASEAN countries, and New Zealand, and major trade partners, China, Japan and South Korea. The RCEP will provide a single set of basic rules for Australian exporters, including small businesses, to these countries. Labor does support the measures that encourage small businesses to boost exports and create more Australian jobs as a result. Already one in five Australian workers, more than two million people, are employed in a trade-related activity. Australian exports will be an important feature of any economic recovery from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And currently, small and medium businesses only account for 14 per cent of Australia's exports, whereas the G7 average is 25 per cent and the European Union average is 35 per cent. So clearly there is more to be done to support small businesses in this country. Lifting small and medium business exports to 25 per cent of our exports would increase Australia's GDP by $36 billion. So there are potential economic benefits to the RCEP. RCEP, which is why Labor cautiously supports ratification of this treaty. But that support is not unqualified and is not without serious concerns. I'd like to thank the Shadow Minister for Trade, Madeleine King, who has raised some of those, these concerns directly with the Minister for Trade. For the first of these concerns is that the potential economic benefits I've just outlined are exactly that potential. Because the Morrison government has refused to commission independent economic modelling for the RCEP, despite being pressed for Labor to do it. It is unclear why Mr Morrison is so opposed to knowing the economic impact of his own treaty. It raises concerns that we do not truly know the economic and social impact that this will have, particularly on Australian workers. Another issue raised by Labor is the use of investment state dispute settlement, or ISDS, mechanisms. 
ISDS mechanisms give private companies the power to sue the Australian government when it exercises its democratic mandate to enact legislation. Famously, this was used by tobacco giant Philip Morris to attempt to sue the Gillard government over the introduction of tobacco plain packaging laws. The Gillard government vowed to end the use of ISDS mechanisms and remove them from existing agreements in 2012. Since then, agreements signed by both the Abbott and Turnbull governments have reintroduced ISDS. I would love to hear those on the other side argue how it's in the best interest of Australian people to give multinational companies like Philip Morris the power to sue the Australian government. The RCEP are currently drafted does not have an ISDS provision. However, it could be added at any later stage. I understand that the Morrison government said it does not intend to add an ISDS clause to the agreement at the two-year review. If Australia is unfortunate enough for this government to still be in charge at that point, I am certain that Labor will hold Mr Morrison to that promise. Another concern that Labor has consistently raised surrounds the actual treaty-making process. The RCEP, as with our other agreements to this government, was negotiated behind closed doors. The final treaty text was not publicly released until after Mr Morrison had signed up. And that is fundamentally contrary, for example, with some of our major trading partners like Europe that have an ongoing process of engagement. And unlike Senator Bragg talking to employers, unions that represent millions of workers in this country um, and represent the aspirations of many more, um, is not a weakness in uh, any process of getting a trade agreement. In actual fact, it's in a strength to make sure it's an appropriate and the proper trade agreement that should take place. And of course, the public um, eye on those processes are critical um, to a final um, treaty that uh, the public supports. As we know, treaties have become under some, some, some discredit in some uh, more populous areas of the public um, because of um, that lack of transparency, primarily in my view, and also dealing with some of these critical issues I've already raised. Now, this is just the latest long-running saga of Mr Morrison running away from transparency. Whether it's JobKeeper, National Cabinet, the widespread rorts or our trade agreements, this is a Prime Minister who prefers to operate outside of any public or parliamentary oversight. Like mould, like rot, he thrives in darkness. On the other hand, Labor believes that the great, greater transparency in the development of trade agreements is a good thing. We see transparency and openness as vital to developing a real public licence to enter into these sorts of agreements that public licence is in danger. While there have been economic benefits to trade liberalisation, there has also been victims. Workers in our manufacturing industry in particular have lost out successive governments have made it easier and cheaper for production to be sent overseas, offshore. And workers across all sectors of the economy have lost out as big business with the support of the Liberal Party, have used underpaid temporary migrant labour to drive down wages for Australian workers. There are very valid concerns about the impact of the RCEP on Australian jobs, wages and conditions. Thankfully, the RCEP does not include commitments in relationship to waiving labour market testing. It is absolutely essential that we do not go any further down that path. It is absolutely essential that we do not make it easier for big businesses to import and exploit cheap temporary migrant labour. Because when that happens, the impact is twofold. Firstly, it results in the sort of horrible exploitation we've seen time and time again. Senator Sheldon, I will have to interrupt you there. You are in continuation. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Firavanti Wells. Uh, Mr President, pursuant to notice given yesterday on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number one for six sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the Aviation Transport Security Amendment Screening Information Regulations 2021. Thank you, Senator Firavanti Wells. 
Is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr President. I present the 12th report of 2021 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated into Hansard. There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. Oh. The question is that the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say oh, now Senator McKim. Uh, apologies, uh, President, and thank you for that. I um, uh, have an amendment um, to the motion currently before the chair, uh, which I understand has been circulated, and it is a. a do I need to read that out, or you have? I should. Yep. Uh, and in respect of the National Disability Insurance Scheme Amendment, Participant Service Guarantee and Other Measures Bill 2021, contingent upon introduction in the House of Representatives, the provisions of the bill be referred immediately to the Community Affairs Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by 10 December 2021. And I understand that Senator Steele John would like to speak briefly to that amendment, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Steele John, are you on the line? We might need to continue, Senator McKim, se uh, Minister. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I would like to move an amendment to um, Senator McKim's amendment to the selection of bills report in re uh, regard to the, uh, the National Disability Insurance Scheme Amendment Participant Service Guarantee and Other Measures Bill 2021, and uh, in change the date for reporting of the Community Affairs Legislation Committee for Inquiry to the 25th of November 2021. Thank you, Minister. So, so the question is that the amendment moved to the uh, motion, the amendment moved by Minister Rustin to the amendment proposed by uh, Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. No, this is Minister Rustin's amendment. This is Minister, sorry, to be clear, this is the amendment to the motion from Senator McKim. So this is Minister Rustin's amendment. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. So now we put the amended motion. We put the amendment as amended. We put the amendment as amended. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Now we put, put the motion as amended. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. I will now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Rustin. Sorry. Um, I move that general business notice of motion number 1256 be considered during general business today. I remind senators that the question may be put on. Oh, we need to put the motion. Uh, I move the. Uh, I put the question as moved by Senator Rustin. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Mr President, I have no postponement notifications. However, committees have lodged extension notifications as indicated at item 7 of today's order of business. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? We will start with Senator Colbeck. I'm going to you, therefore, Minister. Thank Rustin. you very much, uh, Mr Chair. Chair. Mr President, um, I ask that Government Business Notice of Motion No. 1, proposing the approval of the Health Insurance Extended Medicare Safety Net Amendment, Repetitive tr Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation Capping Determination 2021, uh, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call <laughs> Senator Russell. I move the motion. Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no, the ayes have it. Now we will also we'll stay with uh, Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that government business notice of motion number two relating to the allocation of departments and agencies to committees be taken as formal. Uh, is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator Rustin. I move the motion. 
question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. We will now go on to Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1247 be taken as a formal motion. Um, is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move the motion. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Senator Roberts. I seek leave to make a short statement. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Oh, is leave granted for one minute? Yes. Senator Roberts. One Nation very much strongly supports the intent for an independent parliamentary um, inquiry mechanism. However, we don't, we don't uh, support the Greens' method of doing so. Any further contributions? If not, I will put the motion. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. We are on uh, general business notice of motion 1247 that uh, the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Ayes will pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart to tell her for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith to tell her for the noes. Twenty-four ayes and twenty-four noes. The matter is resolved in the negative. We will now move on. I'll give everyone a moment to resume their places. We will move on to one, two, four, nine in the name of Senator Pratt. Senator Pratt. Mr. President, I ask the general business notice of motion number one two four nine be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator Pratt. I move the motion. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, I seek leave to make a short statement. One minute. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the government opposes uh, this motion. ASIC is undertaking an ongoing investigation into the conduct of a number of entities and officers within the Sterling Group of Companies. The government does not wish to prejudice the independent work of ASIC. Um, and I refer to the comments that I made yesterday on a similar motion uh, that matters relating to the Sterling Income Trust have been subject to litigation and the government does not want uh, or wish to prejudice any possible future proceedings. The question is that the motion moved by Senator, Senator Patrick Your statement. is leave granted for one minute. Um, just responding to the minister, 
just because ASIC is conducting an investigation into something doesn't mean doesn't absolve the Senate from its responsibility to oversight government. Uh, secondly, uh, in relation to prejudicing uh, a, uh, a litigation, a potential litigation, nothing tabled in the Senate can be adduced in evidence in order in a court in a court and. Uh, uh, the, 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 the threshold for uh, prejudicing judicial pre pre um, proceedings is in fact substantially prejudiced. So unless that's made out properly, the, uh, the order should be complied with. The question is the motion moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. Those of the opinion say aye. Aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, we will now move to 1257 in the name of Senator Rice. Senator Rice, you have the call. Thanks, President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 1257 um, be taken as a formal motion. And I ask the Senate to note that Senator Farrell is going to be join, joining me in co sponsoring this motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection. Senator Rice. Thank you. I move the motion. Minister. Uh, the government. I seek leave to make a short statement. One minute. Is leave granted? Is leave granted? One minute. The government will provide its response once it's finalised. I will put the question that the motion moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. All right. We now move to uh, motion. One, two, five, eight. Uh, Senator Roberts, I assume you'll be moving that one. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of Senator Hanson, I ask that general business notice of motion number one, two, five, eight, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Uh, is there any objection to this uh, motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator Roberts. I move that the following bill be introduced: a bill for an act to prevent discrimination in relation to COVID-19 vaccination status and for related purposes. question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Senator Roberts. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. question is that the bill be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Clark. The bill for an act to prevent discrimination in relation to COVID-19 vaccination status and for related purposes. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek to seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. There being no objection, leave is granted. I table an explanatory memorandum, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in the Hansard, and to continue my remarks. There being no objection, leave is granted. We now move on to 1259. Senator Fioravanti Wells. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion No. 1259, proposing an order for the production of documents relating to the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation's inquiry into the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator Fioravanti Wells. I move the motion. Minister. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? One minute. Mm, yeah. uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, the reports by this committee covered matters which impacted a number of uh, portfolios. The government's responses require extensive consultation across a number of departments and offices. The government will be tabling its response to each of these reports in the coming weeks and we will guarantee no later than the 22nd of November 2021. Senator Roberts. I seek leave to make a short statement, Mr. President. Is leave granted? One minute. Go Thank ahead. you. The Bipartisan Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee has an admirable track record of defending the Senate's duty as the House of Review. The Australian people deserve nothing less. This motion results from subsection 476, bracket 2, of the Biosecurity Act 2015, which allows the minister to make the declaration of a pandemic without needing parliamentary approval. The minister may need to issue a pandemic declaration quickly, yet the parliament should come along afterward and decide if that declaration was appropriate or not. The report that this motion is trying to shake loose is the government's response to the committee's recommendation that this regulation be made disallowable so that the parliament can do our job. 
Yesterday, I presented the Prime Minister and published on my website 70 pages of data, facts and questions, which proves beyond a doubt that the Morrison-Joyce-Hunt COVID measures are deeply flawed, which is what happens in the absence of parliamentary scrutiny. One Nation supports the, the committee recommendation, and we thank them for their work. All right. There being no further contributions, I will put the motion as moved by Senator Firavanti Wells. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Oh, sorry, Senator Wong. Thank you. I seek leave to remove a motion relating to the failure of the government to comply with order for the, produ for the production of documents number 1251. Is leave granted? No. To, thank you, Mr. President. Pursuant to contingent notice standing in my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that a motion relating to the failure of the government to comply with order for production documents of, do of documents number 1251 may be moved immediately and have precedence over all other business until determined and be determined without amendment or debate. Mr President, on, the suspend, on, on this motion, uh, the Senate may, may or may not recall that the minister representing the Minister for Industry, Energy and Emissions Reductions uh, was subject to an order of full production of documents by this chamber, uh, by a uh, motion of this chamber, with which the government has not complied. The order for production move, was moved by Senator Canavan and Senator Patrick, uh, and the requirement was that this be tabled by 10 a.m. today. Well, unsurprisingly for a government who avoids all accountability, as we saw in the House of Representatives yesterday with their they're voting to hide the position uh, to protect Christ Mr Christian Porter. This government has failed to comply with provision of the modelling. It does seem passing strange, doesn't it, that a government that spent so, has spent so much of the last eight long years saying to people, you can't, you, can't, you, know, you can't have a target without a plan, you can't have a target unless you know what it means, is going to such lengths, such lengths to hide uh, the economic modelling they are doing or they have done for their climate plan. Uh, Senator Canavan, I think, has been rightly calling for the release of this modelling by his own government. We don't agree on very much, Senator Canavan and I, but we do agree on this. We do agree that the government should provide the modelling. And I, I, I remind the Senate of Senator Canavan's tweet on 19 October 2021. If this modelling is so good, why does it have to remain a secret? Now, as everybody knows, Senator Canavan and I would have very different views on, on climate change. But what we do agree with is that this government uh, shouldn't keep this secret. Uh, the problem is this government is addicted to secrecy. It's addicted to covering up. It's addicted to not, uh, to not providing information to this chamber. Time and again, the chamber calls for documents, calls for information, and we see the government uh, refusing uh, to provide them. Uh, it is th the same attitude that this Prime Minister demonstrated yesterday. Yesterday, Mr Morrison used the power of his office to instruct every coalition MP to vote an against an inquiry into an anonymous million-dollar donation to Mr Christian Porter. I mean, it is extraordinary. You only need to outline the facts of yesterday to be struck by how extraordinary it is. And there's a higher point here that I think is worth making, which is what does the office of Prime Minister mean and what should it be used for? Well, too often with Mr Morrison, the power that is associated with the office of Prime Minister is used to cover up, is used to protect people, is used to avoid transparency and accountability. And we saw that yesterday, the first time in 120 years, uh, that the House of Representatives uh, has seen the government vote against a speaker on such an issue. So let's come back, coming back to the modelling. Uh, we've had a long discussion uh, in the media uh, between the National Party uh, and, the Co and the Liberal Party about uh, net zero emissions by 2050. We've had an extraordinary scenes, extraordinary scenes here in this chamber with a cabinet minister threatening the government. She's now uh, a cabinet minister threatening the government uh, with things getting ugly. A cabinet minister refusing to back the prime minister in. I, I think I have never seen 
a cabinet minister campaign against a prime minister in question time before, but that's what this week has been like. Uh, and we have a member of the government, Senator Canavan, uh, and, and a member of the crossbench, Senator Patrick, rightly calling for mod the economic modelling associated with the government's climate policy. So I say to the chamber and I say to all senators, it is uh, the government is now saying that they've had a change of heart on climate. I don't believe them, and I think the Australian people don't believe them. We, we all remember what Mr Morrison was like uh, with you know, bringing in his lump of coal and saying electric vehicles would end the weekend and saying that renewable storage was a big banana. We know all that. We know this is all fake. But what we do want to understand is the economic modelling that the government is predicating its policy on. So if Mr Morrison is serious about net zero emissions by 2050, if Mr Morrison is serious uh, about demonstrating that he actually wants to do something to get there, if he's serious uh, about his assertions, uh, around, belated assertions around jobs, he would get over his addiction to secrecy and he would disclose the document, the modelling that he's been talking Senator about, Wong, as Senator your Canavan. Your time has for. expired. Uh, Senator Waters was on her feet first, I believe. Senator Patrick. Thank you very much, oh, sorry, President. Sen Minister, I missed you. Thank you. No, the minister I, has I, the call and has precedence. I, I did wait until Senator Wong had finished speaking before I stood. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, there are. Uh, a number of quite predictable things in, uh, in this place. It's predictable indeed that, uh, that the Labor Party uh, and indeed the Greens will always find uh, and seek any opportunity to play politics, do a bit of grandstanding, to uh, pursue different stunts. And, uh, and so, of course, we have um, a motion to uh, suspend standing orders, to bring on matters that, uh, that weren't listed for debate today uh, because they want to pursue uh, another stunt, to uh, have a debate, to do all of the different things that, uh, that Labor will do just to seize some sort of cheap political point uh, along the way. It's, uh, it's predictable, of course, and no doubt we'll hear it uh, in other contributions that, uh, that the opposition, the Greens and others, uh, will always seek to talk down Australia's contributions, uh, particularly when it comes uh, to contributions in areas such as emissions reductions. They will overlook uh, the fact that, uh, that Australia uh, has indeed uh, managed to meet and beat uh, our emissions reductions commitments over the years, uh, that uh, we continue to be on track to do so, and that the scale of emissions reductions in Australia does exceed that of so many other uh, nations. Uh, they'll indeed uh, overlook the fact uh, that, um, uh, that you know, there's a good need, a good point, to go through processes of having political debate teasing out issues, including difficult issues of dissent and dispute that may exist across communities in Australia uh, and, indeed, right across political debate, and to do that in a way that enables people to actually put their perspective, have their views heard. Uh, now, that's not the Labor Party way. The Labor Party way is, of course, uh, to try to make sure that everybody just toes the line. Uh, that's why when, uh, when people dissent in their party, they ultimately have to leave their party. Uh, across the Liberal and National parties, uh, we do enable people to have a freer perspective and uh, to actually have views, to have dissent and to work through those different issues. I've been reminded multiple times this week, multiple times this week, I've thought of former Senator Doug Cameron. I remember uh, Dougie Cameron uh, not always fondly, not always fondly, but I do particularly remember, particularly remember a time where former Senator Cameron, speaking about life inside the Labor Party, said that, it was, uh, said that it was a bit like having a political lobotomy. You can't speak your mind. You can't think about some issues because they are all off the agenda. That's how former Senator Cameron described life inside the Labor caucus, that it was a bit like having a lobotomy because you weren't allowed to speak your mind or to think about other issues. But that's not the way our parties work. That's not the way the Liberal and National parties work, and we proudly enable our members to be able to speak their mind, to bring different perspectives to the table, and in bringing those perspectives Order. to the table, to be in the best possible position, the best possible position to then address real issues. And that's what we seek to do in terms of the position that we will take uh, to the Glasgow Climate Change Conference. We'll be addressing the real issues of emissions reduction. 
and how we make sure we do track a pathway as a country to build on the gains we've made in emissions reduction to date, and to build on the gains we're continuing to make ahead of 2030, uh, and to Order. track the course towards net zero. But we'll do it alongside clear plans around how we take communities with us, how we, tr how we protect jobs, how we ensure that we actually achieve that in ways that give Australia the best possible potential for the future. And we will release, in relation to what we take to Glasgow, those commitments, those plans, and we'll do all of that when we've concluded government processes and before the Prime Minister uh, provides those commitments in Glasgow. For those opposite to be calling out and, uh, and demanding, of course, uh, that we do that ahead of finalising those processes uh, is to ignore the proper processes that government is rightly going through in addressing all of these issues. Uh, for them to be calling for uh, us to release further modelling evidence or otherwise betrays the fact that they haven't released any such evidence. They've made commitments. They've said there'll be a commitment to net zero by 2050. But I don't see any of the plans, any of the modelling, anything else coming from the opposition as to how they say they're going to get there. As I said the other day, the opposition's policy is a bit like jumping out of a plane first and then checking to see whether your parachute's been packed. Well, we're making sure in the government that we can do all of the legwork necessary to be able to protect regional communities, protect the jobs within them, ensure they can transition and support them. That's what we'll continue to do in the proper process, and we urge those in this chamber to oppose Minister, uh, the opposition's Minister, attempt to disrupt business Minister, today. The time has expired. Senator Waters. Thanks, President. I rise to speak to the suspension, and we will be supporting this motion. What we've seen today is a government agree yesterday to disclose some documents and then today fail to disclose them. Now, this is not the first time this government has done this. We passed an uh, order for production of documents relating to the Beedaloo Basin and the cosy meetings that members of this government had had with donor companies who were then worded up about the grant arrangement uh, on a first-in, first first-dressed basis. We passed that OPD and we were waiting a good eight weeks before this government complied with it. So this is their form. They'll say, sure, fine, and then just not comply with it. And the reason they said, sure, fine, yesterday and let this pass was because they didn't want Senator Canavan to cross the floor in a further embarrassment to this government. This is a government that cannot disclose these sorts of documents because they are so compromised by what those documents would say. Now, this particular uh, transparency measure relates to this famed 2050 modelling that naturally the Prime Minister does not want to release because he's allergic to uh, transparency and is obsessed with secrecy. But the reason he doesn't want to release it is because that modelling is absolute crap. How on earth could any modelling say uh, that you can somehow address uh, the climate crisis that we're in by increasing coal and gas. The International Energy Agency has done this work. It looked at the countries that currently buy our fossil fuels and it compared them with the 2030 targets that those countries have made. And it found that fossil fuel usage will peak in 2025 and then fall. That's why we want to see this 2050 modelling, because it will be revealed as absolute rubbish. And it's somewhat ironic uh, that Senators uh, Canavan and also with the support of Senator Patrick want to see this modelling because they too think it will be rubbish, although for completely different reasons. The government could solve this by simply releasing the modelling, uh, but it won't do that because it's utterly compromised and embarrassed on the climate. Glasgow is a week away, and this Prime Minister is still talking about a date that's 30 years in the future. The rest of the world, the whole ticket to Glasgow, the whole point of Glasgow is to talk about 2030. And this Prime Minister is having a phony war with his coalition junior partner that suits both of their electoral outcomes, I might add, to distract from the fact that Australia is now the only nation uh, of comparable nations that is not addressing 2030 and that has no science-based targets for 2030. The Climate Targets Panel have advised us that if we want to stay within one and a half degrees of warming, we need to triple 2030 targets. The Prime Minister's pathetic 2030 targets, which are Tony Abbott's targets, that great climate saviour, are one third of what we need 
to do our bit to globally keep to one and a half degrees. If we don't keep to that, you can kiss the Great Barrier Reef goodbye. You can kiss our agricultural productivity goodbye. We already know that studies are that uh, agricultural productivity in the Murray-Darling will fall more than 90 per cent if we don't seriously address the climate crisis and constrain that warming to one and a half degrees. This is the people that occasionally the Nationals still purport to represent. And this government is throwing them under the bus. It's throwing nature under the bus. We're used to them doing that. But it is throwing the productivity of our agricultural sector under the bus as well. And it is imperilling the future of our communities who have faced devastating natural disasters already. Perhaps the Prime Minister is planning on going to Hawaii again when he opens up the international borders. Maybe he won't be around for the next bushfire season. But Australians won't forget. And that's exactly why they deserve to see this climate modelling, which this government is not disclosing, because they just love running protect protection rackets, these folk. They've done it yesterday in the House over Minister Porter. Um, they've, done it, um, they've done it today. They did it on the Beedaloo Basin. They are obsessed with secrecy, and they are failing us on climate. Let's vote them out. Sorry. Senator Patrick. Thank you, um, thank you Mr. President. Uh, look, this is an important um, motion. We do need to uh, understand that this is about a transparency measure. We know the government, uh, even if they did comply with the order, would have advanced a public interest immunity in relation to Cabinet. Um, I just want to remind the Chamber that uh, we saw the Doherty modelling going to the National Cabinet where a similar claim was, is, is made, and we know it's a, it's a, a false claim, it's actually not in, in accordance with law, the National Cabinet doesn't attract Cabinet protections. But nonetheless, the Prime Minister did claim that, uh, but then released the modelling, okay? because actually it was in the public interest, and uh, people are entitled to see uh, modelling uh, as, um, uh, as it's presented to government. What we're asking for here now is some other modelling that relates to a very important topic, and the one that's being debated. There's lots of argument going on. It's great to put facts on the table such that the debate can be informed. Uh, the Prime Minister has the ability to simply authorise the release of this information, and that's what he should do. And I ask that the question now be put. The question is, I, I believe. Senator Patrick, you cannot move that at motion at the end of a speech, so I call Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, um, uh, Mr. President. Um, I, I, I do support the substantive motion uh, moved by Senator Wong, but I, I will not support the suspension of standing orders. I, I do support um, the substantive motion, although a little reluctantly. I think we've got to be clear here that all of this really does is um, provide 60 minutes of debate for this. It doesn't necessarily change or force the minister to do anything different. So we've already had our minister here explain the government's position for five minutes. I doubt that will shift all that much over 60 minutes. But, but it is important to stand up for transparency, and so I will support that approach. It's particularly important in this case, given there remains a lot of questions about the modelling behind the, the preference, at least, or strategy of the government to move towards a net zero 2050 target. As I said the other day, I had a small briefing on the modelling. We saw some graphs, saw some results, but I did leave the room thinking that I was being asked to marry a girl I hadn't met. There was very little detail. Very little detail. She probably would say no, Senator Watt. But we in the Nationals part at least believe we do believe in chivalry. Oh, we do believe that you should take take her out in the, uh, out for dinner or a drink or something uh, before you sign the marriage contract. And we're definitely in the Nationals Party not ready to sign this contract at this stage. That is definitely the case because, to some extent, the strategy right now from the government does bring a little bit to me like the old joke about economists, that if you get an economist on a desert island with a, a can of tuna, they will, their response, their solution will be to, to assume a can opener. That's, that's the way economic models work, and what we've got here is an assume a can opener plan for net zero emissions. We assume that this hydrogen comes down like manna from heaven, from nowhere, it doesn't work right now, 
but we assume it works and everything will be all right. Well, people in regional areas that rely on industries for their job deserve more than assumptions because we all know, we all know that the assumptions are mo the mother of all. It is very important too here that we get modelling that seems to be inconsistent with modelling about net zero from other countries. We get it and see why is it inconsistent? Why is it inconsistent? Because just yesterday the United Kingdom released their modelling from their UK Treasury on uh, their net zero plan. And in the UK Treasury's modelling, they show that to reach net zero emissions by 2050, the exactly same target we're proposing, they would need the UK would need a carbon price of, a, of 295 Australian dollars a ton. 295 Australian dollars a ton. So we can glibly in this place say, oh, we're going to reach net, net zero by 2050. It'll be easy. The Greens want to do it by 2030 or some, some ridiculous date. But over there in the United Kingdom, the hard, cold facts show that this will be a mammoth cost on every single Australian. Because remember, remember when the carbon tax was $23 a tonne that we had there for a short period that the Australian people rejected, rejected, rejected in no uncertain terms, when it was $23 a tonne, electricity prices went up by 10 per cent. How much are they going to go up by when we impose a carbon tax of more than 10 times that amount? All Australians will be hurt by that and many Australian jobs will be lost. There's also a lot of questions here about how different and important industries have been treated in this modelling. My understanding from the limited questions and information I got the other day was that in case of the coal projections, which we've read about, the information we've read about, the coal demand will fall or coal production is expected to fall in Australia under net zero 2050 emissions. In respect to that, though, it would appear that this modelling does not differentiate between different types of coal. In fact, it treats Australian coal the same as dirtier and less quality coals in India and Indonesia and South Africa. Why would Australian modelling downplay the greatness of Australian coal? Australian coal is the best in the world, it's the cleanest in the world, and is most likely to remain in very strong demand even if the world moves away from coal. Even if there's massive reductions in coal demand around the world, countries in our region are most likely to continue to want the high quality coal that comes out of the Hunter region to power their stations. Uh, that is, uh, we should be backing and supporting Australian jobs, and in supporting this motion, that is what I'm doing. I'm standing up for the men and women in this country that do the hard work, that pay our wages, that pay our bills. We're only here in this Canberra, in this great place, thanks to the men and women that work hard and pay their taxes on Monday and Tuesday every day of the week, and then the rest of the week they get to earn a bit of money for themselves. But their first two days of their week, the first two days of their week is for us, and we deserve to pay them back by at least being upfront and, and open with all the figures we've got on the table so they can see whether they want to support this at an election. Senator Gallagher. Mr President, I move that the question be put. The question is that the question now be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. I heard two voices.
So. Uh, stop the bells. The question is that the question be put. The ayes were passed to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart to tell her for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith to tell her for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 26, noes 22. The question is resolved in the affirmative. So the question will now be put that the motion as moved by Senator Wong to suspend standing orders uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say, I know. I saw the minister rising to her feet and I just was making sure she wasn't going to intervene. Those of that opinion say, aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. I, I had an Senator, Senator Wong? We seek one minute. We all know there's a hard marker, and it, uh, everybody was in here. We asked for a one minute division. I had an indication from one of the whips, Senator Which whip? The government is playing down the clock because they haven't got the numbers, and I would ask that the president not collude with it. Oh. Oh. Yes. 
Senator Wong, I can see I can I had an indication for the whip. I can see senators at the door. Senator Smith. Mr. President, Mr. President, uh, whips, whips deciding on one and four minute bells is absolutely the prerogative of the whips, and it has been the custom and tradition of this chamber for as long as I have been a whip. Senator Wong. Thank you. Standing order 101. Three, when successive divisions are, divi are taken and there is no debate after the first division, the bells for each ensuing division shall be rung for one minute only. I ask you to uphold the standing orders. Senator Birmingham. And Mr President, the practice has been uh, by successive presidents to provide warning to the chamber if, uh, if one minute bells are going to be provided. That warning was not provided, and as the uh, Chief Government Whip has indicated, that practice equally extends to the fact that uh, the whips themselves provide indication, something I know that the opposition has done on numerous occasions. As, as, order, as, as I have already ruled, there is, there is a clear convention in this place where there is time for senators to leave the chamber. I cannot be always aware when senators leave the chamber. Therefore, I take guidance on this matter from the whips. The fact I can see a number of senators waiting at the door indicates there were senators outside the chamber. Senator Abetz, on the point of order. I would invite Senator Wong to withdraw the imputation in relation to yourself, um, irrespective of whether your ruling may be right, wrong or indifferent. I happen to think it's right, but to suggest collusion by the chair is highly inappropriate and deserves to be withdrawn. Senator Wong. I, I withdraw. Thank you, Senator Wong. Stop the bells. The uh, question is that the motion as moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes will pass to the left. I appoint Senator Urka to teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 26, noes 23. The question is resolved in the affirmative. <clears throat> Senator, oh, sorry, Senator Birmingham. Thanks. He has precedence. He didn't. He, well, he didn't. He didn't, didn't actually. actually call her. He didn't actually get to call anybody's name. I didn't call her. Senator Wong. Yeah. Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, we can see the uh, we can see the opposition continuing uh, continuing on their attempt to make this all about uh, playing stunts, undertaking distractions. Uh, the the uh, you know, the government will make no apologies for the fact that our approach our approach will always be about making sure we protect all aspects of the interests of Australians. Senator Gallagher. No question before the chair. So, uh, Senator Birmingham is not entitled to just free wheel at the lectern. Sorry, I'll just. I will. There is no question before you. He is out of order. Hey. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that a motion relating to the failure of the government to comply with order for the production of documents number 1251 may be moved immediately and have precedence over all other business until determined and be determined without amendment or debate. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Well, as uh, as I was saying, now that that question is uh, is before the chair, you know, this is uh, this is an attempt by the opposition uh, to be able to you know, to be able to try to have you know, to try to you know, make more cheap political points, to try to be able to make more cheap political points, to pursue different debates in ways that uh, that might you know, suit their political objectives, uh, but of course aren't about trying to bring Australians together, aren't about trying to make sure that we actually seriously get all aspects, all aspects of the government's approach in relation to reducing emissions, protecting jobs, ensuring that we bring regional communities with us on this journey. No, they're not interested in that. They just want to make sure that the political debates continue, that the cheap point scoring continues, uh, that in terms of the approach of the opposition, that's all that it's about. Uh, they're not interested, of course, in the fact that you need to confront the reality of differing opinions, differing perspectives, and work through those concerns. That's what we have sought to do. You know, they've learned nothing from the days when, when Dougie Cameron said uh, that being part of the Labor caucus was a bit like having a political lobotomy. You can't speak your mind. You can't think about some issues because they're all off the agenda. Minister, uh, well, the government doesn't Minister, push issues off the Minister, agenda. We're willing to confront Minister, seriously the those issues. The debate has expired. We will now return to the order of business. Clerk. Government business order of the day number two, Customs Amendment Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement Implementation Bill 2021 and a related bill, resumption of second reading debate. Senator and Sheldon was in full. Senator Sheldon was in continuation. I'll give senators a moment, however, to return to their places. Is Senator Sheldon in the chamber? Yes, he is. Excellent. And Senator Pratt, I believe you're next on the speaker's list, but I will go to Senator Sheldon as soon as he's ready. No, you finished? All right. Senator Pratt, are you ready Mr. to take President, the call? Mr. President, Australia is a major regional economic player. In my own home state of WA, we see the iron ore that provides the base material for steel mills <laughs> in southeast and east Asia. Our food products are exported around the region and feed millions of people. Our education and training sector is world leading, and an Australian education is sought after right around the world. One in five workers, or more than two million working Australians, are employed in a trade-related activity. 
We have a one in five uh, Australian workers working to create the exports that keep our nation strong. And indeed, many of those Australians are in Western Australia with that trade activity, the the, an overwhelming value of exports coming out of Western Australia. As an open trading nation, Australia has been the beneficiary of multilateral trade rules-based system that has operated for decades. But as we know, the world is becoming an increasingly challenging place to do business. And the effectiveness of cornerstone institutions of global trade, like the World Trade Organization, are concerningly under threat. And how we sell things that we produce here at home and overseas is changing fast. We need a government that thinks deeply about Australia's place in the world and how we navigate the next decade of change. How we navigate that in a way that delivers better standards and conditions for Australian workers. We can't go about this alone. We need to work with like-minded nations to reform and modernise our regional economy and make sure that Australian working people are always central to any of the plans that we make. This regional cooperative economic partnership will be the world's second most important trade agreement. I know people have expressed concerns about it, and we have listened to those concerns. In the Labor Party, we take them very seriously and work through them. We simply can't be missing uh, from the table in such an important trade agreement. The World Trade Organization itself will have greater scope and coverage over a larger chunk of the global economy than the current RCEP. The RCEP will create a dispute resolution and settlement process that will prevent economic or commercial disagreements from spiralling into conflict. And we look at the nature of the nation states that are part of this regional cooperative uh, partnership. Having this infrastructure in place is particularly important, and therefore it's particularly important that Australia is at the table. We want an agreement that strengthens the rules-based environment so that Australia as a trading nation can flourish within it. The RCEP will tie our economy even closer to our near neighbours like Indonesia, Malaysia and New Zealand. We can be seen to advance the opportunities for export growth to our major partners like China, Japan and South Korea. RCEP countries include nine of Australia's top 15 trading partners already. This accounts for some 58 per cent of Australia's two-way trade and 67 per cent of our na nation's exports. But enacting the RCEP should not mean that we sit on our hands like the Morrison government has done, like the Morrison government has believed we should as a nation. No single trade agreement, regardless of its scope, will shore up our economic future as a nation. The COVID pandemic has shown the critical role that regional supply chains have on ensuring products make the timely transition from raw material to consumers' hands right around the region, consumer products that Australia needs. Um, Australia must take advantage of the growth opportunities that the RCEP provides to diversify our trade, both in markets and in products. Our small and medium enterprises are responsible for only 14 per cent of Australia's exports. And we can and should, as a nation, grow this. To put this in context, the G7 country average of 25 per cent and the European Union of 35 per cent of their exports coming from small to medium enterprises. So we must see this. Uh, trade deal as an opportunity to boost capability of Australia's SMEs and to grow Australia's manufacturing sector. It's interesting of and important, of course, to see that the Groceries Council uh, of Australia very strongly sees a future in growing exports to the region of 
they're currently domestically focused um, household goods. We need to continue to do this by harnessing the unique opportunities we enjoy in, to become also a green energy superpower. We have the skills and capacity to become a re renewable energy powerhouse and a strong Australian manufacturing sector can deliver world-class products. We want to incorporate and innovate cutting-edge technologies and provide good, secure jobs that Australian workers need. This is the future made in Australia that we deserve as a country. But it's not one that we're going to get under this failed Morrison government, as we've seen. A government that can't even come to a decision uh, in its own ranks on the future of energy generation in Australia. Just reflect for a moment. We have a coalition government that is so divided, so riven with internal conflict, that they cannot even come to a decision on how they plan to keep working Australians' lights on into the future. The energy supply we need to manufacture our own goods for Australia and the region, let alone our households. This has massive implications for Australian businesses, workers and the future of Australian exports. As we've seen, the Grattan Institute has told this House in submissions to the upcoming inquiry in the Australian manufacturing industry that the case for a gas-led manufacturing recovery isn't viable any longer. As we've seen, the source of low-cost gas in the eastern states is now very much depleted. The remaining gas is too high cost uh, to meet our manufacturing needs, and so this gas led recovery can only employ a small number of people. If we're a nation that seeks to set ambitious climate and emissions reductions goals, then we need an energy future plan now, a plan to meet our targets and a plan to transform our economy. Making these plans now is much cheaper than waiting to the death knell of uh, climate change in 2050. And we've wasted many years, many, many years already. We cannot continue to see the burning of gas and coal to generate the electricity Australian industry needs. Why? Because it's frankly more expensive than the other energy sources that we have at our disposal. We need a government uh, that wants to spend and use its spending power to invest in renewables technology designed and manufactured right here at home, to diversify and grow our export markets overseas through the rules-based trading system that the RCEP maintains. This is not an opportunity we can let slip past. A report jointly released in recent weeks by the Australian Conservation Foundation, the Australian Business Council, the WWF and the ACTU, they suggest that investment in clean exports could generate some $89 billion in new trade by 2040. That is more than we currently export in fossil fuels. So we need a future made in Australia that we can export to the world. And so it's alarming when we see uh, this trade deal that we're debating before the parliament. Uh, yes, we can make a step forward here, and yet we are held back by the internal division of this government when it comes to our energy future. Those opposite are too busy having their ideological brawls in their party room than to put a step forward to govern in the interest of Australian businesses and workers. The World Bank says India needs to create 8.1 million jobs per year just to maintain its current employment rate. This is critical, therefore, to see Australia's energy supply uh, accessible to those nations. We know that renewables will be, will be important to their energy future, and a lack of green energy supply, let alone coal, and we uh, will constrain India's growth. We can become a world leader and a significant regional player 
in the export of materials and technologies needed to transition economies around the world to greener and more sustainable energy generation. This includes a decarbonising China and a quickly industrialising India. The trade deal before us strengthens this opportunity, but the Morrison government will leave us uh, asleep at the wheel in terms of being able to make the most of these contributions. We have previously raised concerns over the Morrison government's refusal to release the final treaty text before the agreement was signed to allow it to be scrutinised. We have a government that is notorious for secrecy and notorious for a lack of transparency. And this is very damaging uh, for how Australians view their leaders. Is it any wonder that we have uh, Australian parts of the Australian population uh, captured by conspiracy theories uh, when this government does nothing to promote uh, transparency in government? But it also means Australian industry cannot plan ahead. Greater transparency in the development of trade agreements is critical to building community support, support for fair and open trade. Labor has been in consultation with the union movement, civil society, economics groups throughout the negotiation and eventual signing of this agreement. And we do this because we believe in allowing people to plan ahead. A future Albanese Labor government would use the opportunity the RCEP gives us to work in collaboration with Australian business and workers to grow the Australian manufacturing industry. Now is the time to invest in Australian manufacturing, and we might not get a chance as good as this again. Enacting the RCEP should function as an opportunity to take action and diversify what we export. Let's not lose this opportunity uh, that we have in this agreement with a failed climate change agenda here within Australia. This failed government needs to stop sitting on its hands, quit fighting amongst itself and start getting on with growing Australian manufacturing. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Patrick. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, I rise to speak on the Custom Amendments Regional Comprehensive Economic uh, Partnership Agreement Implementation Bill and the uh, corresponding Customs Tariff Amendment uh, Bill. Um, it's interesting. I've been listening to the debate in the chamber, uh, to listening to the comments of uh, the Greens, One Nation, uh, Labor, uh, and, and of course the government. Uh, but, but interestingly, on the, particularly on the, on the Labor side, and, and, and I'll accuse uh, One Nation of this as well, standing up, pointing out all of the things that they believe in, yet this particular agreement uh, uh, presents risks for all of those things. Um, so there, there's a, I hope there's an upside uh, in, in trade without really examining the risks to the very principles that you know, the Labor Party uh, purport to support, uh, and indeed uh, One Nation uh, purports to support. Um, you know, I always listen to, uh, uh, to Senator Roberts when he says we've got to base our considerations on, on data and facts, and uh, I agree with that principle. But this is a, a situation where there's no evidence of, a, of, a, of an economic benefit that flows from entering into this agreement. There is no independent economic assessment of the cost and the benefits uh, to RCEP. And there's no additional market access for Australian exporters. Don't we have a responsibility to look at a piece of legislation and say, what are the pros, what are the cons? Here we have no view as to the economic, uh, as to the, the economic benefits. Part of the problem here, of course, is, um, as Senator Pratt mentioned, whenever these deals get negotiated, they get no negotiated in secret. There's no opportunity to see the text of them uh, such that people can then do uh, proper analysis and, uh, uh, and present the, the parliament with uh, information such that they can make an informed decision. None of that's there. 
Time and time again I see the Labor Party stand up and say, we want transparency, we want transparency, we want transparency. And uh, the government just keeps going off and doing what it does, which is to negotiate these things in secret. It turns out that uh, it, it turns out that uh, when you know, if, we, if we go back and have a look at uh, you know, just just recently the Better Advice Bill, have a look at the Better Advice Bill. There was a bill that was in play there, uh, where the government presented to the parliament a a bill that didn't have any of the regulations attached to it. And you know what? The Senate stood up. The, St the Labor Party, uh, the, the, the Greens, the, the National, uh, the, sorry, One Nation stood up and said, you know what? We're not going to let this bill pass until such time as we get to see all the data. And you know what? The government then pulled the bill. They, they saw the second reader, they worked out they didn't have the numbers, pulled the bill and have had, got, had to go away and then table the amendments. And that's what happens when the Senate stands up and says, you know what, we're not going to do things uh, without proper analysis. Yet that's exactly what we're doing here. There is no analysis that suggests that uh, this gives us an economic benefit. Interestingly, um, you know, this bill uh, involves, involves China. Now, uh, China has of, of recent times been uh, acting in a manner that is quite harmful to Australia. We can see the, the wine industry uh, suffering. I hope uh, Senator Farrell chips in and, and, and gives me a hear here in relation to this. The wine industry is suffering um, as a result of ch changes that have occurred with, uh, uh, with, with China, acting outside of the trade agreement, acting outside of the trade agreement. And uh, the, the, thing, the thing that... Uh, 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 that uh, the problem that arises here is that we're effectively entering into further uh, agreements with a, with a country we know doesn't comply. So what happens is they don't comply, but we're the model party to these agreements. So for the next two or three years, Australian agriculture will suffer. Australian agriculture will suffer because um, we've got one party not playing the, 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 the right part uh, or, or the right way, and then we've got Australia uh, you know, being modelled in the way it handles or conducts its international affairs. And that's the danger we, we have in you know, further signing up to a, uh, an agreement that uh, may well benefit uh, a country that is acting in a manner that is harmful to us. There's also the issue of, um, of uh, uh, Human rights. Some of the countries involved in this are, in actual fact, in breach of human rights. You know, the Labor Party stood up uh, and uh, affirmed its support to stop slave labour, to stop importing goods that come from slave labour. Uh, the, the Senate passed a bill in support of that, despite the government opposing it, and yet. Here we're entering into an arrangement that doesn't address that problem with some of the countries to whom uh, are engaging in this slave labour. It's money before human rights, it would appear. Not that we even know that there's money involved in this for us. Typically we've negotiated these sort of agreements and haven't done well. That's what typically happens. We negotiate, we're signing up an agreement with, with uh, Myanmar currently governed by a military uh, junta that took power in an illegal coup in February this year. Seriously? That's what we're doing. We're, we're, we're engaging in, in commerce, engaging in uh, uh, negotiations with an illegitimate junta. So you know, I don't understand some of these things. This, this um, uh, agreement may well restrict uh, local industry development by basically entrenching the rules that discourage, discourage government assistance to local industries. Now already we have this perverse situation, I see this on the other side of the chamber all the time where they talk about competitive advantage, which is an economic theory that says, well, you know, if you can do it cheaper somewhere else, that's where you should do it. But what happens is the government imposes upon 
Australian companies. They come along to an Australian company and say, you know what, you've got to have leave loading, you've got to have uh, long service leave, you've got to have minimum uh, wages, you've got to have occupational health and safety, you've got to have environmental standards, you've got to build your product according to an Australian standard. Now, I don't object to any of those things, but we've got to recognise that imposes a cost. It imposes a cost on Australian business. Uh, we then uh, look at the, the, the price and we say, well, hang on, it's cheaper to, to buy that from, uh, from Vietnam or Burma or somewhere, where they don't have any of those rules. So I don't mind the, the theory of competitive advantage, provided it's applied in a, um, in a practical manner, not in a, a completely theoretical manner. This bill entrenches some of those principles. You know, every time I stand up and say I want to, I'd like to see the government supporting Australian industry by way of procurement, I get confronted with, I'm sorry, Senator, that's going to breach trade agreements. Yet we, we sign up to these things. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, particularly in circumstances where there is shown to be no economic benefit. Just downsides, just the, the, just the downside risk, and we shouldn't be doing that. You know, the, the, the Labor Party say that they support manufacturing, but they're now going to help sign up to an agreement that fetters the, the ability of the government to assist in rebuilding the very lows of manufacturing that we, that we have. Now, I've talked on many occasions in the chamber about the need for us to stop exporting our rock, stop exporting iron ore, or stop just exporting our iron ore, stop just exporting our lithium, instead build steel and export steel. Build lithium-ion batteries and export batteries, much greater value, generating intellectual property, generating jobs, generating value. Do that here. But every time we try and do that here, we get confronted with this competitive advantage. We say someone else can do it uh, cheaper, but it's because we impose all of these um, costs upon Australian industry. And this treaty would seek to embed that even further. And uh, you know that, that, that's why, you know, when it when it comes down to it, I can't support this. I'm all for free trade, or fair trade rather. I'm all for fair trade. But it's got to be, it has to be fair, and it's proven not to be fair in many, many uh, circumstances. It does have the risk of in increasing the number of temporary work workers coming here to Australia uh, that might be exploited, something I thought the Labor Party cared about, workers being e exploited. This can assist in that regard. It only takes the Labor Party to stand up once on a treaty and suddenly DFAT will have to change its conduct, just as um, Treasury had to change its conduct in terms of presenting bills to this, uh, to this chamber without the regulations attached. It just takes you know, one, once or twice us standing up and saying no, and then DFAT will have to go back uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and negotiate these treaties in a different way, knowing the views of this, this chamber, knowing the views of the representatives of the Australian public. So um, yeah, there, there are other concerns I have in relation to this. This does not invoke ISDS, but that will be reviewed in a couple of years' time. Now, just so if people who don't understand what ISDS is, um, it's, a, it's a schema whereby if the Australian government changes regulations, does something in the public interest that harms a, an international investor here in Australia, they can seek compensation for that. We saw that attempted in, uh, in, the, case, in, the, in, in the case of uh, cigarette tobacco advertising. We had a health measure to, to basically make sure we didn't make cigarette packets attractive. The uh, uh, cigarette manufacturer then takes us to the High Court, loses in the High Court, and then seeks to set up a, uh, a, a, a company in Hong Kong to exploit the, uh, the, the, the ability to, to then invoke ISDS. 
in 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 um, uh, investor state dispute settlement. So, um, and now in that particular instance, we're quite fortunate that the uh, the tribunal ruled it, that uh, that the the company had been set up essentially for the purposes of, of engaging in an ISDS, and so it was found uh, that uh, the tribunal uh, well didn't didn't um, uh, then. Uh, agree, but we were we were up for potentially billions of dollars. This is a situation where the taxpayer underwrites the risk for a company. The taxpayer underwrites the risk for public companies. So companies can come here, they can make an investment, make an assumption that there will be no changes in the law, no changes in public policy, because uh, if there are, we're going to invoke ISDS. And that's a risk that flows from this particular agreement, because there is a proposal to review this again, likely to be done in secret and just presented as a fait accompli in a couple of years' time. And you know, the Labor Party has a track record of, of uh, what's it's, it's part of its, its uh, party platform is to not support ISDS, yet on several occasions. They've wandered in here and voted for um, for trade agreements that actually um, that, that uh, actually uh, invoke ISDS. It's a bit of you know, hypocrisy um, that is harmful to Australians because again, it sees um, the public underwriting the risk of uh, of, of of companies. Now, I'll conclude by saying I I support international trade. I recognise its benefits. But when something is presented to this parliament um, and it's in effect a, an agreement that does very little except expose us to risks, you have to stand back and say that's not in Australia's best interests. And that's uh, what I will be saying when the bells ring. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. There's no way that Australia should be signing this. Absolutely no way. I was a member of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties when we had the hearings on this, and it was pretty clear that signing RCEP basically achieves nothing for us in terms of trade. There is no, I mean, number one, they won't actually release any um, independent modelling that shows the, the details, but basically on the evidence presented to us, there, was, they, there were no claims that it was going to have a massive improvement in our trade. But actually, there was no modelling that was presented to say, yep, this is going to be really good for Australia. It's basically things in terms of our relationships and trade relationships with the countries that were part of RCEP it was all going to stay much the same. So, number one, the benefits, basically zero. Then you've got to look at the costs, and the costs of signing RCEP are immense, because basically it means that Australia is signing up to trade arrangements that are unfair, that are environmentally really damaging, and signing up to a trade agreement that has got no labour rights, it's got no human rights provisions. It's basically, it basically is an incredibly um, old-fashioned, last-century way of doing trade that does not even stand up to the standards of most trade agreements that are now being negotiated around the world. I wanted to talk about four things that are fundamentally problems with RCEP and why Australia should, should be saying no and say, no, nah, come on, yep. Fair trade, good. We're happy to enter into trade agreements that are fair trade agreements, but RCEP is not that. The first was the total lack of transparency in the negotiations, in the whole process, basically. The second is the lack of human rights standards. The third, the, la the lack of labour rights standards. And fourthly, fourthly, particularly in this last week that we're in this parliament before our Prime Minister goes off to Glasgow, before this immense time of the world coming together to be tackling our climate crisis, yet here we are signing up to a trade agreement that has got no environmental standards, that has got, hasn't even got an environmental chapter, that basically says climate doesn't matter. 
So, first of all, the lack of transparency in the negotiations, in the whole process. And I just think the easiest thing to summarise that is to read from, from the submission that AFTINET, the Australian Fair Trade and Investment Network, made to the inquiry into, into RCEP. And they basically said that Australia's current procedure for negotiating and ratifying trade agreements is highly secretive and is not compliant with the basic democratic principles that underpin our domestic policy making processes. Trade negotiations are conducted in secret, and neither the parliament nor the wider public had input into or oversight over the development of Australia's negotiation mandates. This was the case with the RCEP negotiations. Negotiation texts were secret throughout the negotiations, and the final text of the agreements was not made public until after the government made the decision to sign the agreement. That in itself is a reason why we should be saying no. We should be renegotiating our entire trade negotiation practices so they do not conflict with basic democratic engagement in these processes. And you can do it. Other countries in the world have got processes that actually allow for much more input of civil society, much more input of their parliaments before the, the, trade, the, the, um, the agreements are signed. So it's not as if we'd be out on our own in insisting that this is the case. The second area, of course, as, we, as others have already noted in this debate, but interesting on the part of behalf of the Labor Party, although they note this, it doesn't seem to influence how they vote, are the lack of labour rights standards. And again, you know, it's not there that um, trade agreements, again, AFTINET say that trade agreements should include commitments by governments not to reduce labour rights and to implement internationally agreed labour rights, which are defined by the International Labour Organisation. These should be enforced by the state-to-state -state disputes process of the agreement. And of course, noting that these rights intersect with UN human rights obligations and include freedom of association, rights to collective bargaining, health and safety in the workplace, no forced labour, no child labour and no discrimination in the workplace. Again, this is what trade agreements should include. RCEP does not. Why should we be signing an agreement that does not include what are recognised as what should be in trade agreements? The third, of course, that I wanted to get to is the lack of human rights standards. And this then comes to the, I just am stunned, absolutely stunned, that we are signing a trade agreement with countries, including Myanmar, with China, with the Philippines, and why? To be achieving no increase in our trade. Signing a trade, a trade agreement with Myanmar at the same time as countries around the world are trying to work out what is the most pressure that we can be putting on Myanmar, on, that, on the, the junta that took over Myanmar, the brutal um, attack on people, on democracy, on human rights, who have killed over, over a thousand people, who are, there are people who are fleeing the, the Myanmar um, military forces. We know that the pressure is on, not that Australia has done anything about it, to be, implying, to be applying sanctions. The EU, Canada, the US, um, the UK have all applied sanctions. We at least have said that we're not going to um, continue any military cooperation. We need to be having economic sanctions. All of this is necessary to try and do something about this brutal attack on democracy in Myanmar. That's what Australia should be doing in relation to Myanmar. But no, we are signing a trade agreement with them. Why on earth would we be signing a trade, trade agreement with them? It can only be taken as the, us being complicit, as us giving tacit support to the Myanmar military takeover and the, the junta in Myanmar. That in itself should be a reason to say we are going to put this on hold. We're not signing a trade agreement with Myanmar as part of it. It is just something that is unacceptable for Australia to do. China. I mean, we've got a free trade agreement with China, which they are blatantly breaching. The, you know, the bans on our goods going into China because they are unhappy with us, because we're, we are speaking out about some of their human rights abuses and, and about their expansionism. So they've decided to block you know, our imports into China, our exports into China. Again, 
Why, given that behaviour by China at the moment, given that is so live, given that the Australia-Chinese relationship is at such a low ebb at the moment, there are so many other things that we should be doing with China to, in, to be working out how we improve that relationship. But just blatantly signing a trade agreement that doesn't require any of that negotiation is just it's ridiculous. And thirdly, I mean, other countries, and essentially when I'm you know, hearing speeches today about this, essentially we're signing this trade agreement because ASEAN nations and the main nations that are involved and we want to keep sweet with ASEAN and it would be a snub to them if we didn't. We need to be working out how we work with ASEAN without supporting brutal military totalitarian governments because, frankly, otherwise maintaining nice polite relationships with brutal totalitarian governments that are destroying the lives of their citizens, as we have heard so much of in this parliament over the, you know, over the years, but particularly for me in my role as the foreign affairs spokesperson over the last year, frankly, we should not be kowtowing to them and basically saying, OK, we'll sign trade agreements. Yes, we need to be work at working out how we work multi multilaterally, how we can be working together where we have got common interests. But signing free trade agreements that do not require anything from them in terms of human rights in particular, as well as labour rights, as well as environmental rights, is not the way to go. And so then fourthly, the lack of environmental rights standards. And the other three areas I've talked about are pretty, uh, pretty amazing and uh, <laughs> astounding, but the lack of environmental rights standards in this, um, the RCEP trade negotiation are just gobsmacking. We are in a climate crisis. We are in a time in humanity, probably, you know, possibly this year, this, certainly this decade, in terms of the future of humanity on this planet, the climate crisis is the number one thing that we need to be tackling. And yet we are signing a trade agreement that doesn't even have an environmental chapter in it, that doesn't say that it have any constraints, it doesn't ha have any measures in it to require people to be uh, requiring governments to be taking climate seriously and to be, for that to impact on our, our trade relationships. Of course, other countries in the world are very much linking climate and trade, and it's quite right that they should do that. Not just on a moral reason that you know, we should only be you know, trading with, with countries that are tackling the climate crisis appropriately, given it's a shared issue for all of us, but it is an economic issue, and that's what the European Union, of course, uh, are, are realising that if they are taking action to be re slashing their carbon pollution you know, by more than 50 per cent by 2030, why should other countries freeload on that? There are costs over the coming years of, tackle, of, of making the, the huge cuts in our carbon pollution. The benefits of doing that, of doing that, of course, are immense because it means that you know, humanity will actually have a future. But there are costs, and so why, you know, shouldn't the European Union that is taking those actions actually say, well, if the other country that you, if you're not taking those costs into account, into account, if you are just letting polluters pollute for free, well, then we are going to put some tariffs on you to account for that. And we had the Trade Minister just yesterday, our, our Trade Minister, noting that Australia is likely to be liable for, um, for tariffs, carbon tariffs, for goods that we are trying to export into the EU. And it is very appropriate that we should be. And what that means, instead of having a price on carbon here in Australia that we could be reaping the benefits of and having the, cost, the, the, the revenue raised by that price on carbon going into supporting the transition to a zero carbon economy here in Australia and supporting people who need to transition, of supporting programs for jobs, for, for workers who need to transition out of the mining of, of coal and gas and oil, instead of that revenue being able to be allocated to that, it's going to be revenue that's going off to the European Union so that they can use that revenue. Basically, these things are linked. We are in a climate crisis. There is action that needs to be taken. International mechanisms, multitudes of international mechanisms all around the world are being developed to work out how we work together as a world to be tackling climate. 
You know, the COP26 conference in Glasgow in that starts in 10 days' time is obviously one of those prime mechanisms to be getting countries to be up upping the level of, of their national contributions to be slashing our carbon pollution. And that, you know, while uh, here we have a government that's doing nothing, that's going off to Glasgow basically with a em completely empty, ba empty basket, we're offering nothing in terms of an increase in our ambition in, in tackling um, the climate crisis, at the same time we are signing a trade agreement that says zero about carbon zero about climate. It is just unthinkable. And it's just showing that we've, we have just got it completely upside down when, it, when it, um, it comes to how we think about what it means to be a good global citizen, what it means to be acting in the global interest, what it means to be acting in our national interest. And all of those th three things are the same. We need to be putting human rights, labour rights, our extinction crisis, the huge pressures that the world's environments are under, our biodiversity under, and the huge pressures that the world is under because of climate, they need to be front and centre of everything we are doing because they are existential crises that the world is under. Every global mechanism that we take part of, we should be saying, is this going to help or is this going to hinder action on tackling the climate crisis? There are so many things we could be doing to help. We could be going to, to Glasgow and saying, yes, Australia is going to play its part. We are going to slash our pollution, as the science says it should happen, you know, by 75 per cent by 2030 at least, and to zero carbon as quickly as possible thereafter. We could be doing that. We could be signing up to the Powering Past Coal Alliance, which has got 41 countries who are committing to be getting out of coal by 2030. We could be signing up to the Global Methane Alliance. We could be take, taking any number of actions internationally. But instead, what are we doing? We are signing a free trade agreement that basically is blind to all of these issues that the world is facing. The Australian Greens support fair trade. We support having good relationships with our neighbours, but we don't support the sorts of arrangements that are in the RCEP and absolutely should not be supported. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Farrell. Thank you. Your, um, your name is not on the speakers list that I've had circulated. Everyone's fine. Have you make your contribution? Thank you, Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Senator Rustin, for being so gracious in that respect and allowing me to speak. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Acting Deputy uh, Chair. Uh, Labor will be supporting the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement implementation bills. The partnership, or RCEP as it's known, was signed on the 15th of November 2020 by 15 countries. It's a partnership that includes uh, members of ASEAN, the Association of uh, Southeast Asian Nations, Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand and Vietnam, as well as five non-ASEAN nations of Australia, China, Japan, New Zealand and South Korea. These countries make up 29 per cent of the world's GDP and 30 per cent of the world's population. RCEP is quite simply the biggest trade agreement in history. Negotiations for RCEP started in 2012 at the 21st ASEAN Summit in Cambodia. Prime Minister Julia Gillard uh, and Trade Minister uh, Craig Emerson commenced negotiations for RCEP on behalf of Australia. Um, <coughs> from the beginning, Labor has supported Australia being actively involved uh, in the negotiations of this extraordinary example of re regional trade infrastructure, uh, which very importantly was led by the ASEAN nations in a big deal for the world and a big deal for Australia. It includes nine of Australia's top 15 trading partners uh, and economies, which account for 58 per cent of Australia's uh, total two-way trade and 67 per cent of our exports. Ratifying RCEP means Australia has a seat at the table in the biggest trade agreement in the world. Importantly, Australia will be able to influence the rules as the agreement continues to develop. 
As Dr uh, Geoffrey Wilson of the Perth USA Centre has argued, and I quote, RCEP will be the world's second most important trade agreement on arrival, ranking um, <clears throat> behind only the WTO itself. Uh, in essence, uh, RCEP strengthens the rules already developed through a number of Australia's existing free trade agreements and creates new regional architecture for economic activity, with the potential to act as a forum for ongoing dialogue and cooperation. Further, RCEP includes core investment protections, rules requiring payment of compensation where an investment is ex-appropriated, uh, minimum standards for treatment of investors under international law and compensation for losses due to conflict and civil strife. The agreement provides uh, avenues for tackling non-tariff barriers, including in areas such as quarantine and technical standards, by promoting compliance with the WTO rules and further improving cooperation and transparency. And finally, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President, RCEP supports economic uh, capacity building and in particular provides a dedicated chapter addressing the capability of small and medium enterprises in the region to benefit from the agreement. These protections and transparency provisions will provide greater certainty and confidence to the Australian businesses looking to invest in the region. The advantage of RCEP is that it provides a single set of rules for exporters to use, rather than having to rely on the multiplicity of different rules and procedures under the existing FTAs. This cuts or simplifies a great deal of red tape for Australian SMEs and opens up opportunities for Australian exporters looking to utilise regional supply chains. Regional supply or value chains are an essential component of the contemporary uh, global um, economy. And I know you know that, uh, Acting uh, Deputy uh, President. They are uh, <coughs> a cross-border industrial uh, network for producing goods where countries specialise in different stages of production associated with a finished product. The Apple iPhone is a classic example of a product dependent on global value chains. The iPhone is designed in the United States. They're made from hundreds of individual components, all sourced from various specialised suppliers in 43 countries across six con continents before final assembl uh, assembly in China for sale to world markets. RCEP as a trading block will render such value chains cheaper and easier to access for Australian companies. While bilateral trade agreements are lucrative in terms of tariff reductions, they render value chains difficult due to the differences in rules, standards and procedures uh, from country to country. As uh, a multilateral trade agreement, RCEP is designed to streamline these rules, encouraging the development of deeper value change. Uh, for example, businesses will be able to use a made in RCEP um, origin certificate with standardised rules for how much local content is needed to qualify. In this context, RCEP uh, will make the local, <coughs> sorry, the Indo-Pacific the most attractive location to build value chains in the global economy. And a strong, vibrant and prosperous uh, Indo-Pacific uh, is good for Australia. As an open trading nation, Australia has been a beneficiary of a multilateral rules-based trading system that has operated for decades. Labor recognises that Australia's security and prosperity relies on our continued economic engagement in the world and integration with our region, including through trade and investment. Um, <coughs> One in five uh, Australian workers is employed in a trade-related activity, uh, more than uh, two million Australians. Labor knows open trade will be the integral component of Australia's economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Labor acknowledges that open trade agreements and comprehensive economic partnerships have become matters of st strategic and geopolitical significance. 
Labor uh, will at all times act in the national interest in accordance with Australia's international obligations in dealing with open trade agreements and comprehensive economic partnerships. As the WTO appellate body stagnates and reform is stalled, regional agreements such as RCEP are integral to creating an even playing field between Australia and its uh, trading uh, partners around the world, but particularly uh, in our vibrant uh, region uh, from which uh, our future prosperity uh, will be earned. But Labor knows that the community is rightly sceptical about the Morrison-Joyce government's approach to economic change and trade agreements. We all know that the Liberals and the Nationals treat trade agreements as like uh, trophies to put on a shelf, ink the deal, get dressed up for the photo op, but then no follow-up. Labor's approach to international trade and trade agreements will be very different, Madam Acting Deputy President. Can I talk about the uh, ALP uh, platform? <coughs> uh, an Albanese Labor government will promote Australia's international competitiveness, maintain a commitment to an open economy and work to increase the volume of Australia's trade with other nations. Labor has a long record as an advocate for an open global trading system. Reducing barriers to trade creates more competitive industries and benefits consumers through lower prices and greater choice. Trade is a pathway to high skill, a high wage uh, future for working uh, Australians. Labor will set out an ambitious open trade agenda in government aimed squarely at increasing the complexity of our exports in order to create more well-paid, secure jobs, strengthen economic resilience and ensure that every trade deal we sign will increase the living standards of the Australian people. Labor will promote services uh, sector innovation and identify the capabilities needed to establish Australia as a leading global uh, trade in services economy. The benefit uh, of trade can and must be fairly uh, shared both at home and abroad. Labor will invest in education, training, skills and innovation, building Australia's national infrastructure and promoting the health and welfare of the community so Australians benefit from the opportunities created by trade. We know from our own history that while the benefit of trade liberalisations are significant, uh, they can come at a cost to sectors, workers and regions that are disadvantaged by st structural change in our economy. Particularly in the short term, adjustment uh, support is needed for some sectors, workers and regional communities to ensure that they are lifted up but not left behind by economic change. An Albanese Labor government will not leave these workers and those communities behind. Our industry policy will include structural assistance uh, to sectors of the economy, workers and regions which are impacted uh, by um, any economic change. When multilateral trade negotiations such as the WTO are not making satisfactory progress, Labor will consider high quality regional or bilateral, bilateral trade agreements that are in Australia's national interests and that support the multilateral uh, trading system. Labor is committed to trade policies consistent with Australian values of justice and equality, community views, workers' rights and the interests of the developing countries. Trade agreements must be consistent with Australia's social and economic values, be based on widespread consultation, provide for appropriate minimum and enforceable labor and environmental standards take account of social and economic impacts and allow sovereign governments to make decisions and implement policies in the interests of their citizens. Economic growth has been good for developing countries, but in many economies these benefits have not been fairly shared. More equal economic growth will create decent jobs, uh, lifting people out of poverty, giving them economic independence and supporting human rights. RCEP, uh, as it stands, does not have an environmental chapter 
or a Labor chapter. When Labor was in government, Trade Minister uh, Craig Emerson sought to include these provisions. However, other RCEP members were not amenable to this. Prime Minister Julia Gillard, Trade Minister uh, Emerson and the Labor government at the time rightly decided to proceed with negotiations despite this setback to ensure Australia continued to be involved in the creation of regional trade architecture. Opting out <coughs> and retreating to the sidelines was absolutely not an option and to do so would have set back Australia's relationship with ASEAN significantly. The intent of RCEP is capacity building, bringing emerging economies up in line with established economies like ours. This uh, stands in contrast to other more ambitious agreements with developed economies, which includes labour chapters uh, with enforceable uh, international labour standards. However, RCEP includes uh, ratchet measures with the ability to continue to develop provisions in these areas through successive reviews over time. Uh, Labor in government will not enter into trade agreements that undermine the Australian government's capacity to govern in the interest of all Australians, in including any provisions that firstly remove Australia's protection of local jobs through the, regional, uh, the regulation of temporary work, waive labour market testing, further limit the capacity of governments to uh, uh, procure goods and services only, uh, require the uh, privatisation uh, or contestability of public services, undermine Medicare, the public uh, health system and the pharmaceutical benefits system, uh, undermine state or Commonwealth workplace laws or occupational licensing arrangements or undermine laws that relate to anti-dumping. Labor's uh, Shadow Minister for Trade, the uh, very professional uh, <coughs> Madeleine King, has sought clear advice from the Minister for Trade and Investment, uh, uh, Mr Tian, uh, that RCEP broadly complies with these terms and that by ratifying the agreement it will not undermine the Australian government's capacity to govern in the interests of all Australians. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Uh, I do have the minister next on my call sheet. Senator Watt, are you seeking the call? Is there a call to contribute to the debate? I'm looking for guidance from the whips as to whether we're going. And um, I'm on the list. Apologies, my microphone was off. I've been provided with advice from the clerk that um, the speaking list is conventional, and I did see Senator Watt and the minister jump to their feet almost simultaneously. I, I will, based on the advice from the clerk, I will allow. Uh, Senator O'Farrell, are you making a point of order? Um, only that my name isn't uh, O'Farrell. <laughs> oh, um, apologies, um, Senator Farrell. Um, I know. I know. There's been some controversy about uh, New South Wales premiers in recent times, and it's apologies, easy uh, to uh, to uh, to confuse. But uh, respectfully, I think um, the point of order I was going to make was that we should apply the convention, um, and I understand that's what you're intending to do. That, that is the advice I've received, Senator Farrell. Apologies for misusing your name. I'm, I will give the call to Senator Watt, but um, I will discuss this matter with the, risk, the whips offline. Senator Farrell. Uh, S Senator Watt. Thanks, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. I appreciate you um, providing me with that opportunity. Um, I might just elaborate a little further on some of the points that my colleague, Senator Farrell, uh, was just beginning to make, uh, particularly in relation to uh, matters of labour market testing. And labour market testing is always a contentious issue when it comes to free trade agreements. Uh, it's something that uh, the Labor Party, the Labor movement uh, and the community, I think, more broadly do have serious concerns about 
whenever free trade agreements are being um, considered. Uh, obviously, the Labor Party's position uh, is to strongly support the ability of local workers to obtain uh, employment. Uh, we've got a very strong tradition of supporting that, um, and we do need to make sure that whatever free, free trade agreements are entered into by our country do respect the rights of local workers. Uh, and Senator Farrell had just begun to make the point that my colleague and friend, the Shadow Minister for Trade, Ms King, uh, has sought advice on this point from the Minister for Trade and Investment, Mr Tian. Uh, and the advice that she was seeking was as to whether RCEP broadly complies uh, with a range, uh, a range of uh, considerations that Labor thought were important. Uh, and she also, Ms King also sought advice that ratifying this agreement would not undermine the Australian government's capacity to govern in the interests of all Australians. And I'm pleased to confirm uh, that based on that advice that we've received, uh, RCEP does not expand waivers of labour market testing for foreign workers. Uh, there's a range of stakeholders who have rightly queried the inclusion of an instrument in the Migration Act which mentions a change to our domestic labour market testing regime. Uh, and we have clarified with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade that this is merely a technical measure and there are no changes to labour market testing in this country as a result of participating in this regional comprehensive economic partnership. Indeed, the instrument under the Migration Act that was foreshadowed in the National Interest Assessment establishes that the obligations set out in RCEP form part of Australia's legal obligations. Such instruments are made under the Migration Act for every international trade agreement that Australia enters into. Further, RCEP does not restrict Australia's domestic procurement arrangements at any level of government. Uh, it does not require the privatisation of any Australian public services. It does not undermine the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. It does not undermine state or Commonwealth workplace laws or occupational licensing arrangements. It does not undermine Australia's anti-dumping regime. It does not include provisions that limit the right of the Commonwealth to regulate in the interests of public welfare or in relation to safe products. And it does not include investor state dispute settlement provisions, better known as ISDS provisions. Uh, and I want to particularly join with my Labor colleagues in commending the work of civil society and, and, and the trade union movement in their ongoing campaign, uh, which has led to this government moving away from implementing ISDS provisions as a base for dispute settlement in all trade negotiations. Uh, that is something that has been uh, an issue of serious contention within the community. Uh, the potential for these clauses to limit uh, or, or to, ex to limit the application of Australian laws uh, to overseas companies uh, as a result of entering free trade agreements. And the fact that we are seeing such ISDS provisions f uh, less and less in our international treaties is a testament to the tireless campaigning uh, of the ACTU, the broader labour movement, AFTINET and others. Recent media reports that Clive Palmer is exploring the use of ISDS mechanisms to sue the Australian government reaffirm our opposition to them as a general provision of international trade deals. Having already forked out $1 million on legal fees, because the Prime Minister supported Mr Palmer's attempt to sue Western Australia, Australian taxpayers don't want to be stung again by another vexatious suit from Mr Palmer. An Albanese Labor government will ensure that trade agreements that are signed by the Commonwealth require skills assessments, including practical and theoretical testing, to be undertaken in Australia and not restrict such skills assessments for temporary visa holders, uh, and we will uh, include uh, in any future bilateral, regional or multilateral trade agreements a Labor chapter 
as in LABOUR, with enforceable internationally recognised labour standards. The Labor Party supports and will ensure in government that a rigorous independent economic analysis is conducted of, free, of, of trade agreements. Labor will also require an independent economic assessment of the impact of each agreement uh, to be included in the report of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties to the Parliament. And I want to put on record my appreciation to the members of the J. Scott Committee, including my good mate Senator Ayres, um, Mr Khalil, the member for Wills, and many others as well, uh, for the good work that they've done on this trade agreement and many others. Uh, the J. Scott report into treaty making, report number 193, which was tabled in August of this year, recommended that the government consider implementing a process through which independent modelling and analysis of a trade agreement at both the macro and sectoral levels uh, is undertaken in the future by the Productivity Commission or similarly independent and expert body and provided to the committee alongside the national interest analysis to improve assessment of the agreements, increase public confidence in the benefits of trade agreements and facilitate the longitudinal assessment of actual trade outcomes. And Labor calls on the government to implement this recommendation. This important review by J. Scott into treaty development would not have happened but for Labor. In discussions with the government in relation to the Indonesian-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the government, through the then Trade Minister, Senator Birmingham, agreed to Labor's request that J. Scott be asked to undertake such a review. We are glad the government supported this and gave the parliament an important opportunity to examine the manner in which it addresses free trade treaties and agreements and demonstrated the community desire for more openness and transparency from government in relation to free trade negotiations. Labor in government will ensure that Australians are informed about trade negotiations and will undertake full community consultation before entering new agreements. The provision of public updates will follow each round of negotiations. Where feasible, draft texts will all also be released. Labor will legislate to ensure transparency in future trade agreements through the tabling of national interest assessments, consultation with industry, unions and community groups during negotiations, tabling of negotiation material in parliament where feasible, again, as recommended by J. Scott into its report into treaty making. making. Uh, Labor will also commission an independent national interest assessment, which includes a comprehensive social, economic and regional impact assessment of the negotiated treaty text, uh, and we will mandate 10-year reviews of existing free trade agreements. It's a very important principle to Labor that trade agreements do not be used to undermine Australian working conditions, and foreign workers should only be used in situations where specific skill shortages are present and only for the period it takes to train and develop the capacity of an Australian to do the job. Uh, it is disappointing uh, that the underinvestment and indeed the cuts made by this government to our training system, about $3 billion worth of cuts uh, to TAFE alone, have at times caused skill shortages. And of course, they've been exacerbated recently through the closure of Australia's international borders. There have been many employers who've been able to overcome the lack of skills in a particular area, whether that be a particular industry or a particular region, by bringing in foreign workers. Uh, and sometimes that has been at the, to the detriment of Australian workers who haven't been able to obtain uh, the training uh, that is needed for such positions uh, as a result of the cuts this government has made to skills and training. And we're now, of course, paying the price. I know there are many businesses around my state of Queensland that are screaming. Uh, for skilled workers at the, at the moment, uh, and that is a direct consequence of this government's cuts uh, to training. Uh, Labor does not in support the inclusion of provisions in trade agreements that confer legal rights on foreign businesses.
that are not available to domestic businesses. Uh, but of course, while these are our principles, Labor is not yet in government. And as we know, international treaties are the remit of the executive arm of government. It's worth us thinking as well then about the Liberals and Nationals' record when it comes to trade agreements in the time they've been in office. Labor called for the final treaty text of RCEP to be publicly released before the agreement was signed to allow it to be scrutinised by the public. But the Morrison government refused, in another example of their aversion to transparency. Labor has previously raised concerns over the Morrison government's refusal to commission independent economic modelling for the RCEP. This is nothing new from this all-talk, do-nothing government. At a time when calm and skilful diplomacy is needed to resolve our trade tensions with China, the Morrison government has given the member for Dawson, George Christensen, and many others in its ranks free reign to spout inflammatory comments and spread misinformation about China. Under Prime Minister Scott Morrison, Australia is more dependent than ever on China for our exports and jobs. In fact, we depend on the Chinese market more than any other country in the world. That is a result of this government's policies. And when trade diversification is of highest priority for this nation, Prime Minister Scott Morrison is putting at risk our trade agreement with the European Union due to his diplomatic ineptitude on the recent nuclear submarines decision. Labor knows that achieving genuine trade diversification will require a long-term whole-of-government commitment and a plan. Every portfolio in government should be thinking about what it can do to contribute to a national effort to diversify what we export and where we export goods and services to. In health and finance, for example, Australia has remarkable capability that it has already exported, uh, but more can be done. Australia has $1.3 trillion worth of funds under management through our superannuation system. We have developed an industry that is envied around the world, and economies like Japan are looking to Australia for funds management expertise. Similarly, in health, Australia is expert in providing health care into remote areas which could be replicated in the complex and challenging geography of Indonesia and its many islands. Labor is prepared to make that commitment and build that plan in conjunction with job-creating export industries. We would work with exporters to build relationships and secure the markets that Australian jobs depend on. Diversifying export markets is more than a photo op for a free trade signing ceremony. Under the Morrison-Joyce government, Labor knows that our relationships with our trading partners cannot be just set and forget. Signing a free, signing a free trade agreement is not the end of the story. In 2019, the Morrison government committed to a range of measures to secure Labor's support for the Indonesian Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, namely compelling J. Scott to review the way our country negotiates trade agreements. We are satisfied that the J. Scott tra treaty-making review has been completed and thank all members of the committee for their work in undertaking this process. We call on the government to implement the remainder of these commitments, in particular those related to worker exploitation, as a matter of urgency. Um, two other major issues that have been raised in connection you, with Senator this agreement, this uh, which my uh, time does not permit me going into. Concluded, you'll be in continuation. I should have given you that 10 seconds. Sorry. Um, my apologies. I should have looked at the clock. Um, we'll now proceed to two-minute statements. Senator Keneally. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak on behalf of Ali Sina Yusofi, age 19, from Mount Druitt in New South Wales, as part of the inaugural Youth Voice in Parliament Week. These are Ali's words. What is my vision for Australia in 20 years, was the question for this speech, but I want to ask those who will implement these changes, what kind of environment do you envision for your children in 20 years? It is hard to envision the future. Maybe I am uncreative, but I know it starts with you and I today. 
My name is Ali Sina Yusofi, and I am 19 years old. I study med medical science at UTS, and I am a resident in Mount Druitt, New South Wales. It is fascinating how advantageous it is to be an individual not from Afghanistan in terms of getting a visa faster. It's captivating to witness how long it takes a visa to be granted to someone from Afghanistan, but funny how little it takes for someone who is not. It's funny how I was thinking whether I wanted to address the long period it takes to finally be an Australian citizen and enjoy its advantage, or whether I wanted to be a voice for my community whose, whose families' lives are in danger, deprived from basic human rights, and to actually be granted those visas they've been waiting years for. I wish nothing but for the reconnection of families and loved ones. I kindly ask those in power who will have a family to go back home to every day, who will kiss their children goodnight every night, to allow my community here the same privilege of having a family to go home to. I am a voice of many, and I hope this little voice was heard. Thank you, Ali. Ali, thank you for your words today, and thank you for sharing them with this parliament. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Small. Thanks, Deputy President. And I rise today to bring the attention of the Senate to a significant anniversary in Australia's proud military history. The 19th of November marks the 80th anniversary of the tragic sinking of the HMAS Sydney off the West Australian coast in 1941, the largest single loss of life ever experienced by the Royal Australian Navy. Throughout the late 30s and in the early stages of World War II, the Sydney was primarily tasked with assisting the Royal Navy in the Mediterranean. In addition to protecting merchant vessels, delivering equipment and personnel, the Sydney was also engaged in direct combat against Axis forces and collected a myriad of combat distinctions. Leaving the Med, the Sydney returned home to Australia for a refit and to conduct operations in the Indo-Pacific region. On that fateful day in 1941, whilst on patrol just 200 kilometres to the west of Shark Bay, the Sydney discovered and engaged the German auxiliary cruiser Cormoran, disguised as the Dutch merchant vessel Strat Malacca. Sydney took significant damage during the battle, and both vessels were sunk at some point during the night. Of Sydney's total complement of 645 Australians, not a single one survived. In the years since Sydney's loss, conspiracy and debate surrounded her fate, and it was only in 2008 that her wreckage was discovered finally solving one of Australia's most enduring maritime mysteries. Today, the Dome of Souls in Geraldton, featuring 645 individual seagulls over a lone bronze woman staring out to sea in vain hope of Sydney's return, is all that reminds us of the brave men who served on the Sydney and who paid the ultimate price by giving their lives in defence of this great nation, lest we forget. Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. COVID is running rampant through the detainees in the Park Hotel prison in Melbourne. The latest government figures from 8.30am yesterday uh, show that 13 detainees in the Park Hotel prison had tested positive for COVID. Now, I understand, as of this afternoon, there are actually 19 positive cases including one in hospital and one who is so sick that an ambulance has been called. This is tragic, but it was eminently foreseeable and utterly predictable. And The Greens and many other people warned at the start of the pandemic that this would happen unless all low-risk detainees were released from the alternative places of detention, the Park <coughs> Hotel Prison, other hotel prisons, into appropriate accommodation in the community. A vaccine program for detainees in immigration detention only began rolling out two months ago. In Papua New Guinea, where there are still over 100 people who were exiled there eight and a half years ago, uh, the country is only 2 per cent fully vaccinated. Numerous of the people who Australia exiled there have contracted COVID. The country's health system is buckling under the strain, with Port Moresby's largest hospital saying it is teetering on collapse with wards at capacity and its morgue filled with bodies stacked on top of one another. The government was warned about this and has abjectly and once again 
failed these people. Eight and a half years of ongoing indefinite detention is an utter disgrace and one of the darkest and most shameful chapters in our country's story. For goodness sake, haven't these people suffered enough? Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Grogan. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, I rise today to talk about emissions reduction in agriculture. We know that the Liberals have been playing politics with the planet and holding back on climate action for years. But this week has been a reminder that there's a group in this place who are even worse, the nationals. The rest of the world is gunning for net zero and these guys are playing around the edges, blaming the regions. Morrison Joyce government has once again left Australia lagging behind. The nationals pretend that this is somehow a choice between saving the planet and protecting the livelihoods of Australians in rural and regional areas. That is a complete and utter fallacy. Action on climate change is good for jobs and it is good for our regions. The agriculture sector in rural and regional Australia is miles ahead of the Liberals and is light years ahead of the Nationals. Industry groups have already pledged to meet the target. Meat and Livestock Australia set an ambitious target for net zero emissions by 2030, and they did this in 2017. In, 19, in, 19, in 2020, the National Farmers Federation called for net zero by 2050, and that's well over a year ago. It was in August. In February 2021, grain growers called for a 2050 deadline and a grain-specific emissions reduction target by 2030. Their position is clear, and I quote, the grains industry has and will continue to adapt practices, systems and businesses to future-proof the sector, enabling farmers to operate sustainably and prosper in a changing climate. This is totally at odds with what the nationals have been telling us. They are saying that the regions are going to go to the dogs over any sort of climate action. This is rubbish. This is absolute fallacy. Some of the people who are working hardest on climate change are people in the regions. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Grogan. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Australians expect that our parliaments will protect us and that the treatments government select will keep us safe. The facts are that COVID injections have harmed over 61,700 Australians, caused 141 deaths, cases of deadly blood clots, and killed at least nine Australians, with another 556 deaths under review. Five, five, six. That's just the reported. Now the government has rushed to order $300 million worth of a yet-to-be-approved Mulnupiravir that research papers have shown can affect our DNA our reproductive system and mutate the virus into yet another deadly strain. This drug is a wide-spectrum antiviral that inhibits viral replication by a mechanism known, known as lethal mutagenesis. Despite the government's massive purchase, the biochemical and structural basis of how this process worked has remained largely unexplored. According to the US media, with 775 patients in the Merck study, that's the manufacturer, 7.3 per cent of patients given molnupiravir were either hospitalised or died nine days after treatment, compared to the 14.1 per cent of placebo patients who developed COVID and exhibited severe or fatal complications. Now, you heard that right. Merck trials appear to have allowed people to die to test their drug. The Merck research study was actually just a press release, a press release containing only an, only an interim analysis of the data. A press release is enough to get this drug approved by our Therapeutic Goods Administration. A $300 million purchase of an experimental drug is ticked and flicked, yet the novel Australian-developed vaccine for COVID, called Vaxine, has been denied approval by the TGA despite being approved overseas. The TGA is clearly favouring foreign pharmaceutical companies with dodgy products over an Australian company with a proven, safe, conventional vaccine. Our communities, our nation would like to know why. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Van. Thank you very much. I rise uh, as part of Youth Voice in Parliament Week, and I rise to give voice to Trish Kuraparan, a 17-year-old from Melbourne, who says, as a second-generation Sri Lankan-Australian woman, my vision for Australia in 20 years is a unified and uplifted nation in which every individual, regardless of age, colour, gender, faith, ability or sexuality, is equally visible and appreciated. A prominent issue within society today revolves around the lack of representation and opportunity for every individual. 
more specifically discrimination towards our first per peoples, people of different ethnic backgrounds and women. In order to progress as a country and create a nation that is innovative and dynamic, it is important to target this issue. We must appreciate the value in differences, particularly its ability to improve our sense of global awareness and develop a well-rounded and empathetic approach to national and international issues. This can be achieved by addressing young people, the hope of the future. It is necessary to understand the importance in creating a holistic education system that enables us to live meaningful and fulfilling lives. Not only are academics pursued, but a more globalised education encouraging critical thinking, cultural exploration, discussions surrounding respect and the ability to actively accept and form individual perspectives. A collective belief in equality would provide Australia with the courage to move away from discrimination and towards a united nation, well equipped to play our role in the world. We are one, but we are many. Let us work towards an Australia that proudly embodies our diversity. I thank Trish for her speech. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. In some states, this week is Gambling Harm Awareness Week. It is a week where people are encouraged to talk about the harms associated with gambling and the effects on communities, families, friends, workplaces and individuals. It should also be a week where we talk about the insidious link between political parties and the gambling industry. A recent ABC News investigation, which tracked gambling-related political payments dating back to 1998, showed that entities with a stake in gambling made at least $81.77 million in political donations over 22 years. Nearly half of this went to the ALP. More than a quarter went to the coalition. But the response to these revelations has been met with complete silence from both Labor and the coalition. It's their dirty little secret and neither will break ranks over it. The gambling industry is trying to buy influence and access to politicians, and over $80 million would buy a lot of influence in anybody's mind. I echo the calls by the Alliance for Gambling Reform that political parties must reject donations from the gambling industry. We must stop the flow of this dirty money to our political parties and to our candidates. It is money collected through the suffering and harm caused to so many Australians and their families. It's indefensible and it is unethical for candidates and political parties to continue to accept these donations when they come at such a high cost measured in broken lives. Gambling Harm Awareness Week should end with both the Labor and Liberal parties ending their own addiction to gambling. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Green. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy President. Well, yesterday was a fantastic day to be a regional Queenslander because yesterday we saw more investment into our manufacturing industry by the Palaszczuk government. Yesterday there was a $7 billion vote of confidence from the Queensland Labor government in our manufacturing sector in the community of Maryborough. The Queensland government has announced plans to build 65 trains in Maryborough, and this means thousands of jobs like welders and boil makers, fitters, electricians for Queenslanders, and it will supercharge our manufacturing industry. What a difference! What a difference to those sitting opposite, those in the Liberal National Party in Queensland who, when they were in government, sent trains overseas to be built. They turned their back on local manufacturers, on local tradies, on businesses, and made a mess of the, strain, of the state's train fleet. This fantastic announcement by the Queensland government just so happened to fall on the very day that four years ago the Australian, Australia manufactured its last car, when the last Holden rolled off the production line in Adelaide, because the Liberal National Government, the Treasurer at the time, Joe Hockey, dared Holden to leave. This serves as a reminder 
of what we've lost under the Liberal National Government when it comes to manufacturing. They don't value the industry and they don't value the workers in it. They certainly don't value the skills required in the industry. You only have to look at the government's own data to see their appalling record on skills. Across Queensland, we've lost thousands of apprentices. Well, Labor will re rebuild manufacturing in Queensland under an Anthony Albanese government. We'll rebuild skills and we will bring manufacturing back Thank home you, to Senator Queensland. Green, Senator McMahon. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise today to speak about the dire state of COVID vaccinations in the Northern Territory particularly remote Indigenous communities. In one community alone, only 9 per cent of people have received their first dose and 5 per cent their second dose. And there are numerous communities where the second dose is in single digits. Um, just last week, I spoke to an organisation that sent a medical team out to one of these remote communities. They took 400 doses, enough for every single person on that community, and they managed to vaccinate just 14, 14 people. And some of our general population statistics are the worst in the nation. For those aged 16 and over, we have just 71.68 per cent of people having had their first vaccination. For 70 and over, first dose is sitting at 86.4 per cent and second dose at 70.9 per cent. This is the worst in the country by a long way. The Northern Territory Government is not addressing this crisis in some of our most vulnerable people, being Indigenous communities and the aged. Instead of addressing the problem, the Northern Territory Government is mandating that nearly all workers be vaccinated or be fined $5,000 and lose their jobs. Have we really come to a society where in order to have a job, put food on the table, and a roof over your family's head, you must undertake a medical procedure against your will. And this is doing nothing to address the real crisis out there on communities. Instead, it is driving workers who don't want to be vaccinated for whatever reason, and I disagree with that, but it is driving them to the unemployment queue or out of the Northern Thank Territory. You, Senator McMahon, your time has expired. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy, Deputy President. I rise to give voice uh, to another uh, young South Australian as part of Youth Voice in Parliament Week. My name is Lachlan McPherson. I'm 13 years old and my electorate is Spence. My vision for Australia in 20 years is that, is that there will be more environmentally safe transports. I have heard of a train that is being built for the environment, but I haven't seen or heard any plans to build more environmental transports. I think we should create much more cheaper energy source cars so more people can buy them and start to create buses that don't use gas. We produce 80 per cent smog air pollution by using gas cars. If we continue using gas cars in transport, we will increase the risk of asthma, heart or lung disease and some cancers. If we want to decrease the risk of getting disease, we should start making environmental transports. If we make a change to the transport, we will be able to have a healthier earth, but if we don't make a change, our earth could get worse every month or even year. So wake up and make a change to use these transports. Madam Acting Deputy President, if 13-year-old Lachlan can see it, I don't understand why the Prime Minister can't see it. The Prime Minister is worried about ruining his, uh, his, uh, his weekend with the electric vehicles. Lachlan's worried about his future being ruined by internal combustion engine cars. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Chisholm. I wanted to give Queenslanders an update on inland rail. There's been much talk by the government of late, but as is always the case with this government, you really can't believe any of it. Minister Joyce has blustered into his new portfolio, and it's clear he made big promises to some of his colleagues to get the leadership back. But as usual with Mr Joyce, he talks big, but the delivery is always lacking, as is the case with this government. The first group to be let down by Mr Joyce are those farmers and community impacted by inland rail in the route from the border to Gowrie. 
There's been multiple media reports indicating that they were abandoned by Mr Joyce days after he took back the leadership. Now Mr Joyce is claiming to be a champion of the inland rail going to Gladstone. But it was just two months ago when the LNP government in this place opposed a recommendation from the Senate inquiry asking for Gladstone option to be considered. Now after eight years in government, three previous National Party leaders dismissing Gladstone, including the first incarnation of Mr Joyce. We've seen cost blowouts and mismanagement. We've seen them ignoring the concerns of local residents along the route. They are now saying they propose a business case to assess Gladstone. You just can't believe the LNP when it comes to inland rail. So what has changed? There's been the great work of local mayors like Matt Burnett in Gladstone and Nev Ferrier in Banana. There's been an advocacy group set up by Mr Abbott and others in Gladstone to advocate for this to, to be the case. And then there's been the pressure from Labor as well, led by Senator Stirl as part of the committee and some of the work the Labor senators have been doing in Queensland. The LNP record on inland rail is diabolical. Eight years of cost blowouts, eight years of ignoring the community, eight years of failure. You just can't believe the LNP when it comes to inland rail. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Deputy President. I'm enthusiastically supporting um, the inaugural Youth Voice in Parliament Week and have the privilege of reading one of the more than 600 speeches submitted to us by young people. So here goes. My name is Jihansa Dahanaika. I am 13 years old. I live in Meadowbank Ride, New South Wales, in the Benelong electorate. What do I want Australia to look like in 20 years? In 20 years, I want kids' faces to light up as they see dolls in ranges of skin colours and find one that looks exactly like them. In 20 years, I hope that kids can have band-aids that match their skin tone. In 20 years, I hope that racially diverse characters in TV shows, movies and media are shown in a better light and are shown often. In 20 years, I hope the job opportunities and pay are equal for everyone, no matter what skin color, religious background or identification. In 20 years, I hope Australia is an equal place, starting with band-aids and dolls. Though it may seem little, this is important. Knowing what it means to be accepted means that children are, can recognize racial discrimination as they grow up. They will understand racism is not right and they will learn to educate others standing up against it. This is the key to a kinder Australia. A kinder Australia is the start to a kinder world. I hope in 20 years, my hope in 20 years is that the differences we have shouldn't be masked but celebrated. Thank you, Jihansa, for your vision for an anti-racist world that is kinder to all of us. It is inspiring to see young people telling it like it is. You are demanding and taking action for a better world. I'm ready to support your revolution. It's the least that I can do. Senator O'Sullivan. If you ask most Western Australians what life is like in WA right now, most would say that they're living their best lives. There are no local restrictions, no venue limits, no regional travel limits, no masks required anywhere. The only thing you can't do is travel in and out of the state to New South Wales, Victoria, the ACT or overseas. Frankly, based upon the recent reporting in the West newspapers, the vast majority of people seem to have expressed that the closed borders have very little impact on them. Therefore, the lure of holidays by way of an aeroplane to some distant location is not the overwhelming thing occupying the minds of most Western Australians. This being said, I draw Western Australians' attention to the fact that the Premier has not ruled out lockdowns occurring in WA if there is an outbreak after we reach the 80 per cent fully dosed vaccination level. The implication of this is that should we get an outbreak of COVID, which is entirely possible before Christmas, then your Christmas lunch, your hard-earned Bustleton, Albany, Durian Bay or Esperance holiday plans could be cancelled. Instead of motivating Western Australians to go and get vaccinated by way of an incentive, the WA Premier is resorting to fear and threats. Yesterday, the Premier announced that 75 per cent of the workforce will face up to a $20,000 fine if they turn up to work without being vaccinated. This is outrageous and a massive admission of failure. Freedom and personal choice and privacy, they're big values. Why is it so easy for Labor to trample all over them? Stick to the plan, Premier. This all-stick and no-carrot approach is wrong. 
please, please, we know that we will reach 80 per cent by mid-December. Commit to Western Australians that their Christmas plans will be secure if we get there. Stop with the politics of fear and give us something to aim for. Set the date. I have faith in Western Australians, Premier. Why have you lost yours? Senator Pratt. A Labor government is committed to properly funding working women's centres in every state and territory. These centres provide free, confidential assistance about workplace matters, free legal advice about sexual harass harassment, wage theft and discrimination, all problems for women in many workplaces, an essential advice service for all women in our community. But what has this government done to support working women's centres? They have almost entirely slashed their funding. A complete disregard from this government has been shown to these essential services that provide support and justice for working women. Each of the working women's centres in South Australia and the Northern Territory and Queensland needs a budget of some $700,000 a year to run, but this government has, in its recent budget, set aside only $200,000. This leaves only South Australia as a service with secure funding. The Northern Territory is looking at closing, and Queensland is entirely reliant upon funding from the Palaszczuk Labor government. This government only cares about themselves, not about working women. They gave a limp and inadequate response to the sex discrimination report from Kate Jenkins, Respect at Work. The Prime Minister has failed to listen to survivors of sexual harassment. He refused an independent inquiry into allegations around Minister Porter. He had to wait for his wife to urge him to take any action on the sexual harassment issue at all. And now this government is cutting funding to critical frontline services that ensure women are able to navigate the handling of sexual harassment at work. Only Labor will properly fund Australia's working women centres and thank properly you, protect Pratt, working women in our nation. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you very much, Dep uh, Deputy President. Well, like millions of Australians, I've been watching the Netflix series Squid Game. For those who aren't familiar, it shows that Korean workers compete in a series of lethal games for an opportunity to pay off their debts. It's a world where workers live and die under the boot of the rich and powerful. While watching Squid Game, I was reminded of Senator Stoker, because, who was previously in this place accused 2,000 Qantas workers, whose jobs were illegally outsourced, of being inflexible and unreasonable. In Senator Stoker's Squid Game, workers should be forced into any work arrangements of ro or rates of pay, regardless of how unfair. And if they don't bow down and comply, they should be turfed out onto the street. Now, I'm not sure if Senator Stoker has been watching Squid Game, but it would appear that the makers of Squid Game have been watching her attitude towards Australian workers very closely. Now, I hope they've credited Senator Stoker as a source of inspiration in the production court credits into the future. A few months ago, the federal court ruled that Qantas had broken the law when they outsourced those jobs. I haven't heard an apology from Senator Stoker. Now, Safe Work are launching criminal proceedings against Qantas for standing down Theo, a health and safety representative, for raising COVID-19 safety concerns. I'm sure Senator Stoker will be issuing another passionate defence of Alan Joyce very soon. Oh, sorry, Senator Smith. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. West Australians need to do much more, much more, if we're going to unlock ourselves from tight border restrictions. To this afternoon, I'm asking West Australians to go out and get vaccinated. Go out and get vaccinated. It's disappointing that West Australians have very, very low levels of vaccination rates at the moment. Just 74.3 per cent of people have had their first dose, just 57 Order. per cent of people have had their second dose. In the short time that's available to me, Senator I'm encouraging Smith, West Australians to get the jab. Resume your chair, and I'm sure we all echo those thoughts. Um, just before we start question time, or in starting question time, I did want to address a matter that uh, arose yesterday. Uh, I undertook to review the Hansard in relation to a point of order raised by Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senator Wong, and come back to the Senate. 
In looking at this matter, I have also taken the opportunity to review the rulings and commentary of my predecessor on glancing references and comments made by ministers to other parties and their policies. For instance, on 10 December 2020, President Ryan said, I have ruled previously that a glancing phrase in an answer is not going to make someone not directly relevant. An answer that consisted of attacking the opposition or outlining their policy would not be directly relevant. On 4 February this year, he said, the question contained a number of loaded political phrases. The minister was, I would imagine, making a glancing observation as, and is entitled to some wide latitude to address the terms, assertions and imputations in the question. In other words, there is wider latitude for political response to politically loaded questions. This is consistent with the ruling of earlier presidents. On this basis, I do not think it was unreasonable to allow the minister to begin her answer the way she did. However, having reviewed the Hansard, I allowed the Leader of the Opposition uh, to bring the minister back to the question. That is something I should have done myself. We'll now go to questions. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can I thank you for that statement uh, at the outset? My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Four years ago, Mr Morrison brought a lump of coal into the federal parliament, and in 2019 he claimed emissions reduction targets would wreck the economy. When did he change his mind? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Wong for the question, albeit I don't accept the, uh, the premise of all aspects of, uh, of that question, uh, Mr President. Uh, indeed, the government went uh, to the last election, as we have the previous elections, with commitments to emissions reductions targets. They weren't the same commitments as those opposite, that's true, just as we didn't have the same policies as those opposite. Uh, but we certainly went to the election with emissions reduction targets. And indeed, despite the fact that those opposite and others have always claimed that when we have outlined coalition policies to achieve those targets, they've always said it will fail, the targets won't be met, the government's policies won't achieve it. And guess what's happened on every single occasion? Of course, we've actually exceeded the targets. The policies have worked. The policies have delivered the emissions reductions targets. And that is what we continue to do, Mr President. It's what we continue to do in terms of delivering and achieving the 2030 emissions reductions targets, which we took to the last election, Mr President. Contrary to what Senator Wong said, the debate at the last election was about whether or not the Labor Party, with an increased target, had a plan, had a policy, had it costed, had any idea of how they were going to achieve it. The coalition had outlined how we were going to achieve our targets, and I'm very pleased to say we're on track to meet those targets. Oh, we're on no. track to exceed those targets. And in doing so, it helps to ensure that on a per person basis, Australia's reduction of emissions is indeed amongst some of the biggest in the world. On a per person basis, we're achieving close to a 50 per cent reduction in emissions. But even on an absolute basis in terms of the rate of emissions reductions, we are achieving faster rates of emissions reductions than Canada or Japan or New Zealand or the United States. I don't say that to criticise those nations, it's just a statement of what is occurring and a demonstration that despite the fact those opposite like to try to talk Australia down, like to try to be negative in some ways in relation to our achievements, our emissions Minister, are trending down Minister, and we continue to deliver policies to achieve that. Has expired. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Morrison has said electric vehicles would end the weekend, oh, yeah. and suggested that batteries to store renewable energy were as useful as a big banana. When did he decide he was wrong? Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, once again, we get the uh, the selective quoting, the misrepresentation from uh, from those opposite. Mr. Morrison talking about Labor policies to mandate Labor policies. Senator Wong wants to, you know, wants to go and ask questions that are about comments made by the Prime Minister in relation to Labor policies obviously opens up scrutiny of Labor policies. Now, the Labor policies taken to the last election were about trying to mandate outcomes and to mandate outcomes that would have different impacts. Now, of course, technology moves on, time moves on, and as technology and time move on, we want to make sure that Australia is able to embrace the opportunities of the future able to lead where we can in terms of the opportunities of the future. We're doing that through our investment in technology, not the type of taxes the Labor Party have proposed previously. Our investment is in making sure Australia can embrace the technologies that suit 
our nation, give our regions the Order. advantages to secure jobs and opportunities in the future while lowering Minister, emissions. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Wong, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Mr Morrison and Mr Joyce have railed against climate action for over a decade. The Nationals are holding Mr Morrison to ransom, and Mr Morrison refu has refusing to take net zero by 2050 to the coalition party room. How can Australians possibly believe Mr Morrison's last-minute scramble to land a political deal on net zero by 2050, under two weeks out from, uh, from Glasgow, is real? Minister. Well, Mr President, Australians should absolutely have confidence that our government will deliver the policies we implement and that those policies will work for the future Order. on meeting the commitments Australia makes, because that's what we've done. That's Order what we've done left. time and time again. That's what we've done time and time again, Mr President. That when we said Order. we would achieve Australia's emission reductions targets, and here were the policy profiles that we would do so, whilst abolishing Labor's carbon tax, we got on, we implemented those policies, and we've achieved those targets. And we've exceeded those targets. And that's what we're going to continue to do. That's why Australians should have faith. They can look at our track record. In fact, they should have the faith that our side of politics will achieve that without the types of policies those opposite have been known to embrace that drive up costs of electricity, that drive up costs for Australian businesses, that hurt Australian families, that risk Australian jobs. That's what Australians should fear in terms of the policies of those opposite, because they've shown a track record with those sorts of policies. We've shown a track record of being Minister, able to lower emissions, time, lower power Minister, prices, but the increase the strength the of the Australian has economy. Expired. Senator Chan order on my left. Senator Chandler, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister provide an update on how Australia's vaccination rollout is progressing, particularly in our home state of Tasmania, and how the national plan is working to secure our COVID recovery so we can safely reopen and live with the virus? Minister representing the Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and uh, thank you, Senator Chandler, for your question. Uh, Mr President, yes, our home state certainly has something to celebrate by passing the first national plan milestone of 70 per cent double dose uh, in the last day. It's important, an important milestone, Mr President, uh, and of course the nation has also passed 70 per cent, Mr President, of vaccination post-16. Mr President, our nation continues to hurt, surge ahead, rolling up our sleeves with a total of 33,489,485 doses Senator administered nationally as of last night, Mr President. 14.6 million Australians are now fully vaccinated, Mr President. That's 70.8 per cent of those over 16, 81.6 per cent of those over 50, and 86.6 per cent, Mr President, of those over 70. We know that the people over 70 are the most vulnerable cohort when it comes to COVID-19, Mr President, and we now have over 95 per cent of that population who have had at least one dose. Mr President, can I congratulate, Senator Ayers, Senator can I congratulate and commend Senator those who have been instrumental in us achieving those targets so far? Our health care workers, our doctors, our pharmacists, our nurses, those in the state clinics who have all Order worked so hard, Mr. Left. President, in over 9,200 uh, vaccine outlets around the country. Uh, thank you for your work. Uh, we obviously need you to do Mr. more, Mr. President. Our national plan, agreed by national cabinet, is progressing just as we said it would. And yesterday, we reached the commencement of phase B, where we can start looking at lower restrictions and our country Order. opening up once again. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister what ha uh, outline what happens now that we have reached phase B of the rollout? Minister. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't need to be a psychic, Senator. What we've actually reached phase B of the rollout, uh, Mr. President. 
uh, we will start to see the country opening up, as we are in New South Wales and Victoria uh, and here in the ACT, Mr President. Oh, uh, as the Prime Minister said in an, op an opinion piece that ran in Tasmania today, Senator each Rand. and every vaccination Mr. President, brings us closer to bring our country back together again. And I join with Senator Smith in his urging of Western Australians to roll their sleeves up Senator and Keneally. get the vaccine, Mr. President, so we can join Western Australians in having a free country. Families and friends can get together, Mr. President. Businesses can get going again, Mr. President. Importantly, our small businesses can get back to work, firing up jobs. There can be a safe easing of border restrictions as the vaccination rates continue to surge Order. across Australia, Mr. President, and we can all start to take our lives back. Senator Chandler, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the minister for his response. Can the minister advise what preparations the government has made for the rollout of a booster program? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. The, a, a booster program will give us a boost in protection to those who are fully vaccinated with their second dose, Mr. President. Of course, that's 70% of the Australian population. At the moment, the plan is being progressed through the Australian Technical Advisory Group on uh, Immigration, ATAGI, and we expect Order. advice will be provided to the Health Minister in the Senator not Keneally. too distant future. Mr. President. The government has been preparing for boosters Senator and secured 151 million doses for 22 and 23 to ensure all Australians can access a booster if it is recommended by the medical experts. Maintaining high levels of vaccination in our community will ensure we are protecting everyone, particularly those who are most vulnerable to COVID-19, including those, of course, in our loved ones in aged care. Mr. President, we will be building on the strong foundation that we have already established through the vaccine rollout. Minister, thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Sheldon. Well, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister and Leader of the National, Senator McKenzie. I refer to the National Subcommittee consisting of Senator McKenzie, Mr Littleproud, Little Mr Pitt and Mr Hogan, settling the National's election wish list for Mr Morrison in return for support of net zero by 2050. How much taxpayer money have the Nationals demanded Mr Morrison spend to gain their support for net zero by 2050? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Sheldon, for your question. Well, as we've been very, very clear as the second party of government, we are taking our time to carefully consider the proposition put forward by the Prime Minister uh, that Australia will be committing to net zero by 2050 Order, Senator Watt. in Glasgow. That is actually what rural and regional Australians sent us here to do, and we don't apologise for that. Now, I know, as Doug Cameron and I was privileged to serve with Doug Cameron uh, in this chamber for many years, made note of how your party processes operate, and that you are, you'd all had lobotomies, and you basically just do what your leader says, and you're a bunch of zombies, as I recall, direct quote in uh, rabbities. Senate in Minister, our political Minister, party— Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Watt, on a point on, of order. On, re on relevance, in light of your ruling, this question was very straight about the amount of money that, ta that uh, the nationals have demanded. Uh, the minister is veering off into exactly the kind of political attack that you said was not permitted. Uh, uh, I, 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 there, were, there were two parts of, of um, my uh, presentation to the Senate, Senator Watt. I think you've uh, selectively quoted one of them, but uh, I will uh, bring the minister back to the question. Uh, I, um, I, uh, you have the call, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much. And so the process that our political party has determined to undertake is to consult our colleagues to understand and appreciate their needs and concerns for the next 30 years, not for the next six months towards the election, and to then uh, put forward a document that Order. is based on the principles that will underpin the negotiations between the Deputy Prime Minister and the Prime Minister. 
We've been very, very clear. This is not about 10, 30 pieces of silver. This is not about um, some beads and some mirrors. This is actually about how do we secure and protect rural and regional Australians and our industries in a decarbonised future. That is about doing our job. And so I'm very proud to be part of a political party and part of a subcommittee that is actually focused on securing the regions in this proposed uh, future that the, the Prime Minister and the government is seeking to um, deliver. Now, if that actually can't Minister, come... Minister, your time has expired. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. Have any Liberal members requested that the Nationals include particular items in their pre-election wish list to Mr Morrison? Minister. Well, I think um, we're always happy to talk to our Liberal colleagues about how the National Party can help them deliver on their needs and interests for their, for their communities. I mean, at the end of the day, we've been sent here to do one thing, and that is to stand up for our communities, and that is exactly what we're doing. So, Senator you know, well, if, well, Senator Canavan, Senator Canavan, that uh, interjection wasn't was relevant, and so I'll take it. The issue was that what, who I haven't received submissions from is the Labor Party members for rural and regional Minister, Australia, please, how we Minister, can actually assist Minister, them and assist their Minister, foresters. please resume your seat. Senator Watt, on a point of order. Again on relevance, Mr President, a very straight question, no hyperbole. Have any Liberal members requested that the Nationals include particular items on the list they're providing to Mr Morrison? No hyperbole. It's a, a straight question. Senator Watt, I've allowed you to restate the question. Minister, you have the call. Uh, thank you very much. You know, there are a lot of uh, Liberal Party colleagues that are, have been concerned about what uh, a move towards uh, net zero by 2050 may mean for rural and regional communities. Order. Now they've made those. You've quoted those back to me in the chamber this week. It should not be a surprise to you, at Minister, all. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Sheldon, a second supplementary question. Will the minister guarantee the full details of any nationals' agreement to support net zero by 2050 will be made public? Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. What I will guarantee you, I, I won't be guaranteeing you, uh, Senator Sheldon, to disclose what the National Party party room discusses. But what I will be able to guarantee you is that our party will never resile from Order, standing up Senator for the people Ed. that sent us here. And it is very, very sad to watch the party that used to stand Senator up Gallagher. for the working class in this country fall over Senator Ayres. in the face of the threat of the Greens in your inner city urban seats and member after member. And other than Raf, uh, Senator Ciccone from Victoria, you are silent on water policy. You are silent on forestry and standing up for forestry workers. You are silent on food processes uh, and food manufacturing. You know what? What a joke you've become to the people that actually you were set up in Bolcolden, out in regional Queensland. And Minister, you, uh, your time has expired. Senator Rice. Thanks, President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services. Minister, this week is anti-poverty week. Yesterday, former New South Wales Liberal Minister Prue Goward was condemned by anti-poverty organisations and advocates as being disturbing, abusive and inaccurate for saying out loud how Liberals like her view people trapped in poverty as huge cost centres, as an underclass of Australians who are neglectful parents and almost entirely lacking in discipline. Minister, as another Liberal minister, Will you join me in condemning her appalling statements and abuse of some of the most vulnerable people in our community? Just, be just before I call the minister, interjections are always disorderly, but particularly during the asking of questions. If you uh, want everyone in the chamber, particularly me, to hear the question, then I do need some silence. 
Uh, the Minister for Families and Social Services, uh, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and um, I thank Senator Rice for her question. Um, in the absence of actually having um, seen the comments to which Senator Rice refers, um, I won't make any specific comment about that. But what I will say is that I take my responsibility as a Minister for Families and Social Services extremely seriously, and the absolute total focus of the activities of my office and my department are making sure that we support the most vulnerable people in Australia. Unquestionably, that is our single purpose and role. Now, whether that be through providing um, them with, uh, with payments, um, whether supporting them in, in working age payments or whether that be um, through um, some of their uh, pension. Oh, sorry, Senator Rice. Relevant, even if the minister hasn't seen the questions, I said what they were, and I asked, just asking her and condemning them. The, of the people trapped in poverty are huge cost centres as an underclass of Australians with neglectful Senator, parents Senator Rice, and Senator almost Rice, entirely lacking Senator in discipline. Rice, I've given you the chance to repeat part of the question. I cannot direct the minister how to answer the question. Minister, you have the call for a minute and 15 seconds. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I reiterate my initial comments. But um, you know, I am not going to make a comment about something that you are saying, um, uh, but I will absolutely guarantee to this chamber unequivocally that my absolute focus is making sure that the resources of my department and the resources that are provided by the taxpayers of Australia uh, to support vulnerable Australians, to make sure that we support them when they, are, uh, when they find themselves in situations, whether it be unemployed, whether it be when they're victims of domestic violence, um, you know, whether it be supporting the states and territories in their frontline service provision in the case of child protection and the like. I mean, absolute focus of my department is always to support the most vulnerable people in Order. our community. Um, and that is why we have always been so tremendously focused not only on creating jobs but actually working with Australians to get them, uh, to get them out of unemployment. Because you, know, you refer to Poverty Week, um, Senator Rice, and you know, one of the key things that has come out of many of the reports, some Order, this week Senator and Paul. others that have, uh, have been released around this particular issue, is that we know that people who are on unemployment benefits do it way tougher than those people who have got a job, and that's why we spoke Minister, on getting them Minister, into work. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Rice, order. Senator Rice, please resume your seat. I, I, I just asked for order in the chamber while questions were being asked. Senator Rice. Thanks, President. Minister, poverty is a political choice. Last year, your government increased income support during the lockdowns, but this year hundreds of thousands of people have lived, lived through lockdowns on payments below the poverty line, going without food, without medicines and at risk of homelessness. And the removal of COVID disaster payments means thousands more people are now joining them. Minister, do you agree that the job seeker rate of $44 a day is not enough to live on? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, um, Senator no, no government um, has done more to walk side by side to support Australians through this COVID pandemic. Um, we have supported Australians, whether it be um, through uh, increases in the, in the job seeker payment last year, whether it be through the, the, uh, the, um, the COVID disaster payment that was administered through uh, Senator, Senator McKenzie's um, department to support those people in Australia who found themselves in lockdowns of recent times, whether it be the business supports that have been put in place. But we also understand that as a government we have a responsibility to maintain the sustainability of payments that are made. We have to make sure that we support people in a safety net. Apologies, Senator Rice. In Mr. President, point of order. The question was whether uh, the minister agreed that the job seeker uh, rate of forty-four dollars a day is not enough to live on. Relevance, relevance. She is not going to the the relevance of the question. Is forty-four dollars Sen a Senator day Rice. enough to live Senator on? Senator Rice, you have had another opportunity to restate part of the question. It was a very broad question. The minister was being directly relevant, Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And as I was saying, the, the obligation of governments is to make sure that these sorts of payments are sustainable into the future. We have to balance supporting people when they find themselves out of work, but also making sure that the incentive is there for them to go to work. That's why we create jobs, and that's why we are the government. 
Senator Rice, a second supplementary question. Minister, I've heard from many constituents who inadvertently received both job seeker and job keeper, and they're now being pursued for those debts. Minister, why are you going after people on income support, but not taking on the big corporations that profited with billions of dollars on JobKeeper? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, firstly, I would say um, that you know, we need to be very clear around the fact that um, any fraudulent activity in relation to any payments that are received, no matter who they're received by, whether they be by businesses or individuals, um, are always pursued by government because it is our obligation in this, as the custodians of taxpayers' funds to make sure that, uh, that people who have received something that they are not entitled, uh, that, that we pursue that. Um, I would also say um, that Order. we— um, that in, in making sure that we, uh, when we put these things in place, we were very, very clear uh, to make sure that people understood that if they were receiving JobKeeper, um, that they were required to uh, declare it as income. There is, I mean, if you go onto our website, that was very, very clear um, that you would that that was earnings, and you had to declare those earnings. But to your point, Senator Rice, we will pursue anybody who has received taxpayer funding when they have not been entitled Minister, to Minister, time for the answer has expired. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. And my, pre my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Defence. The 2009 Defence White Paper foreshadowed increased tension in the region and announced the need to increase our submarine force from six to 12 submarines. The RAN was supposed to have 12 new submarines by 2039. Now that the smoke has dissipated, now that the mirrors have been removed, it is clear that under the new plan in 2039 we will instead have only five ageing Collins-class submarines. In October last year, the then DFAT Secretary, Secretary Her Excellency Francis Addison, advised that the China-Taiwan situation concerned her more than any time in the last three and a half decades of her career. Why has the government left us so vulnerable with so few submarines under these circumstances? The Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. I thank Senator Patrick uh, for his question. And, uh, in acknowledging the number of points that uh, the Senator made, I would note firstly uh, that the government has clearly stated the fact is that Australia's st strategic environment uh, has deteriorated in ways that weren't anticipated even five years ago. Uh, we know that the Indo-Pacific uh, is now the global epicentre of strategic competition, and that's why the AUKUS agreement uh, between Australia, uh, the United Kingdom and the United States uh, is so important and so necessary. In terms of capability itself, we are delivering as a government on, the, on our commitment to deliver to our service women and men the equipment they need to keep us safe. And I can confirm in that context that defence spending under this government will rise above 2 per cent of GDP in the coming financial year. There are a number of additional capabilities in which we are investing, Senator Patrick, along with those uh, already planned that will address the potential security challenges uh, in the coming decades. We are extending the life of all six of our Collins-class submarines. All six submarines will undergo life of type extension within the budget of $4.3 to $6.4 billion, extending the life of each submarine by 10 years. We're also investi investing in advanced long-range strike capabilities, including Tomahawk's cruise missiles, long-range anti-ship missiles and joint air-to-surface standoff missiles. The Tomahawk cruise missiles will be fielded on our Hobart-class destroyers. They're going to enable our maritime assets to strike land targets at greater distance with better precision. The long-range anti-ship missiles for our F-18 Super Hornets can strike land and maritime targets. The JSAMs for our FA-18, 18F Super Hornets and in our future F-35s as well. We're enhancing our capabilities in offensive cyber, in hypersonic systems, in autonomous systems, in space capabilities. And we are confident, as I said at the beginning of your question, that these will address the potential Minister, security challenges the in the coming decades as we move to the new submarine acquisition. Expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. So, great attention, fewer submarines. Last week, uh, Admiral Noonan conceded that by 2040, uh, further extending the life of the Collins boats will leave them, and I quote, 
at far greater risk of detection. Will the government purchase off-the-shelf submarines to be built in Adelaide to serve as the Navy's Super Hornet interim solution uh, to the F-35? Minister. That's a fascinating metaphor, an underwater Super Hornet F-35. Um, uh, thank you, Senator Patrick, uh, for, your, uh, for your question. And I think I understand the point that, uh, that you are raising, but uh, with your experience, I would think you would appreciate how inefficient it might be for the Royal Australian Navy to try to operate three different classes of submarines simultaneously that require different basing, different crewing, different sustainment. Uh, so the Collins-class submarine life of type extension remains an essential element of the government's plan to maintain a potent and agile submarine capability for Australia. It has a core work package that includes updates and upgrades to diesel engines, to the main motor to, and power conversion equipment. Both defence and industry are continuing to progress Collins-class submarine life of type extension work on schedule to support the first boat that will need an extension, that's HMAS Farncombe, as you know, commencing in mid-2026. Uh, An ASC will lead the life of type extension design and implementation activities. Minister, Minister the time for the answer has so expired. Senator. Senator Patrick, you have a second supplementary? I do. Um, um, we have a submarine minister. We have a submarine construction workforce in, in disarray after the cancellation of the attack submarine program. The, the nuclear submarine uh, built in Adelaide for delivery in 2040, by simple calculation, will commence construction in the mid 2030s. We don't have a workforce valley of death; rather, we have a Grand Canyon. What will the government be doing to fill this Grand Canyon? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I absolutely disagree with the proposition that, uh, that Senator Patrick puts um, in relation to that. We are absolutely committed to ensuring that critical skills are retained in the shipbuilding sector uh, in Australia. Order in fact, our commitment to continuous left. naval shipbuilding will support at least 15,000 Australian jobs by the end of the decade, and over 5,000 of those will be in South Australia. We know that the Osborne Naval Shipyard in South Australia is one of two principal shipyards. We know Osborne is hosting the construction construction of nine Hunter-class frigates, plus major upgrades to the uh, Navy's three AWDs and full-cycle docking of six Collins-class submarines. The Morrison government, frankly, has delivered on our commitment to provide, as I said, our service women and men with the vital equipment they need to keep us safe in the budget. And what we are doing is being committed to finding a role for every skilled shipbuilding worker impacted by the attack class decision. We'll pa partner with ASC to manage and implement the new sovereign shipbuilding talent pool as well, which will Minister, redeploy the existing shipbuilding the workforce throughout current and new shipbuilding programs. Has expired. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Attorney General, Senator Cash. Can the Order. Minister update the Senate on how Australia's national security remains under the real threat of foreign interference and espionage? The Minister, uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Oh, sorry, I missed the Attorney General. Sorry, Attorney General. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, I thank Senator Betts for the question. And I acknowledge his uh, long, long, long interest in national security uh, matters in Australia. And, Mr. President, whilst the government has been focused on tackling the threat of COVID-19, we have never, ever lost sight of the many challenges to our safety and security that exist in what we know is a rapidly changing security environment. As Australians would be aware, the threat environment it constantly evolves. And in fact, it may come as a surprise to most Australians to know that the levels of espionage and foreign interference are higher now than during the Cold War. We know that there are foreign agents working with intent to damage our society. They want to undermine our security and they want to interfere with the work of governments and ultimately with the work of our country. In their recent annual report, ASIO Director General Mike Burgess said that espionage could well rival terrorism as a threat to our interests and to our safety. And of course, as members of parliament, it is incredibly important for us to remind ourselves that we can also be targets for foreign interference and espionage, and especially those who aspire to be ministers in any government. As the Director-General Mike Burgess said, 
Foreign spies are attempting to obtain classified information about Australia's trade relationships, defence and intelligence capabilities. They are seeking to develop targeted relationships with current and former politicians and current and former security clearance holders. We should always be careful, Mr President, of underplaying the danger of being cavalier about the intentions of these types of people, of these characters and actors, should our paths cross with them as we go about our duties. As members of parliament, we must always remain ever vigilant to the threats posed by espionage and foreign interference. Minister, the time has expired. Senator Betts, a supplementary question. I thank the attorney for her answer, albeit a very concerning answer. Can I ask how is the government responding to the changing nature of foreign interference and how do nefarious actors now work against our nation's interests? Attorney General. Thank you, Mr President. Well, we know from our intelligence and our security agencies that foreign interference it is changing and unfortunately it is expanding, especially with the ubiquity of digital technology now right across the globe. We know in particular that some communities are targeted by foreign actors in an attempt to recruit and even unknowingly push foreign nations' interests in and around Australia. And that is why, as a government, we have strengthened Australia's capacity to defend against foreign interference with legislative tools. These key pieces of legislation they are helping our intelligence and our law enforcement agencies continue to have the legislative framework and the tools that they need to appropriately deal with and disrupt these actors. We will continue to make any changes necessary to ensure that, as a nation, we can respond to changing threats from foreign actors and protect Australia's interests. Senator Betts, a second supplementary question. Can the minister also update the Senate on how the government continues to support our vital intelligence and security agencies to target and disrupt foreign interference and protect our country's interests? Attorney General. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And, uh, our government has invested over $145 million since 2018-19 to bolster our response to foreign interference in Australia. Mr President, in the 2021-22 budget, we allocated the largest long-term investment in ASIO to address the complex and dynamic national security environment with $1.3 billion over the next decade. We have also passed legislation that will ensure that the Foreign Minister, on the advice of our security agencies, can veto agreements with foreign countries struck by state and local governments, as well as with universe, as universities. This legislation will ensure that any deal with a foreign country is in accordance with Australia's national interest. Mr President, as I've said, we know that foreign actors are now using cyber tactics to further interfere with Australia's interests, and that's why we've made a huge investment with the Australian Signals Directorate. Senator Grogan. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Mr Morrison's original transition plan, which was based on an outbreak of only 30 cases, estimates that 12,000 people will end up in hospital, including more than 2,700 in ICU, with over 1,400 dying. We have since seen more than 1,000 cases a day across the country. How many hospitalisations, ICU admissions and deaths does the Morrison Joyce government now expect as states begin to open up? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. Question, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator Grogan, for a question. First question, uh, Mr. President. The national plan uh, is designed to provide protection and provide advice to governments, state, territory, and Commonwealth uh, as to the parameters. We can, uh, with which we can start to reopen the national economy, Mr. President. And so, once we reached 70% uh, of the, uh, the population fully vaccinated, which we have now, we can start to take some measures. And you've seen those things commencing uh, in the states and territories, Mr. President. Of course, uh, the whole purpose of the national plan is to minimise the number of infections of the virus, Mr. President, and also uh, subsequent to that 
hospitalisations and presentations at ICUs and, of course, to minimise the number of people who pass away. So the whole objective is to minimise those numbers, Mr President. Uh, that's the point of the plan, and that's why we continue to encourage Australians to access vaccines. Uh, we've reached 70 per cent of the population Order. over 16 who are vaccinated. We encourage more Australians in every walk of life, in every state and territory, to go out and access the vaccine so that we can continue to do that, Mr. President, because the whole purpose of the exercise is to minimise the number of cases that we have in the community, uh, and that, of course, minimises the number of, uh, of Australians who may be hospitalised, Mr. President, or minimises the number of people who may uh, be subject to uh, ICU or, Mr. President, uh, those, are unfortunately, who might pass away. Uh, Mr. President, we know that there will be COVID circulating in the community. The best way, Mr. President, that Australians can protect themselves, protect their families, and protect the communities, Mr. President, is to get vaccinated. And the more people who are vaccinated, Mr. President, the less people who will be subject to the virus, its spread, and of course, hospitalisation and ICU. Senator Grogan, a supplementary question. Mr. Colbeck, so Senator Colbeck, the Australian Medical Association has warned that the shortage of hospital beds, overcrowded emergency departments and longer wait waits were, and I quote, risking the lives of all Australians. Why has the Morrison Joyce government refused to act on the urgent calls for funding from all state and territory health ministers before it's too late? Minister. Thank you, thank you Mr. President, and uh, thank Thanks, Senator Grogan, for the question. Mr. President, on my Mr. President, the, the, the Australian Minister, government Minister, 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 please resume your seat. Order. Order. The Minister had not even commenced his answer when the interjection started. Interjections are always disorderly. Minister, you have the call. Order. Senator Ayres. I literally just ruled. Senator Colbeck, Minister, you have the call. Thank you. It's a bit of a record, Mr. President. I actually got to seven seconds once before I was stopped, so to get it before I start is not doing too bad. Mr. President, all states and territories, as a part of their conversations with the Senator Australian Watt. government, have indicated that they have adequate capacity to meet demand based on the Doherty modelling supplemented by their own modelling, Mr. President. Mr. President, and during COVID, during COVID, the Australian government has invested, along with the states and territories, into the health system just for COVID in excess of $6.6 billion, Mr. President. $6.6 .6 billion, and that funding has been put put in, particularly in res with respect to the, health, the, the state health systems, on a 50-50 basis, Order. Mr. President. Uh, so $6.6 billion invested by the Australian government in support of the states and territories in fighting Minister, COVID. Minister, the time for the answer has expired. Senator Grogan, a second supplementary question. Thank you. AMA President Dr Omar Khorshid has said, and I quote, once COVID comes in, the only way we can look after people with COVID is to stop looking after all the other people that we are currently looking after. Will the minister guarantee Australians will be safe? Minister. They're all there. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, There's the Australian no government way. moved very early to put in place a number of measures to support the health system uh, in the event of significant outbreaks of COVID. Uh, and there have been a, a continuation of measures, obviously, that's been, that have been undertaken since then. One of the first things, Mr. President, that we did to support the public health system was the private hospitals agreement, Mr. President, which allowed those private hospitals to support the public health system in the case of a huge surge in numbers. Of course, Mr. President, as we vaccinate more Australians, as more Australians take up the opportunity to vaccinate, uh, to, to have a vaccination, that again reduces the, the possibilities of COVID transmitting through the community. It protects individuals from serious illness, uh, hospitalisation and death. That's the point of the vaccination process. Uh, and that is also factored into the Doherty modelling that uh, is dictating our opening up process, Mr President. So all of this carefully calculated Minister, and agreed with the Minister, states. Minister, time for the answer has expired. Senator Davey. 
Thank you very much. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Resources and Water, Senator Rustin. Can the minister please advise the Senate how the Liberals and Nationals plan to position Australia as a leading supplier of critical minerals and rare earth elements, and how this will create jobs and boost investment in the mining industries while meeting the growing global demand for new energy technologies required in a modern economy? The minister representing the Minister for Resources and Water, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and, and I thank Senator Davey for her question because Senator Davey understands that the coalition government is a government that backs our minerals and our resources sector. Critical minerals and rare earth elements are a really, really exciting new chapter for our resource sector, and Australia is extraordinarily blessed. We have some of the largest deposits of, uh, of rare uh, minerals and critical minerals in the world. We've got the second largest reserve of lithium, the sixth largest rare earth reserve, and substantial reserves of cobalt, magnesium, tungsten, and zirconium. So, critical minerals have a broad range of applications, as we know, um, you know, ranging from things as simple as batteries and mobile phones, but going Order. up to things like wind turbines and even fighter jets. The application is extraordinary. And that's why, as a coalition government, we are backing this sector, because we understand that the opportunity for Australia is absolutely huge. We've put to a, to, together a $2 billion loan facility, the Critical Minerals Facility, which will ensure that Australia remains at the absolute forefront of the emerging opportunities in the global resources sector. And our loan facility will help unearth critical minerals and get developments off the ground. In doing so, these projects will help secure vital supplies of resources needed to drive a technology-led energy recovery. These materials will be used in advanced technologies such as renewable energy, aerospace, defence, um, electric vehicles, communications, telecommunications and agri-tech, which I'm sure Senator Davey is uh, particularly excited about. The lithium industry alone um, is forecast to be worth $400 billion globally by 2030. Uh, but in addition to our global resources strategy, we will also identify new markets for critical minerals and facilitate opportunities for expanding trade. We must ensure that Australia harnesses these new markets in the interests of all Australians. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. And I am very passionate about Australia's growing critical minerals mining. And can the minister outline who will benefit from the government's investment in critical minerals. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, everybody benefits from this uh, activity. Studies indicate that, as I said, global demand for critical minerals needed for clean technology applications are going to grow exponentially over the coming decades. Australia is well placed to become a really reliable supplier of these critical minerals. Who will benefit? It's very, very simple, Senator Davey. Our investment will mean three key things. More jobs, more expert options and a stronger economy for Australia. Jobs for the next generation of engineers, tradies, apprentices who will build and operate these mines. Jobs in construction and infrastructure development to help get the product to market. Jobs in defence, aerospace, high-end manufacturing and other sectors that will use our critical minerals. Jobs to support new and emerging technologies and, overall, more support for our regional communities who supply these critical minerals to the rest of the world. In short, Senator Davey, everyone will benefit in Australia. Senator Davey, a second supplementary question. Thank you. And, and more specifically for, for my interests, how will the export and potential value add of rare minerals benefit local towns and regional centres like Parks and Cobar and the wet southern western districts of New South Wales where critical minerals are mined? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, there are a number of areas in Australia that are already seeing benefits from critical minerals, such as the Parks Precinct in your home state of New South Wales, um, Senator Davey. The New South Wales government estimates that through continued investment in critical minerals, more than 2,300 construction and ongoing jobs could be created for central New South Wales. The nine most advanced critical mineral projects in Australia could support 7,000 jobs and will unlock nearly $8 billion in investment 
for regional and rural communities alone. Australia's current battery industry is estimated to already contribute $1.3 billion to our GDP and 6,000 jobs, mostly in regional Australia. The Order. Future Batteries Industry CRC at estimated diverse, di left. diversified battery industries could add 34,700 new jobs uh, in Australia and $7.4 billion to Australia's economy, Minister, much of which Minister, will be the benefit Minister, of rural and regional Australia. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. The President of the National Farmers Federation, Fiona Simpson, has warned that if Australia does not adopt a net zero by 2050 emissions target, it would, quote, punish farmers and that, quote, we can't afford to squander this opportunity. Is Ms Simpson wrong? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much. And it's fantastic to have Senator Watt ask a question about agriculture. He's been here a while, talks a big game from Brisbane on behalf of uh, rural and regional Queensland. But it's fantastic. And I, I hope he's also met with the NFF. Um, well, you know, I'm sorry, I'm from the South. Uh, Brisbane, Gold Coast, it's all the same to me. He talks a big game. I'm hoping you have met with Agforce, who is the Queensland representative on the NFF, because they actually have very strong views of this particular issue. They are very, very clear. Whilst obviously agriculture is making great uh, inroads into lowering emissions and different production uh, systems, whether it's the grains industry and carbon sequestration, whether it is the beef industry uh, committing to net zero by 2030. Uh, without a carbon tax, Minister, I might say, which your Minister, government. Please resume your seat. Senator Watt, on a point of order. On, on relevance, Mr. President, uh, I know Senator McKenzie isn't close enough to the farming community to know that there's a difference Senator between Watt, the NFF Senator and Senator Watt, Force. points of order. Our question Senator is about... Watt, sit down. Points of order are not an opportunity to make gratuitous comments across the chamber. You have the call, but please make a point of order. On relevance, the question was about the National Farmers Federation rather than any other farming group that the minister chooses to talk about. S Senator Watt, Senator Watt. Senator Canavan, on the point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. President. Um, uh, on the point of order, uh, if uh, Senator Watt actually knew something about the agricultural industry, Senator, he would know, he would know that Ag Force the... is a member of NFF. That Ag Force Senator is a Canavan. member of NFF. So it's Senator exactly Canavan. relevant. It's Senator exactly Canavan. relevant. He knows nothing resume about your farmers. Seat. Senator Wong. Senator Canavan, resume your seat. Senator Wong on the point of order. On a f Silence. Order in the chamber. Order. Order. Senator Wong on the point of order. Uh, well, Mr. President, I'd ask you to reflect after question time. Um, you did deal very sternly with Senator Watt very quickly. Senator Canavan continued to ignore your I, was, I, I, I haven't finished sorry. my submission, Mr President. Order on my right. We just want even handedness, sir. <laughs> Senator Wong, Senator Wong, Senator Wong, I was calling Senator Canavan to order. Senator Gallagher. Senator Watt, had you completed your point of order? I'm listening. Ve order on my right. I was listening very carefully to the answer. You've had the chance to direct the minister back to the question. Uh, I do not believe I need to do more than that at this point. I am listening carefully to the answer. Minister, you have the call. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And, um, speak to Fiona Simpson, the president of the NFF, regularly. I also speak to Georgie Somerset, the president of your own Farmers' Federation, a member of the, Nationals Farmers, uh, the National Farmers' Federation, Georgie Somerset, uh, president of AgForce. And you know what? They've made very, very clear to me, to the coalition, 
and to the National Party party room in the context of this debate is that farmers have done their fair share, that they have done the heavy lifting and that they want that recognised. And you know why they did the heavy lifting? because of the Queensland government's native vegetation laws. It is because of the Palaszczuk state Labor government's— Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Thank you, Mr President. Point of order, direct relevance. Order. Order. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, point of order, direct relevance. The, the question went to a statement by the president of the NFF uh, as to if Australia doesn't adopt a net net zero by 2050, it will punish farmers, and whether or not Ms. Simpson was wrong. We, I, I didn't intervene. I didn't uh, raise a point of order earlier uh, about the, the lengthy discussion about ag force, etc. This is now an entirely different subject. Senator McKenzie. I've been the Order. On my right. Order. On my right. Se you forget Wong. that I was shadow minister for trade. A lot no, of people uh, I had to talk to. <laughs> order, you remember that. This is not an opportunity <laughs> well, for discussion you know, across the table. I'm very happy to answer questions. I might actually stick Senator to the Wong. question. Senator Wong, Direct please relevance. complete uh, your thank point you. of order. Yes, well, I think I have. Thank you, Mr President. <laughs> Senator Canavan, on the point of order. order. I, 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 in, the minister was clearly uh, referring to the arguments that the National Farmers Federation have made this week around their position, which did, does relate uh, to tree clearing and native vegetation laws around this country. Yes, I, uh, Senator Wong, I, uh, I'm prepared to make a ruling. Um, uh, I, I believe that while Senator McKenzie has not been uh, in breach of standing orders, I. I I am listening carefully to the answer. I, I do think there is a risk of straying, but I do not believe that Senator McKenzie has strayed from the question. S Senator McKenzie, you have the call. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. I think I did uh, touch all the high notes. The National Farmers Federation, Fiona Simpson, net zero. What farmers are absolutely sick and tired of is a Labor Party that doesn't understand the contribution that they make and understand that they actually want to be compensated and recognised for the contribution they've already made to the reduction Minister, in emissions Minister, in this country. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Minerals Council of Australia, which represents resources companies including BHP, Rio Tinto and Whitehaven Coal, has endorsed net zero by 2050, saying the mineral sector has confidence a net zero emissions by 2050 target can be reached. Is the Minerals Council of Australia wrong? Senator McKenzie. Thank you very, very much. And I do note um, in putting their support forward for an aspirational target of net zero by 2050, the Minerals Council a couple of weeks ago made it very, very clear that we can't do that without our carbon uh, carbon capture and storage technology being implemented in this country. So we look forward to the Labor Party supporting National Party amendments to the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, which will do exactly that, which will actually ensure that the dirty deal done by Gillard and Brown to establish the Clean Senator Energy McKenzie, Corporation will Senator actually McKenzie, fund carbon Minister, capture and storage. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong on a point of order. Well, there certainly are dirty deals at the moment, and Senator McKenzie could talk about them. But Senator my Wong, point of order again. My point of order. Senator Rennick. Uh, I'm happy to give leave for Senator Rennick to speak. Senator Wong, this is not. I move. You, you want to do that? This, we, we will give you. If you stand up and seek Senator leave, Wong. we will give you Senator leave. Senator Wong, resume your seat. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. I will. Senator Wong. Points of order are not an opportunity to debate matters across the chamber, and nor for interjections from my right. Senator Wong, Senator Wong, Senator Rennick, Senator Watt. I will give Senator Wong the opportunity to restate her point of order. Senator Wong, have you finished, Senator Wong? 
All right. I am listening carefully to the answer. You've had the chance to bring the minister back to the question. Senator McKenzie. <laughs> so, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. As I was saying, carbon capture and storage technologies, along, I must have, along with uh, nuclear technologies, are recognised by the International Energy Agency as the two technologies which are actually going to be essential to getting to a low emissions future. So I actually look forward to the Labor Party and the Greens supporting 21st century technologies Minister, that will— Minister, resume your seat. Now, Okay. If the chamber agrees, we can do the supplementary a a question, the final supplementary question. There is no objection. Senator Watt, a uh, second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given the comments of the National Farmers Federation and the Minerals Council of Australia, when will the fake farmers and the fake miners in the National Party listen to the real farmers and the real miners who support net zero by 2050? Uh, Minister. Uh, okay. Well, you know, I, I am a little concerned, Mr. President, that the amount of um, the amount of point of orders that have been taken during this answer have meant that I actually don't get asked my dixer by uh, Senator Matt Canavan on the fabulous work we're doing uh, in Queensland for the beef industry uh, and Blair and Josie Angus up at. But um, I love the fact that Senator Watt thinks it's too cute by half talking about fake and real farmers. I would put Senator Watt. I would put a hundred bucks Senator on Watt. the president's table that you have never Senator sat down Watt. with a real farmer Senator in your Watt. life. I am going to ask Georgie Somerset, the president of AgForce, to come and pay you a little visit so she can actually talk you through what your outrageous state Labor government has done to Queensland farmers and that we are meeting and beating our um, emission targets as a result of their hard work. As a result of their hard work. We will Minister, always stand up for farmers. Minister, your time has expired. We have now hit a hard marker. Um, sorry, I just need to just quickly consult with the I understand that uh, Senator Smith is seeking leave of the chamber to do committee memberships. Um, is leave granted? The president has received a letter nominating senators to be members of committees. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion to appoint senators to a committee. Is leave granted? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try that again. Is leave granted? Yes. Senator Very Smith. Much. Mr. President, I move that uh, Senator Scar be appointed to the Economics, Legislation and References Committee, Senator McGrath be appointed to the Procedure Committee, and Senator Van be appointed to the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Hume. Mr President, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to the order for production of documents discussed during a public hearing of the Rural Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee on 19 July 2021, agreed to in this place yesterday. I note that the doc documents sought under this order were also sought under the order for production of documents number 1217. I also note that the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and the Arts, through me, responded to that order on 2 September 2021. With regard to the clauses, uh, to clauses 1A and D of this order, and further to the Minister's correspondence to this place on 2 September 2021, I am advised that the documents subject to this order, reliant on the description during a public hearing of the Re Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee on 19 July 2021, cannot be tabled as no document matching this description has been seen by either the minister, his office or his department. With regards to spreadsheets sought under clauses 1b and c of this order, and further to the minister's correspondence to the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee of the 4th of August 2021, and to this place of the 2nd of September 2021, I remind the Senate that the documents subject to these clauses of the order are subject to a public interest immunity claim on the grounds that the release of those documents would disclose the deliberations of cabinet, and I table that document 
uh, relating to the order of production of documents concerning the Urban Congestion Fund. Thank you. Senator Keneally? Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to take note of the Minister's answer. Thank you. Well, Mr. President, you can set your watch to it. The Senate orders the Morrison Joyce government to produce documents relating to a dodgy grant, and the Morrison Joyce government just flat out refuses to deliver. They are shameless, are they not? They're addicted to secrecy, allergic to accountability. There is no standard so low that they can't limbo underneath it. They think they are above the law. Of course, Senator Patrick points out there are blind trusts. Perhaps, as we see in the House yesterday, there is a new low standard. That, well, here we go. We know that the Morrison Joyce government members, they break the rules that they don't care about and they change the rules that they can. The Senate ordered that the minister lay on the table emails, spreadsheets, maps related to the car park Rort scandal. We know from the ANAO that the projects under the car parts Rort pro program were picked from a list titled the top 20 marginal electorates. You can't get more blatant than that. We know that hundreds of millions of dollars were shoveled out the door on projects announced during the 2019 federal election campaign. And we know that 77 percent of the car park sites ended up in coalition electorates and not in areas where they were most needed. The ANAO found out that surprise, surprise, senators, that none of the 47 project sites selected for funding commitments were proposed by the Department of Infrastructure. None of them. None of them. This is egregious. This is wholesale rorting. Wholesale rorting. The government that Mr. Morrison leads is littered with examples of scandal, rorting, and waste. I have lost track, Madam Deputy President, of the number of ministers who have been exposed for their misconduct in their dodgy dealings. Taylor, McKenzie, Colbeck, Cash, Lay, Dutton, Fletcher, Robert, Tudge, Hunt, Rustin, Reynolds, and Porter. All of these ministers have been linked to one scandal or another. I wish Car Park Rorts was an anomaly, but this is a new, new normal for the Morrison-Joyce government. They spend taxpayer money like it is Liberal National Party money. The sheer quantum of misconduct by those opposite is simply staggering. I don't think it's about to get any better, by the way. There's a federal election right around the corner, and this tired eight-year-old Liberal National government doesn't have any other tricks up its sleeve. There's never been a better time, in fact, to be a color-coded spreadsheet than under Mr. Morrison and his mates. Ann Webster. Ann Webster, the member for Mali, had an uncharacteristic moment of honesty from the Morrison-Joyce government, but she's new. She might grow out of that. Anyway, she had an uncharacteristic moment of honesty when she belled the cat on the Building Better Regions warts. She revealed that coalition MPs can basically just ask for any money they want, regardless of the rules of the grant. On, depending on the whims of the minister in any given day, they might just get that money. They might just get that money. Well, I've been in politics long enough to know that there is a view out there in the community that grift and graft and dodgy deals are just par for the course, the nature of the beast, the cost of doing business. I think the former Premier of New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian, in fact, said, what's wrong with pork barreling? Everybody does it. She might have a different view about that these days, by the way. The voters supposedly factored in, this view is supposedly factored in by voters because, quote, all political parties do it and all right. politicians are in it for themselves. But what is clear from car park rorts, sports rorts, building better regions rorts, all 22 of the slush funds in Mr. Morrison's recent budget is that we are experiencing an all-time low for government accountability in this country. This is uniquely bad. We've had grants for rural and regional communities handed to projects that are literally next door to the Sydney Harbour Bridge. We've had sports clubs and marginal seats given money for female change room facilities when they have no women's teams. We've had funding for community safety grants cut so the minister could spend cash in an election <laughs> announcement. The behavior of the Morrison-Joyce government is brazen. Mr. Morrison, 
appears to have a blatant disregard for the rules and institutions of our democracy. The Australian people have a right to know what their government gets up to. They have a right to know how their money is being spent. They have a right to expect a higher standard from their elected officials. But Mr. Morrison and his mates, they don't even try to hide it anymore. Asked about the car park rorts earlier this year, the minister representing the prime minister in this place, Senator Birmingham, simply shrugged and he said, look, the Australian people had their chance and they voted the government back in at the last election. They're not even trying to hide this anymore. Why attempt, by the way, to defend the indefensible? You kind of got to admire the hide of the whole thing. They're just hoping that no one pays close enough attention to their bad behavior. As long as they get reelected, what do they care? What's well, a disgraceful attitude? It is beyond contempt, particularly when we see communities that need community safety funding not getting it, particularly when we see areas that are affected by congestion neglected for a car park because they just happen to be in a labor-held seat. Frankly, though, people are catching on. Look at what we saw yesterday in the House of Representatives. For the first time since Federation, a government has voted against the Speaker. Get voted against a motion the Speaker has given precedence to, namely that former Minister Christian Porter should be investigated for his failure to declare a million-dollar blind trust. We're all public servants in this place. We all have to follow the rules. We all have to be accountable to our constituents and the broader public. Christian Porter's decision to accept this money constitutes, without declaring it, constitutes at least an investigation. It looks like an outrageous breach of office, and he should be investigated. And that was the view of the Speaker, a Liberal Party colleague of Mr. Porter's, who ruled there was a prima facie case for referral, and Labor supported the referral. It was Mr. Morrison, the Prime Minister. It was Mr. Joyce, the Deputy Prime Minister, and all of their mates in the government who didn't. They held their nose and they voted against the Speaker for the first time in nearly 120 years in a blatant display of disregard for transparency and accountability. It's extraordinary. It is quite literally without precedent in this country. The member for Pierce is being protected by the Prime Minister. It's the only explanation here. He's the only Western Australian this Prime Minister has ever stood up for. And that speaks volumes for this Prime Minister. The Morrison government will hound people to their death with robo-debt, but they'll help a disgraced former minister cover up his million-dollar blind trust. No wonder they don't want to fund a federal ICAC. No wonder they don't want to even present the legislation for a national anti-corruption commission. No wonder they don't want to answer questions on notice. No wonder they don't want to abide by orders from the Senate to produce documents. This Prime Minister doesn't like answering questions because he knows the Australian people won't like the answers. If the documents requested by the Senate today could make the government look good, then we'd have seen them by now. So what are they hiding? What are they hiding? When voter cynicism in government grows, politicians like Mr. Morrison flourish. Blokes like Mr. Morrison have made a career out of exceeding, over-shrinking, ever-shrinking expectations. The only way we can restore the Australian people's faith in our democracy is by showing this lot the door. Because unless we get a government that is serious about a national anti-corruption commission, this type of rorting and scandals and blind trusts and disregarding the speaker and not answering questions on notice and not producing documents is simply going to continue. After eight long years of this tired liberal national government, the Australian people deserve a government that is on their side. So let me be clear, in this chamber and with the Australian people, an Albanese Labor government will deliver a national anti-corruption commission, one with teeth, one that will bring transparency and accountability so long lacking in this tired eight-year-old Liberal National Government 
we will bring that to the national level. Because the Australian people deserve to know what's being done with their money. They deserve to have accountability and transparency in their government, and they deserve a government that is on their side. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. I was so disappointed with this minister's response to my order for production of documents. Incredibly disappointed, but not surprised. This government has got form. They have got so much form with hiding information, hiding the fact that they make decisions based on their political interests, what suits their interests, making decisions based on the interests of them, their mates, big business, making, making decisions based on what they think is it going to take to win them seats rather than what is in the interests of ordinary Australians. This is the second time that the minister has failed to present the documents that were set out in this order. And I was particularly disappointed that even we didn't even, they didn't even attempt to give any extra reason as to why they shouldn't give, give these, these documents. They sent, basically simply resent a letter stating that, in relation to some of the requests, that neither Minister Fletcher nor his office nor the department have seen the documents. May I remind people that this is despite the fact that these documents were referred to by the Australian National Audit Office at a hearing of the Rural and, Regional Australia, Rural and Regional Transport Committee. The ANAO aren't making it up. The ANAO are there as the audit office to inquire into actions and programs of department. They don't make stuff up. The Auditor General, the, the, the Auditor told us that there was this document that referred to the top 20 marginal seats. And yet Minister Fletcher and Minister Hume, through him, are saying that neither that no one happens to have seen these documents. So I really want to ask how closely have they looked? I mean, their letter says the documents aren't to hand. I mean, how convenient. Maybe they just accidentally fell into a shredder or something. And of course, what makes this so upsetting is that this isn't the first time. This government has got form. Let's take us back to sports rorts. In January 2020, when he was asked about sports rorts at the press club, the Prime Minister said, all we did was to provide information based on the representations made to us, as every Prime Minister has done. And in March 2020, the Prime Minister said, we provided information based on the representations made to us, and that included information about other funding options or programs relevant to the project proposals. It wasn't until two months later, in May 2020, after significant new information had come to light, that the Prime Minister admitted that they'd been involved in providing approvals for those sports rorts programs. The only authority sought from the Prime Minister's office and from me was in relation to announcements, they said. But subsequently, what we learnt through the committee process was that McKenzie, Minister McKenzie's office had sent dozens of spreadsheets to the Prime Minister's office, had sought approvals for particular rounds of funding, and the sports rorts funding was expanded after a meeting between Minister Mackenzie and the Prime Minister following spreadsheets that were sent to the Prime Minister's office. So let's be very clear. When it comes to hiding information, being slippery with language and conveniently forgetting things until they're forced to acknowledge them, this government has got form. And when it comes to the information that's in these documents, this is not the end of the matter. There is a long way to go. We've got Senate estimates next week. We've got a committee into these car park rorts, and I'm confident that more information is going to come to light. I mean, the refusal by this government to be transparent with the truth doesn't change our commitment to actually getting to the truth and to hold them accountable, to hold this government accountable. We will use the Senate. We will use the information that we've got from the ANAO. I mean, this rorting of this grant scheme, it matters on multiple levels. As I've been saying, it's just consistent with the government using 
government processes, using government funding, using grant processes to be serving their own political interests rather than the interests of the community. But it also matters when it comes to just good governance, making good decisions. I mean, I want to talk about the transport policy before going on in a bit more detail about the corruption. I mean, this, was the, this whole grant fund was the Urban Congestion Fund. The whole point of this grant fund is supposedly to be busting congestion. Let me share one of the submissions that we've received into the car parks inquiry that we've just set up on this issue from the University of Melbourne transport um, experts. And they say that after years of research on how do you solve urban congestion, the overwhelming conclusion of these investigations is that congestion reduction has failed because of the bias to solutions based on expanding road capacity. Put simply, the experience all over the world since the 1970s confirms that additional capacity induces new demand. This ensures congestion returns to or exceeds initial levels very soon after additional capacity is added. In the case of bottlenecks, which is a specific focus of the Urban Congestion Fund, when one bottleneck is removed, the choke point simply moves to the next. It is now widely accepted by transport planners that building additional road capacity is not a cost-effective means to reduce congestion. More success has been achieved through measures that address demand, such as pricing reform and strategic land use planning. Sadly, we haven't seen that road pricing reform, despite years of waiting for it. Which, and so it then goes to what is so tragically wrong with this rort, that building new car parks, just like building new roads, will not solve congestion. And when we ask in Senate estimates, you know, what's the justification for even spending money on car parks in order to, to solve con congestion? The officials, of course, had no clear answer how they identified these car park projects or how they linked into broader infrastructure planning, including the work done by Infrastructure Australia. But of course, we know why that was. Because the officials were trying to have to pretend that there was some rhyme and reason and semblance of connection with um, transport policy behind them. But it was because the whole entire program is a rot. They didn't pick the car parks on any kind of sensible plan. Basically, they sent around yet another spreadsheet with a list of electorates each project was in. So it wasn't, it wasn't at all a surprise to learn that the same staffer who was involved in sports rorts had been involved, was involved with the car park rorts. And, so, and we also know that we saw government moving projects between programs, so shifting them from the Community Support Infrastructure Fund to the Community Development Grants Fund and, and the Urban Congestion Fund. So it seems increasingly clear that this isn't a case of just a single rort multiplied multiple times. It is basically the Prime Minister's office serving as a coordination point between the Liberal Party election campaign and different programs that are being run across different portfolios. This is one mega rort being run out of the Prime Minister's office. And that's why the wish lists that we use for sports rorts mattered. They weren't just wish lists for changing rooms, they were wish lists for election commitment projects across multiple types of projects. And as Michael West Media has noted, often these projects, particularly the car parks, follow a pattern. First the MP organises a petition to harvest contact details, and then, hey presto, suddenly they've got a grant to announce right before the election. Look, it's, I mean, it's almost as if there was a systematic, coordinated process to use public announcements to bolster their election can chances without doing the hard work of genuine consultation and policy development. And I mean, the scale of the Liberal Party's approach to these funds is so awful that there are layers of misspending. Um, I mean, we saw that, you know, of course, in New South Wales with the recent ICAC inquiry in New South Wales. I mean, one of Mike Baird's staffers questioned the advocacy by the then Treasurer of New South Wales, Gladys Ber Berejiklian, and questioned why they were spending money in a safe seat. Clearly, they saw the value in spending public funding in marginal seats for their electoral benefit. But on top of that layer of corruption, the former Treasurer wanted a, a pet project. And entirely coincidentally, it appears it was in the electorate of someone she was in a relationship with. The sad truth is, with this government, it's genuinely hard 
keeping track of all the different programs they've tried to rort. Sports rorts, car park rorts, the Community Development Grants Fund, and the list goes on. It's exactly why we need a federal ICAC with teeth. It's exactly why we need to have something that goes to the heart of the corruption in this government, highlighting the, election, the inaction of this government, the refusal to pass an ICAC, despite the fact that the Greens bill for a federal ICAC passed the Senate two years ago and, has, or, and is there on the books, ready to be implemented if we only had an honest Thank rather you, than a Senator corrupt Rice, government. Your time has expired. If there are no more speakers, I intend to put the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Keneally to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Thanks, Deputy President. Uh, Deputy President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to consideration of legislation. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. Thanks, Deputy President. Uh, I move that A, the hours of meeting be 9.30 am till adjournment. B, the following bills be called on following motions to take note of answers and have precedence over all other business till determined. Customs Amendment, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement Implementation Bill 2021 and a related bill and Financial Sector Reform, Hain Royal Commission Response, Better Advice, Bill 2021, and C, divisions may take place after 4.30 p.m., and D, uh, the Senate adjourn without debate at the conclusion of the general business debate, which will be considered for not more than 60 minutes. Thank you, Minister. So the question is that the motion is moved by the Minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Wong. Thank you. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the failure of the government to comply with order for the production of documents number 1251. Is leave granted? Uh, yes. Thank you. Minister. Thanks, uh, th thanks Chair. Uh, the government will not deny leave. Uh, um, we sought to deny leave uh, earlier today in relation to uh, this motion. Uh, I recognise the vote of the Senate uh, at that time, which agreed to suspend standing orders uh, at that stage. We won't prolong debate in the Senate. The government still believes that uh, consideration of this is just a stunt by the opposition, completely unnecessary on their behalf, uh, and in doing so um, is, uh, is simply uh, seeking to further politicise uh, debates uh, in relation to climate change and emissions reduction uh, and is seeking to get ahead uh, of, uh, of matters that are rightly being considered by the government to take a fully informed position uh, to the Glasgow Climate Change Conference. However, recognising that the will of the Senate has already been expressed, uh, we won't uh, object to, by way of leave denial at this time. Thank you, Minister. Senator Wong. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I move the motion which has been circulated in the chamber, which I am happy to read if the chamber so wishes. But it relates to so, uh, relates to the failure of the government to respond to the order of production of documents one two five one moved by Senator Patrick in Canavan, and requires the minister representing the minister for industry, energy, and e emissions reduction to the, attend the Senate immediately to provide an explanation. Uh, the terms of the motion have been circulated in the chamber. Thank you. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Uh, Senator Davey. I draw attention to the state of the chamber. Uh, yes, quorum required, I believe. Ring the bells.
Our quorum's been reached. Thank you. So um, I'll call you, Senator Seselja. Thank you, Senator Seselja. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, so uh, I table a response uh, to the order of production of documents, um, if I could, and I'll just have a copy <laughs> with me as well. Uh, Please continue. Yeah, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, so, uh, the uh, I, I might just read the uh, I might just read the table document. So, um, as Minister representing the Minister for Industry, Energy and Emissions Reduction, I write with regard to the Senate Order for Production of Documents Number One Two Five One, moved by Senator Patrick and agreed by the Senate on 20 October <coughs> 2021 on the matter of modelling relating to the government's emission reduction strategy. Noting sensitivity is incumbent on a request for cabinet documents and the time frame provided to respond, I advise that more time will be required to comply with the order. A more detailed response will be provided to the Senate by Friday 29 October, consistent with standing order 166. And I enclose a letter from the Minister for Industry, Energy and Emissions Reduction confirming this advice. Thank you, Minister. Senator Wong. Thank you. Pursuant to the motion, I rise to take note of, of that response and make a few points. One, just to be very clear, that the government spent some time today filibustering and uh, running procedural games to avoid having a vote on the motion that they've just now had to have a vote on. And the reason the government conceded that vote is that it knew that a number of its senators were, to their credit, prepared to cross the floor to support a motion requiring the minister to attend. Recall that the order for production of documents that is uh, uh, the subject of this motion that was not complied with by Minister Cezelia, was not complied with by the government, was a motion in fact supported by Senator Matt Canavan. So a government, minister, a government senator moving a motion against uh, his own government or requiring his own government to provide uh, the economic modelling that they have been uh, talking about. Uh, so that, that is all of the shenanigans today were to avoid a vote that the government has just conceded. So just to be very clear what has occurred, Senator Canavan made clear he was prepared to cross the floor, as I have to say was the private indication from another of other Liberal senators. Uh, this is a government utterly divided. But I do want to take, make, uh, make some comments. Senator McKenzie, how are you? Uh, yes, I do want to make uh, some brief comments, if I may, about uh, the approach of the government to, uh, to secrecy and the approach to the government to transparency and the approach to the government uh, to accountability. The, the government want to keep this modelling secret because they know that, that they have cost Australia billions of dollars by standing in the way of action on climate and renewables. And it's not the only secret, of course, that we know the Morrison-Joyce government is determined to keep from Australians. Recall that yesterday Mr Morrison got every one of his MPs to vote to protect Christian Porter and his secret donations. But he can't get, he can't get his divided government to vote for net zero emissions by 2050. The fact is, Mr Morrison never takes responsibility. He leaves it to others on vaccines, on hospitals, on quarantine, on bushfires, on climate, on renewables. And he's not even in the room when his government's policy on climate and renewables is being decided by Mr Joyce and the Nationals. But when it comes to protecting Mr Porter, that's a job Mr Morrison puts his back into. Well, if only Mr Morrison put the same effort into fighting for the Australian people as he puts into fighting for Christian Porter. Mr Porter. If only he put as much effort into tackling climate change and ensuring we support renewables as he puts into protecting Mr Porter. The whole reason for this government's existence over eight long years has been to stand in the way of action on climate and renewables. And make no mistake about it, any deal that Mr Morrison comes up with now, with Mr Joyce's support, will be nothing but political spin to get Mr Morrison through Glasgow and to get him through the election. But I'd say to the, say to the government, Australians are on to you. Australians are on to you.
They've seen what Mr Morrison is like, and they know he isn't the real deal. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Deputy President. And I also rise to take note of the answer. Well, it would be too easy, wouldn't it, just to be wearily resigned to the secrecy, the endless and naked politicking from this tired, clapped-out government? Because we've had eight years of it, haven't we? Years ago, the government tried hiding the modelling that related to its tax cuts, and it hasn't let up since. We've seen relentless rorting. Car parks, sports rorts, all with accompanying colour-coded spreadsheets. And when queried about it, a bullying, uncompromising assertion that this is fine, that this is what government looks like. Yesterday, in the other place, the government voted to protect Mr Porter from scrutiny, an unprecedented decision to shield a sitting government MP from the scrutiny of the Privileges Committee about an unprecedented circumstance where that person sought to establish a legal mechanism to hide his financial interests. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And this morning, this morning here in this place, it's just more of the same, isn't it? We spent hours on this this morning. People remember we're all here in the chamber waiting. While these people voted to scuttle an attempt by a member of their own coalition, Senator Canavan, to access important modelling about possible climate commitments and the economic, the economic consequences of those commitments. This government says it's all about the economy. It says it's all about the economic interests of regional Australia. It says it's all about Australia's economic future. But it's not interested in a serious public debate about those questions. It's not interested in a serious debate about our future and, as demonstrated this morning, will do anything possible to prevent such a, play, a debate taking place here in this chamber, here in the very place where such a debate ought to be happening. Because it matters, doesn't it? This kind of secrecy is just wrong and it's reflective of the culture of the government. A relentless pursuit an unending pursuit of political solutions, of deal-making, to what are genuine policy problems. And it's all tied up together, isn't it? Because it's easier to do a deal in secret. It's much easier than when there are just a handful of actors in the room, a nice little subcommittee of cabinet, just a handful of people who can cut a deal. Cut a deal, shunt money off in one direction, in exchange for another kind of commitment that may or may not be in the national interest. And when you cut your deal, it's a lot easier, isn't it, to spin it when there are very few facts about the content of that agreement, very few facts about the content of the negotiation, very few facts about what has actually been agreed and the consequences for Australia and Australians. Much easier to spin when there aren't facts out there to contradict your narrative. But it's not what the national interest requires. This is a big and serious and consequential challenge. It's one that our peers all around the globe are willing to take on. And around the globe, when we do see serious climate action, it's not the product of secret meetings, some new sort of augmented schedule to the coalition deal between the Liberals and the Nationals. Serious climate action is a consequence of bringing people along. Serious economic reform requires a conversation with the very communities whose lives will change, an honest and open conversation that reassures people that you have their interests at heart, not just making it through, skating through to the next election, keeping your job, keeping your ministry, keeping your cosy spot, keeping your big car. What's needed is a serious public conversation to grapple with an existential challenge and one that every serious country in the world, all of our peers, are grappling with at this very moment. Mr Morrison is going to go to Glasgow, he says. 
He should go with a serious plan to take Australia into the future, one that has been the subject of public discussion and the pathetic, endless attempts to reduce this to a grubby deal you, do Senator no one McCallus. any credit. Say your time has expired. Senator Patrick. Oh, sorry, yes. were you seeking the call, Senator Davies? I'll go to Senator Davies and then back to you. Senator Davies. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I rise to speak on, on this motion. Um, I, I believe I want to again draw the attention of the Senate to the response by uh, Senator Zed Zaselja. Uh, a commitment has been made to provide a, a formative response, a more detailed response to the Senate by Friday. The 29th of October, consistent with Standing Order 166, because let me remind you, this OPD was only received yesterday. Deliberations are ongoing. You want us to preempt outcomes of deliberations by releasing modelling that underpins current discussions, current negotiations, and current considerations. I mean, and this is coming from. The Labor Party. Let's not forget, last election, the Labor Party took a commitment for a 45 per cent cut in emissions by 2030 without releasing any modelling, without releasing any costings and without any consideration of what impact that would have on jobs. Jobs, regional communities, farmers, miners and the local bakers and news agents that depend on those jobs for their, their businesses. I, I hear Senator McAllister saying we're doing a deal in secret. Well, we are having very serious discussions because we have been talking to our constituents. We, have taken, we are taking back our constituents' considerations. We don't do deals like the Labor Party in caucus and then foist it upon the Australian public and expect them to fall in line behind us. That's right. And unlike Senator Watt, we actually know who our constituents are. AgForce, which is a Queensland organisation that Senator Watt doesn't even realise is a member of the NFF. Order. Order. The AgForce, who used to run a fantastic campaign. Farmers, every family needs one. So, you know, uh, AgForce are a wonderful organisation, and you should know who they are, Senator Watt. You should understand what they have asked for. Senator Davey, you I remind you to your remarks to the chair, not directly to any senator in the chamber. Thank you. I stand uh, corrected. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy <laughs> President. Um, but I, I'm. Back, back to the important issue at hand. I mean, earlier on, Senator Wong said this government was full of inaction. Inaction. You're talking about a government that has seen massive reductions of emissions since coming into this place and taking on government in 2013 through technology, not taxes, through working in partnership with industry. So instead of hitting industry over the head with a big stick like an ETS or like a carbon tax, we've sat down with industry and we've said, how can we all work together? How can we lower emissions? How can we incentivise innovation? Partnering with the private sector to bring a portfolio of low emissions technology in parity with their current alternatives, working on what is available today, but also with an eye on the future. Because when we're talking about a 2050 target, that is 30 years away. Imagine if we sat down 30 years ago and said, this mobile phone that I have in my handbag today, because it wouldn't fit in my pocket, is going to be the mobile phone we're using in 30 years' time. It is ridiculous to try and cement us into a position what we are doing is laying the foundations for a roadmap, but we're not doing it blindly and we're not doing it deftly. And that is why the Nationals are negotiating. That is why the Nationals are looking at protections to underpin the very jobs and industries that have kept our economy strong through COVID. If it wasn't for our agricultural sector, if it wasn't for our mining sector, if it wasn't for our exports of iron ore and coal and our exports of beef 
and wheat and rice. In the last year, we've had a, we've had a good rice harvest as well. If it wasn't for those exports, we wouldn't have made it through COVID with the economic strength that we have. We wouldn't be the first country to return to the same number of employed Australians as pre-COVID. So the Nationals— Thank you, Senator Davey. Your time has Thank expired. I indicated before I'd go to Senator Patrick and then I'll go to you, Senator Roberts. If, yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note, <coughs> uh, along with uh, my other colleagues. I, uh, I do concede, um, as uh, uh, Senator Davies has uh, indicated, that the letter that has come to the chamber gives some hope that there may be disclosure. Uh, I, <coughs> I just want to uh, remind the chamber that. Uh, the position of the Senate has always been, uh, and I've just uh, had a quick look at it just to refresh myself, has always been that it is the deliberations of Cabinet that uh, are accepted as, uh, as being um, uh, a, yeah, the basis of a pro proper public interest immunity claim. Uh, that is the conversations that take place, uh, and the basal reason for that confidentiality is because of a collective responsibility. The ability for ministers to uh, argue across the table and that to be held secret is, is in some sense uh, sacrosanct, and, and I accept that. It doesn't extend to Cabinet documents. The, the Senate has never accepted that. And uh, all too often we see people, uh, uh, see ministers sprinkling the Cabinet secrecy dust over, over things that it shouldn't be, uh, that it shouldn't be uh, sprinkled over. And I, know, I note that at the start of this year, I'm sure, and perhaps in the, in, the, in the finance minister's $40 billion discretionary fund, uh, they bought a whole bunch more secrecy dust because they had to extend it to national cabinet. Even though we know national cabinet is not a cabinet, they still, they're still definitely sprinkling the cabinet secrecy dust over that. So there is some hope in, uh, in, in, uh, in the letter that has been provided to the Senate, and that's a good thing. I encourage, I, I urge the Prime Minister to release this information and to do so as early as possible because there is a debate that's taking place and debates are always better if they're informed debates. Let's see the modelling, let's see uh, uh, where everything lies uh, rather than having everyone guess. Um, even you know, the, the statements made by the Prime Minister have caused Senator Canavan a member of his own team, a coalition team, uh, uh, doubts, and you know, I, uh, I supported that. I, uh, hence, hence uh, we collectively combined to uh, to move the motion in the first place. Uh, in New Zealand, I'll just remind senators: in New Zealand, cabinet secrecy doesn't exist. I think there's a, there's something like a 30-day time limit, and then everything's released. You know, uh, you know, unless it's national cabinet or some sorry, if it, unless it's sorry national security. It's released, and their democracy hasn't fallen over. So, you know, maybe it's time that the, that, that our um, uh, parliament st uh, ha starts to consider whether or not we want to move towards adoption of the New Zealand system. It's a responsible system of government, and it seems to manage okay. In fact, I'd argue, in many cases, does a lot better through the openness and transparency that uh, their cabinet regime offers the New Zealand people. There's an example that we, can, uh, that we should, should adopt there. So uh, whilst you know, I just point out the hard reality is cabinet del deliberations, yes, that's a public interest immunity. Cabinet documents, no, but in any circumstance, the Prime Minister is authorised to release cabinet documents. He did it for the Doherty modelling. Uh, uh, he should also do it for uh, this, uh, this modelling that is the subject of this order. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I take note as well, but I want to, want to discuss more the concerns I have leading up to the government uh, acceding to the Senate's request. And I also make note of Senator Patrick's comment then that debates are better if informed, and that's where I want to go to. Senator Birmingham said earlier on today, the government is doing the legwork. Well, if that's the truth, why don't they show it? Why have we gone through this charade for the government to capitulate anyway? 
And then the government mentioned through Senator Birmingham that the government is arguing that Labor they won't do it because Labor won't do it. That's got nothing to do with the, with the issue at all. This issue is about integrity and it goes back at least 20 years. It goes back 25 years. The integrity is shot to bits. And that goes to a fundamental point about this parliament. There is a lack of accountability in this parliament. And the way to change that is to change the parliament. Let me remind people, senators here, of what Senator Ian MacDonald said back in 2016, the last Monday before Christmas. He said that he wanted to congratulate me because I've started the debate on climate science that has never been had in this parliament. Never been had in this parliament. The debate on climate science has never been had. Senator Patrick talks about an informed debate. How can we have an informed debate about the second issue about cutting carbon dioxide when we don't know whether we should cut it? That's fundamental. Mr John Howard, the leader of the Liberal National Howard Anderson government from 1996 through to 2007, enacted the renewable energy target and last year expressed regret for doing so. And so he should, because it's crippling our industry. He was the first major party leader to have a policy in place for an emissions trading scheme that, John, that Tony Abbott rightly called a carbon tax. The first leader of, this par of, of a pa major party in this country with an ETS, an emissions trading scheme, a carbon tax, was John Howard. Now, John Howard enacted all these things, and along with his government, his government stole farmers' property rights to comply with the Kyoto Protocol. That is fact. And he did so, his government did so, by going around the Constitution to avoid Section 51, Clause 31, paying just terms compensation to farmers. And he went through the state governments to do that. So the, so the, so the Howard Anderson Liberal National Government went through the back door deceitfully around the Constitution to steal farmers' property rights. This is about integrity. And then, to cap it off, in 2014, John Howard, speaking at a conference in London, a sceptic conference in London, said that in all this climate science, he is agnostic. He is agnostic. So he put in all these policies, stole hundreds of billions of dollars worth of farmers' property rights, yet didn't have the science. Now, I agree with Senator Waters today, shocked though everyone may be, because she said modelling is crap, and she is absolutely correct. Then she talked about kissing the Great Barrier Reef goodbye, agricultural productivity sliding, Murray-Darling Basin say goodbye, yet for 773 days she's refused to provide the empirical scientific evidence that we need to cut carbon dioxide. For 11 years she's, she's failed to do that. I was, I was a joint panellist with Senator Waters back in 2010, in October. And I challenged her, as a member of the panellists, to I challenged a fellow panellist to debate me on the science, to debate me on the corruption of the science. She jumped to her feet and said, I will not debate you because they have not got a position. We hear comments from the Greens about kissing the Great Barrier Reef goodbye. The core premise is that we need to cut carbon dioxide. We have not discussed that in this parliament, ever. And yet we're going to launch into a crusade for, for trillions of dollars destroying this country. Trillions of dollars worth of opportunity cost. We need to get back to the basics and have a debate about integrity and accountability and let's have the data out and let's start that debate. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I say to Senator Roberts, if we stand by stand back and deny reality, if we deny reality of what is happening in our major trading partners, and I know you've worked in the coal mining industry, uh, and I've done a lot of work in the coal mining industry, as, as, as you know, um, the reality is, the reality is that, a lot, that a lot of those major trading partners that we had, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, who supported the development of our mining industries in Australia, they are moving. Order. 
they are moving towards a net zero uh, emissions policy by 2050. They're moving. They're moving, Madam Deputy President. It, to some extent, what Australia does is irrelevant. The world is moving, and it would be it would be wrong of us. It would be wrong of us to deny that reality. It would be wrong of us to deny that reality. Companies like and Senator Roberts will know these companies very well. Companies like Marabeni, companies like Mitsui, companies like Mitsubishi that was part of the BHP is still part of the BHP Mitsubishi Alliance that has developed a lot of the great mines in Queensland, in our home state. Companies like POSCO, companies like J Power, they are all moving specifically towards hydrogen. And we can't deny that reality. We will be doing a great disservice, a great disservice to our country to deny the reality. And that is the reality. That is the reality. We have to look outwards. We're a trading nation. We have to look outwards and see what is happening in the world. We have that responsibility to do it. We have that responsibility to do it. I remember sitting on a, uh, a Senate Select Committee with Senator Ayres, and the AMWU gave uh, evidence which I found particularly compelling, particularly compelling in relation to industries such as the car industry and other heavy manufacturing industry. And that the repeated theme around the country was when you shut down, when those major industries shut down, when those major industries shut down, the research suggests that a third of workers maybe find full-time work somewhere else, a third of workers go on a, 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 a try go on a repetitious cycle of casual work and part-time work. They never get back into full-time work, and a third of workers maybe never get employed again. We can't let that happen in Australia. We can't let that happen in Australia. We have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to embrace the new technologies and create jobs for Australians. We have to accept the reality of the situation. And those who doubt, those who doubt the future of a hydrogen industry in this country, I say to you, I say to you, look at the economic miracle in Japan, in Korea, in Taiwan following World War II. Look at that economic material. Those great nations are focused. They are focused in terms of those new technologies. They're focused on it. We can't lose the opportunity to work with them. If we do, if we, do we will be letting down our communities. The government has been abundantly clear. It is a cornerstone of our policy that there will be no carbon tax. There will be no carbon tax. But what there will be is an embracing of new technologies, and in particular hydrogen. And if you look at the material which has been put out by the Japanese government in particular in terms of the future uh, use of hydrogen in, in Japan, and as you know, Senator Roberts, given your background in the coal mining industry, you know they are our, one of our most successful trading partners in terms of coal mining. If you look at the material being put out by the Japanese Ministry of Economics, their focus is on building a hydrogen industry, and we have to be part of that supply chain. We have to be part of that supply chain. And I say to those who doubt it, I say to those who doubt it, look at the track record of countries like Japan, Korea and Taiwan, and how successful we have been working with them. But we have to work with them. We can't deny their reality, which is there for all to see. We can't deny that reality. We have a moral obligation, a moral obligation to accept the reality of the situation and work constructively forward embracing the new technologies that will provide further jobs for Queenslanders and for our regions. The opportunity is there. We've got to embrace it, and we've got to embrace it optimistically. optimistically. The technology is being developed. We've got to look forward with optimism. There are opportunities there, Madam Deputy President, but we have to have the courage to seize them and make the most of them. Thank you, Senator Scar. If there are no other speakers. Senator Small. Deputy President, uh, we've heard a lot about accountability today, and this is a government that is accountable to the people that matter most, the, the Australian people that sent us here to not only uh, outline our plans before the election but to stand by them after the election. So we won't be lectured by a Labor Party that had a leader 
that very famously said there will be no carbon tax under a government I lead and promptly implemented uh, such a tax afterwards. So in terms uh, of addressing Small, the issue here Senator today— Senator Small, resume your seat, please, Senator Wong. I know Senator Small may not have noticed the matter we're debating, uh, but the matter relates to a failure by your government to table economic modelling. There is, it is not relevant for the senator to digress to a discussion about what occurred in, I think, 2010. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. So we're debating the order that was returned. Are you seeking a point of order, Senator McKenzie? Well, I would like to contribute to the fact that Senator Wong saying that uh, Senator, Senator Small. Uh, Senator McKenzie, are you on a point of order? If you're not, please resume your seat. Thank you. Please continue, Senator Small. Thank you, because uh, as you point out, Senator Wong, this debate is about accountability, and accountability to the Australian people matters more than any other. This is a government that protects jobs, keeps the lights on and keeps energy prices lower quarter on quarter on quarter. So our approach, which we, aligned, uh, we outlined to the Australian people before the last election, was emissions reduction through technology, not taxes, expanding consumer choice, not restricting it. We will achieve a net zero ambition for this country with incentives, not with penalties. We will partner with the private sector to bring a portfolio of low emission technologies to parity with their Order. current alternatives or better, and Order. consolidating our advantage in affordable and reliable energy Order, whilst being a credible, transparent government accountable to Australians for our progress. So our track record, which uh, is a matter small. of the public time record— for this debate has expired. Please resume your seat. Order, Senator Wong. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator Wong order. So the question is the motion moved by Senator Wong to take note of answers be agreed. Order. I am putting the motion. So the question is the motion is moved by Senator Wong to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We'll now move to taking note. Senator Watt. Thank you, <coughs> Madam Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator McKenzie to the questions asked by me. Uh, and Senator McKenzie, I highly recommend you stick around. Uh, I'll make it worth your while. The, um, well, the week is nearly over in Canberra, and this is a week where we have seen the National Party, the once proud National Party of Black Jack McEwen, a party that once had some principles, some spine, some real leaders that Senator Mackenzie has actually written about, uh, but is now represented in this parliament by a bunch of fakes. We've seen the Nationalist Party spending the entire week performing for the cameras, performing for the media uh, like a bunch of circus clowns. Uh, and achieving absolutely nothing again for the people of regional Australia. Has there ever been a bigger bunch of fakes in this Australian parliament than the current National Party representatives that we see here? These people in the National Party are such fakes that they make Milli Vanilli look like the definition of authentic. They are so utterly fake, so utterly fake, Senator Davey included, so utterly fake. Uh, in their fights for regional Australia uh, that we have seen play out over the course of this week. And what's it all about? It's about a plan that the Prime Minister has already stitched up with Barnaby Joyce on behalf of the National Party uh, to look like they are doing something about net zero emissions while actually doing absolutely nothing. And as I've said before this week, what we will see from this government at some point over the next week, before the Prime Minister goes to Glasgow, is a fake plan from a fake Prime Minister backed in by fake farmers and fake miners. It is completely and utterly fake. It will be a plan that will not be legislated because they can't even take it to the Coalition Party room. It will not be legislated. Uh, it will be signed up to by Barnaby Joyce, who has spent his entire political career opposing action on climate change. 
also signed by a Prime Minister who has spent his career opposing climate change action, and yet we are to believe that all of a sudden this Prime Minister has had this road to Damascus conversion and is now a greenie. Well, please, spare me. It is utterly fake. And what we have been able to put to the government in question time, this day, question time today is what real farmers and what real miners have to say about net zero emission. Because we've heard a lot from the folks in the National Party about their concern about the impact of net zero emissions on farming uh, communities and mining jobs. Uh, but what are actually what are real miners and what do real farmers have to say about net zero emissions? Well, we know that the National Farmers Federation for some time now has been committed to net zero emissions 2050 because they say that is the best way to avoid agricultural exporters uh, avoiding uh, the kind of uh, tariffs that we are going to see from our trading partners and because they understand that farmers, probably more than anyone, need to adjust to a changing climate. We've seen the president of the, of the NFF, Fiona Simpson, say that if the government doesn't sign up to net zero emissions by 2050, that will punish farmers. So that's what real farmers are having to say about this, along with Meat and Livestock Australia, who've actually gone further than the, than the NFF by committing their industry, the meat and livestock industry, to being car carbon neutral by 2030. So fake farmers. What, they, what, what, what real farmers have to say is that we need net zero emissions by 2050, and it's the fake farmers in the National Party who keep saying no. And similarly, what do real miners have to say about net zero emissions? Well, we've seen the Minerals Council of Australia commit to net zero emissions by 2050. We've seen BHP do it. We've seen Rio Tinto do it. And overnight, Rio Tinto has made an even more significant announcement about their commitment to reduce emissions. We've seen APIA, on behalf of the oil and gas industry, commit to net zero emissions, along with Santos, Origin, and almost every other resources company in this country. And why? Because they want to make money. They're not greenies. They want to make money. They want to create more jobs, and they know that the way they're going to do it in the resources industry is by committing to net zero emissions by 2050. So we see the real farmers support net zero, while we have the fake farmers in the National Party continuing to oppose it. We see the real miners in this community supporting net zero emissions, while the fake farmers in the National Party continue to oppose it. Now, this is not the first time that we've seen the National Party faking it. They fake it till they make it, every single day they come down here, because these are the people who claim that they care about regional jobs while doing nothing about labour hire and casualisation in mining communities. They do nothing about regional grants going to the cities. They do nothing about spending disaster management funding in regions, you, and they do what nothing about health care in the regions. They Senator Bragg. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy President. It's a uh, pleasure to uh, make some comments uh, about this uh, particular answer. And I think that was a very amusing performance from uh, Senator Watt. Uh, it's good to know what his definition of a fake farmer is. I have to say, I was, wasn't too sure. I, I mean, it's, look, um, you know, I spent most of my life in regional Australia, so I'm very interested in it. Uh, and it's good to hear the Labor Party is also interested in it because. Uh, there is no question that the, the, the changes that are going to occur in our economy over the next 20 to 30 years uh, will have a disproportionate impact on people living in regional Australia. So I welcome the opportunity to make a few remarks about that. Um, I, I mean, the compelling point is that the wall of money uh, has made up its mind. Uh, global capital markets uh, ultimately uh, will not fund fossil fuel investments um, over the long run. Uh, our customers in Asia, uh, their preferences will change, um, and that means that we must respond accordingly. Now, um, the benefit that will come to regional Australia from the transition will be significant. It will be significant in the mining sector. It will be significant in the farming sector. Uh, I actually think that a disproportionate impact, positive impact, could accrue to regional Australia as a result of this transition. Now, you think about the, the debate that we have about jobs, which I think is an entirely legitimate one. Uh, there are heavy industry jobs that are in the bush today, uh, in coal and other sectors. And over the long run, those will be replaced with other heavy industry jobs. Uh, there will be offshore wind. It will be hydrogen. Um, 
there'll be there'll be hydroelectric. Uh, these are just energy generating assets and investments that will provide heavy industry jobs in regional Australia. Uh, one of the first major offshore wind developments is in Gippsland in Victoria. And what you're seeing already uh, is workers who were in the coal industry and now working on that offshore wind project, uh, which, is, which are heavy industry, industry jobs. So that is, that is an important, important factor here. And look, the policy of our government will be to have a plan and a target to get to net zero by 2050. And I think that's good. Um, I think it's good to have a target. I think it's good that we can indicate to global capital markets where the country is heading. And I think it's positive that there will be a detailed plan on how that will occur. I think that is a positive thing. Um, I think you will see the, the heaviest amount of policy work that has been done on emissions reduction appear over the next few weeks in Australia ahead of the Glasgow conference. And the great beneficiaries of the bulk of the change over the long run could well be regional Australia. But we have to tell the truth. Uh, and I don't think we should be telling lies to the Australian people about the prospects for different industries over the long run. But it is a long transition. It is a long transition uh, over these next 25 to 30 years. Uh, uh, it doesn't surprise me that the Minerals Council and the Farmers Federation support net zero. It doesn't surprise me at all, because they see the opportunities. Uh, you'll see lithium mining, you'll see copper mining, you'll see carbon abatement services provided by farmers in regional Australia, uh, which could actually include us getting beyond net zero. I think Australia could become an exporter of carbon abatement services, given our large land mass. So I, I think leadership is about telling the truth and identifying pathways through difficult challenges. Uh, this has been an issue which has uh, been caught in a culture war for too long. I've never understood why this issue was part of a, a culture war. I think it's weird. Uh, I'm very pleased that we're coming out of that. Uh, and I think that's good for people who live in regional Australia because, frankly, it will be a, a very expensive transition. And the government is not going to be paying for the transition. Um, a large part of the transition will be coming from the private economy. That will be, and most of it will be foreign capital that will be needed to fund these huge investments. Um, and the people that are building the offshore wind facility in Gippsland um, are not Australian investors. Um, they're Copenhagen investment partners. Um, so like many of these developments across the country, we'll be relying on foreign capital, and that's why it's important that we give clear external signals about our direction on this policy. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Uh, Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much. And I rise to take note of the answer from the um, Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. And, and today um, you know, we have Senator Bragg's very plain, disconnected from the emotion con contribution to the debate. But this is an issue that actually matters to people. It's intimately entwined with their life. And there can be no clearer indication that the National Party stands for absolutely nothing have no real connection to the reality and is in terminal decline than the answers from the minister that we received today. The party that began as one that was by regional Australia and for regional Australia has become something else entirely. Detached from the major rural industries, many members of the current national party have become a party really of right-wing grievance, fighting culture wars instead of standing up for rural and regional Australians. It's a performance for some of them. Senator Canavan, a former KPMG and Productivity Commission economist and a political staffer, parades about in high vis like he's, never, he's, he, like he's worked a day or worked his whole life in a blue-collar industry. Not the truth. We even see George Christensen, the departing member for Dawson, spending more of his time on culture war crusades, appearing on far-right podcasts next to neo-Nazis at rallies and doing his utmost to under undermine Australia's vaccine drive. He does all of that rather than standing up and speaking up for rural and regional communities who can't get in to see a GP, who haven't got adequate housing, who have been described in this chamber 
this week by the Nationals as the most marginalised and poverty-stricken communities of this country. That's what 75 years of the Nationals have delivered, and they are absolutely failing at the moment. In the last three years, the National Party has had two members leave their party room to sit on the crossbench, one over its coup culture and its most recently uh, former uh, minister, Darren Chester, who slammed what he called an extreme right push in the party by certain members. Australia needs a government that has a plan to address climate change. And instead of a plan, we have had eight years of backstabbing and political infighting driven by this hard right rump of the party room. The Liberal National Coalition is a party at war with itself, and that is on display for everyone to see this week. The Nationals have no vision. They're disconnected from the reality of the lives of the people they purport to represent. Their myopic vision for Australia is for us to be an international pariah and to miss the opportunity to capitalise on a chance to reinvigorate our heavy industry sector with cheap green energy. But why? Why do they continue in this vein? Who do the nationals really stand for? Well, they don't stand for miners. As much as they come in here and bleat and moan to us that they actually do, they are new friends to the miners. They did not stand with them, and they have overseen rampant casualisation and the increase of insecure work for mining across this country. They don't stand for farmers either. Farmers are at the forefront of the fight against climate change. They live it every day. It affects their bank balance. It affects their family. It affects their community. They know better than anyone else what violent increases in weather events have done. There are stories on the Darling of people trying to pump water back into the river, using that precious <coughs> asset to try and save some of the fish deaths that were seen right across this country, taking money out of their pockets literally to put it in the environment to try and save, to try and save some of the fish in the environment that they care for. That's who the real farmers of Australia are intimately connected with the land that they work. Instead, we have here the National Party, who are increasingly dictated to by the echo chamber of far-right media outlets. And we have the National Party telling their voters an easy lie rather than the hard truth and attempting to prop up their moribund political party by fighting a desperate rearguard action against Australia's efforts to fight climate change. This National Party are out of step with the global community. They're out of step with their own supposed community in the regions of Australia. They are time-limited. They simply cannot connect themselves to a future for this country and for the people they claim to represent. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Your time has expired. Senator Small. Thanks, Deputy President. And we come in here today for another sermon and another lecture from the Labor Party about real farmers and fake farmers, real miners and fake miners. Now, notwithstanding that there's no such thing to the people of the Morrison government who understand that Australian industry is imperative to the hundreds of thousands, indeed millions, of Australians who depend on those industries for jobs, but we don't have the hide to say one thing before an election and then slap those same people with a big tax afterwards. Not just the carbon tax, which we discussed a little earlier today, but indeed the Labor Party, last time they were in government, was the party of the mining tax. So indeed the Morrison government and the senators here on this side of the chamber will not be lectured by the Labor Party on this as they pitch to defend themselves against attacks from Greens to the left on the political spectrum. They talk about being disconnected from the Australian people. Well, those same Australian people here sent us here at the last election because we stood by our plan for technology, not taxes, to not only lower Australia's emissions but allow Australia to export lower emissions technology to the entire world. Our track record on this speaks for itself. Uh, emissions 20.8 per cent below 2005 levels. We beat our Kyoto era target by 459 million tonnes. For context, that's the equivalent to taking every car in Australia off the road for a decade. We didn't do it with a carbon tax. We didn't do it with some surprise that we lobbed on the Australian people after the election, we did it with a clear plan and an ambition. 
And then we set about working in this place, partnering with industry, embracing technology to deliver it. And that is what people expect of a government here in Australia. That is what, when you're not disconnected from the Australian people, you understand. So whilst emissions are lower than at any year during the previous Labor government, they're also at the lowest levels since 1990. Now that matters to some people. But the thing that matters to Australian businesses out there, particularly those in the heavy manufacturing sector to which Senator O'Neill referred, is the power prices have in fact fallen for 10 consecutive quarters. Year on year, that's 19 months in a row of electricity price reductions here in Australia. 48 per cent lower uh, than, than the uh, sorry, um, 23 consecutive quarters of year on year increases in household prices was the track record of this government. So uh, the, the, the Labor government, I, I apologize. Our record, 10 consecutive quarters of year-on-year -year CPI reductions in retail power, the Labor Party's record, not only a carbon tax, not only a mining tax, but also 23 consecutive quarters year-on-year -year increases in household electricity costs, and they have the hide to come in here and lecture us. Well, the Australian people can see straight through that, and they understand that this is the same old Labor. Because recently we've seen the Labor Party put their dirty little secret out there into the public. Asked on Sunday by David Spears, Senator Gallagher has said, and I quote, we are looking at everything. That was in response to a direct question as Senator to whether Small, or not a carbon tax. Senator Small, I will remind you of the question. It was a question um, from Senator Watt to Senator McKenzie, and it was largely around net zero emissions by 2050, comments made by Fiona Sampson and the Mineral Councils of Australia. So you were on track, but you have well and truly strayed over the last <laughs> minute or so. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. And I'm delighted to return to talking about the Morrison government's plan to achieve net zero with technology, not taxes, because that is the ironclad guarantee that the Prime Minister has given the people of Australia. There is no plan. Uh, from the Morrison government that includes a carbon tax. Not only not a, a carbon tax, but in fact no penalties, because we have been clear with the Australian people that we will achieve net zero emissions with technology, not taxes, with choice, not constraint, with incentive, not penalty, and we will deliver it in partnership with the private sector. The private sector that generates the jobs that Australians depend on, the private sector that will export new energy technology to the world. That is what this government is about. So we are delighted to stand on our track record. We put our plans to the Australian people each election, and that is the accountability that matters. Before the next election, the Prime Minister has been clear that we will, in fact, have a very clear plan for the Australian people. It will be costed, it will be achievable, and it will be based on the outcomes that we have delivered. The Labor Party's plan which doesn't exist, includes a legislated target, which is a blank cheque. A blank cheque, a carbon tax on the table, and I think I know who the Australian people will trust. Thank you, Senator Small. Senator Ayres. Well, enough uh, from the junior burger from Bunbury. The um, Prime Senator Minister Ayres. said— Senator Ayres, I ask you to withdraw that I'll and refer that. to the centre by his correct name. The, 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 the Prime Minister said— the Prime Minister said if you have a go, he said, you'll get a go. Well, this is the Prime Minister's 21st go. He's 21st go over eight years at getting climate and energy policy right. And we're seeing the consequences, just like a kid who campaigns against the HSC for all of their period in high school and then suddenly starts studying for the exam in the last two days. This Prime Minister this coalition is falling apart at the Glasgow hurdle. And now we've got the Glasgow gaslighting show, a pantomime that's been constructed to try and get the Prime Minister through the next two weeks and then through to the election. It is the worst pantomime in Australian theatrical history with the least compelling cast. It has some problems, this shift to net zero from the Prime Minister. 
Like Mr Morrison, it is fake. Like Mr Morrison, it is a fraud. And like Mr Morrison, it is all marketing and no substance because he is a man who believes in nothing. There is zero credibility for this switch to net zero. And in the review of this pantomime, let's deal with problem one, the National Party. Plot credibility for this pantomime requires that they pretend to fight for some regional interest. So the farmers for the squatters and the pastoralists that's decayed and deteriorated to a bunch of jumped-up bunyip aristocracy who fight for property developers and real estate agents, water speculators and spivs, couldn't fight their way out of a wet paper bag. That's the problem. This whole plot rests on the idea that the National Party could fight, and they couldn't fight their way out of a wet paper bag. I wish we had some heavy hitters. There's no Reg Withers, there's no Doug Anthony, there's no Peter Nixon, there's no Ian Sinclair. When you look at them, when you look at them, what a bunch of pathetic specimens. Senator Canavan, he wouldn't make an impression on a feather bed. Former KPMG guy, former pseudo-economist, ministerial staffer dresses up in the high vis and puts the makeup on and pretends to be a coal miner. Senator Mackenzie, well, all we've seen is whinging and whining and backstabbing and leaking and moaning, but we haven't seen any fighting and we haven't seen any delivery. The best way you can assess future performance is, of course, past performance. And, of course, the only thing that we have seen for a policy proposal from this decaying carcass of a once great political party is Minister Pitt, who proposed a $250 billion line of credit, $10,000 for every man, woman and child in Australia of public money that would be allocated to an industry that doesn't want it. And Senator Canavan, who's got enough memory of Economics 101, told us that it would, have, it would have such a distortionary effect on the Australian economy that it would put up interest rates. And he said that was a good thing. Lifting mortgage costs, lifting business costs, pushing jobs overseas. Well, that's what we've had from the National Party. Problem two, of course, is the Prime Minister, who's a fraud, a phony, a fake. He wants to say one thing in Glasgow, another thing in Gunnedah, and something entirely different in Glen Waverley. He wants a credible position for Glasgow, and he wants to go and say something completely different in Gladstone. And then he'll sneak back to Sydney and try and convey to people in New South Wales that he's got a serious message on climate change in George's Hall. You can't spend 10 years sucking up to climate sceptics and science deniers and cranks and then expect that you can execute a complete U-turn on climate and energy policy. How many jobs has this cost? How much does it cost ordinary families? Well, this is a fraud, a phony you, and a fake, Ayers. and the it's been seen for what it is. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I move to take note of the answer by Minister Rustin to my question. Um, this week is anti-poverty week, and you would have thought that the government might have tried to sound a bit sympathetic this week to people who are caught up in the whirlpool of poverty. But no. Not only couldn't Minister Rustin bring herself to condemn the appalling words of former New South Wales Liberal Minister Prue Goward, Minister Rustin doubled down. Um. Oh, although saying that the government was very concerned about vulnerable people, when it came to the crunch, she could not even bring herself to state the bleeding obvious that the job seeker rate of $44 a day is totally in inadequate and it condemns people to be living abject lives of poverty. Balance, 
she said it was all about. Balance. We can't have income support that's too generous, otherwise people won't have the incentive to go out and get a job. Read, we have to make you desperate enough to try and get work that more than likely is going to be under, underpaid, more than likely is going to exploit you, more than likely is going to be totally insecure and or dangerous. That's what this balance is all about. I mean, her uncaring answer just made me furious. It reflected the uncaring brutality of this government that, frankly, do not care that over a million people are living in poverty in Australia. It made me furious, but I've got a well-paid job. And in listening to her answer, I wondered, I mean, how would people living in poverty on JobSeeker how would they feel about how their government feels about them? I mean, thinking about the people that I've recently spoken with, I've had the community affairs portfolio now since Senator Seawitt resigned for just over a month, and I've taken the opportunity to reach out to a whole lot of people, a whole lot of organisations and a whole lot of people. I'm thinking about Isabel. Isabel is a 26-year-old trans woman living in Brisbane on JobSeeker. I mean, she told me she lives in chronic pain, cannot spend lots of time standing, which makes it extremely difficult for her to work. She also lives with severe mental health issues, which have been exacerbated by stress and social isolation caused by relying on JobSeeker. And she told me that being on JobSeeker makes you feel like you're disgusting and reviled. If you can't pay a bill, people look at you like you've spat on their face. The narrative around JobSeeker is constructed in a way that tells people you want to be poor. And when I asked Isabel what it was like to find secure housing on the JobSeeker payment, she said that as a trans woman it was scary. She said that as a trans woman I need to be in a place where I'm safe from possible victimisation. I need to reduce my risk of victimisation. I need to find places I can afford, but places that are queer friendly. And she fears that if she ever had to move out of where she currently lives, there would be very limited options that are both safe and affordable. I mean, this is unacceptable. The answer to my question today was basically demonising people like Isabel by this government. Isabel should be able to find a safe place to live as a trans, a trans woman. And then when I asked Isabel what it was like receiving the COVID supplement last year when the job seeker rate was doubled, she said, when it started, the impact on my general well-being, essentially, at the same time as I was realising I was trans, it gave me the ability to get through a healthcare system that is not just institutionally gate-kept but also financially gate-kept. I had freedom. I didn't think they would drop us back into hell but they very slowly did over a few months. She told me, on $80 a day, realistically, I could probably fix my life. The distance from where I am now to where I need to be could be reduced, but on the, at the moment, on the current rate, it is unconquerable. It's people like Isabel that I really feel for, who on hearing Minister Ruston's answer to my question today would just felt like it was a kick in the guts, to just feel that this government is uncaring, brutally uncaring, does not have any empathy at all for what they are going through. Well, what I want to say to Isabel and the millions of people who are surviving in poverty on JobSeeker is, yep, this government is not listening. We've got to kick them out. But I hear you. The Greens hear you. We know that $44 a day is a pittance, and we know we need to raise the rate for good. And to do that, we are going to have to turf out this uncaring, heartless government out of office in order to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rice. The question before the chair is the Senate take note of the answer by Senator Ruston to the question of Senator Rice's. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Customs Amendment Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement Implementation Bill 2021 and a related bill. Resumption of the second reading debate. Minister. Uh, Mr Acting President, I would draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Uh, quorum. Quorum is uh, queried. Quorum, please.
Chief. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Minister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I thank all for their contributions to the debate of the Customs Amendment Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement Implementation Bill and the Customs Tariff Amendment Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement Implementation Bill. The signing of Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, or the RCEP, in November 2020 by Australia and 14 other countries signalled a shared commitment to opening up new trade and investment opportunities and also support for rules-based trading arrangements. Ratification of RCEP by the government would deliver significant benefits for Australia and for Australians. RCEP brings together in a single economic framework nine of Australia's top 15 trading partners that together account for nearly 60 per cent of our trade and about two-thirds of our exports. The amendments to the Customs Act and the related amendments to be made to the Customs Tariff Act are required to implement the RCEP agreement. These amendments provide the rules that allow importers to determine if their goods qualify for a preferential tariff treatment. This agreement will lock in market access and address non-tariff barriers, creating significant new trade and investment opportunities for Australia across the Indo-Pacific region. It will also establish rules that provide greater certainty and improve the business environment across the region. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, uh, Minister. The question before the Chair is that the uh, bill has been now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Sorry? You're requiring a division? The second reading yes. division on okay. RCEP, yes. Okay. Division is required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the bills be read a second time. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Smith Teller for the ayes and Senator McKim Teller for the noes. <laughs> Senator McKim, please. The result of the division is ayes 32, no 6. The question is resolved in the affirmative. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, oh, sorry, Senator Patrick. Just, just a very short uh, uh, committee stage, just to ask a couple of questions. And I will indicate that uh, I've spoken to um, the Greens and we, we, we don't intend to divide on the third reader. We might just state our positions, just so everyone can leave the chamber. Okay, well, Senator Patrick, you, you have the call. So my question is to, to the minister. Um, I just want to get an understanding of whether or not the department did carry out any modelling in relation to the economic benefits associated uh, with this uh, suite of uh, uh, or with, the, with the negotiations that have been uh, that have landed. Minister. Thank you. Um, Senator Patrick, the government hasn't done modelling on the RCEP. Economic modelling of trade agreements is only one tool, though, in the box of available tools to assess their economic benefits. Um, statistical and methodological limitations affect the accuracy of modelling the total impact of an FTA on the economy. Many of the benefits to Australia from participation in the RCEP are also difficult to quantify. These include benefits like deeper economic engagement, enhanced trade rules as a culture in the Indo-Pacific, strengthening Australia's trade relationship with our ASEAN partners, and contributing to an open, inclusive and resilient Indo-Pacific, which um, I'm sure, Senator Patrick, you would agree aligns with Australia's strategic interests. It would also be difficult for economic analysis to quantify the benefits to the Australian economy specifically from RCEP given the overlap that exists between RCEP and Australia's other multilateral and bilateral free trade agreements. It's difficult to precisely model the impact of changes to non-tariff barriers, trade facilitation measures, increased regulatory certainty and rules of origin. Statistics on international trade in services and investment flows are also incomplete, which can also affect the utility of modelling. Furthermore, outcomes in important areas such as services and trade facilitating rules don't lend themselves to economic modelling. 
We expect most of the impact of RCEP to be in areas such as market access for service providers and investors, improvements in governance and business environment in some of the developing countries in the RCEP, or improved access to regional value chains that result from RCEP's rules of origin. However, there is significant evidence that reducing barriers to Australian exports is going to be beneficial for Australia. The National Interest Analysis for RCEP, which was tabled in Parliament with the treaty text on the 18th of March 2021, supports the government's view that ratifying RCEP would be in the national interest. Senator Patrick. Yeah, look, I just want to thank the minister for a relatively comprehensive answer. I don't necessarily agree that we shouldn't model these things. Uh, but I do appreciate your answer, and that's the end of my questions. Chair. Thank you. In, in that case, the question is that the bills stand. Sorry. Um, the committee has considered. The committee has considered the Customs Amendment Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement Implementation Bill 2021 and a related bill, and has had agreed to them without amendments. Uh, In the minister. Report of the committee be adopted. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question before the chair is, is that the report of the committee be adopted. All those of that agreement say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, minister. Um, I move that the bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bills now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have uh, Senator Patrick. Yeah, just I uh, would like to uh, indicate my uh, that I would vote against this. Uh, Your vote will be recorded as such. And Senator Rice. I also to indicate that the Greens are recorded as voting against this. Okay. Uh, thank you very very much for that. Um, the uh, question is resolved in the affirmative. A clerk. Customs Amendment Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement Implementation Bill 2021, Customs Tariff Amendment Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement Implementation Bill 2021. Government Business Order of the Day number 3, Financial Sector Reform, Hain Royal Commission Response Better Advice Bill 2021, resumption of the second reading debate and on the amendment moved by Senator Gallagher. Thank you. And Senator Hanson remotely. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I rise to speak on the Financial Sector Reform, Hain Royal Commission Response Better Advice Bill 2021. The primary purpose of the Hain Royal Commission was to look at the banks, but a considerable part of its focus ended up squarely on the financial advisory sector. With this legislation, the government seeks to place more responsibility and liability on financial advisory services but under the government's National Consumer Credit Legislation, Schedule 1. The banks would have absolutely no responsibility if the government amendments were to proceed. Is it because the banks make large donations to the major political parties that they are being protected? Oh, I'm only thinking out loud. I have made it clear to both the government and public at large that I would never support legislation that would absolve the banks of any responsibility for their actions. And yet, here we have the government under this bill imposing strict liability clauses while waiving the normal standard of the presumption of innocence. While I agree with the scope of this bill, it should be amended to remove strict liability clauses so the presumption of innocence is maintained as recommended by the Standing Committee on the, security, on the scrutiny of bills in its inquiry. Furthermore, the strict liability that imposes a reversal of the onus of proof for offences which are minor in comparison to what all Australians have witnessed with breaches of responsibility by Australian banks. Surely all senators must see the contradiction between these bills and the disparity of the liability on both sectors. 
presumption of innocence is one of the essential foundations of a fair judiciary in a representative democracy. Strict liability would essentially place the onus of proof on the defendant, effectively presuming guilt. Despite the committee's recommendation, all of its members in this chamber are not acting to implement it. They're not acting on their own recommendations. It doesn't make sense. It isn't remotely logical. Such is the nature of politics in this place and the reason that public trust in the financial sector and government is abysmally low or non-existent. One Nation also called on the government for the insertion of a clause for requiring that the one-size-fits-all course for financial advisers and stockbrokers provided by the Financial Advisor Standards and Ethics Authority be, waived, be varied to ensure they cater for these two very different disciplines. Therefore, I would now call on the government to ensure that ASIC, as the responsible authority, addresses this disparity in its regulations currently released for comment. There should be separate courses, ensuring those who undertake them are suitably qualified for these different roles. It's just not fit for purpose when a structure when a stockbroker is being tested on providing advice about social service security, as an example. In considering this legislation, I think it's important to highlight some of the findings of the Royal Commission. These findings confirmed what many Australians already knew. Quite a few financial advisers were in it for themselves and certainly not in it for anyone else. As the old saying goes, if you can't be part of the solution, at least you can still make a lot of money by being part of the problem. That's why the findings were not at all surprising to the many Australians sacrificed on the altar of profit. Firstly, the Royal Commission observed that in almost every case it, ex it examined, the conduct in question was primarily driven by individuals' pursuit of gain. Sales became all important those who dealt with customers became sellers, and the confusion of roles extended well beyond frontline service staff. Advisors became sellers, and sellers became advisors. Service to, service to customers took second place. Secondly, entities and individuals acted this way because they could. Consumers had little in the way of informed choice and this created a very uneven playing field. Third, consumers often dealt with the financial services entity through the intermediary. They would understandably believe that intermediary was acting in their interest, when all too often intermediaries were paid to act in the interest of the provider of the service or product. Legislation requires these conflicts of interest to be managed, but all too often they were resolved in favour of the provider. As the final report noted, an intermediary who seeks to stand in more than one canoe cannot. And finally, the Royal Commission observed that too often financial services entities which broke the law were not properly held to account. State, misconduct will be deterred only if entities believe that misconduct will be detected, denounced and justly punished. Misconduct that yields profit is not deterred by requiring those who are found to have done wrong to do no more than pay compensation. And wrongdoing is not denounced by issuing a media release. I think the final report nailed it when it said, the Australian community respects and is entitled to expect that if an entity breaks the law and causes damage to customers, it will compensate those affected customers. But the community also expects that financial services entities that break the law will also be held to account. The community recognises and the community expects its regulators to recognise that these are two different steps. Having a wrongdoer compensate those harmed is one thing. 
holding wrongdoers to account is another. Senators will ignore this message only at great peril. This legislation attempts to implement the government's response to recommendation 2.10 of the Royal Commission to establish a new disciplinary system for financial advisers and provide for a single central disciplinary body. The government says this will involve expanding the financial services and credit panel within the Australian Securities and Investments Commission to operate as the single body and ensure less serious misconduct does go, doesn't go unaddressed, creating new penalties and sanctions, introducing a new registration system to improve transparency and accountability, and transferring functions from the Financial Advisor Standards and Ethics Authority to the Minister and ASIC. With the amendments I have outlined, One Nation is prepared to support the legislation. Financial sector reform is absolutely critical to meet the community's expectations. This government must ensure accountability and transparency in the financial sector, services sector, and while equally, it should do so in the banking sector. It's not only in the interest of everyday Australians, but in the interests of the financial sector itself. I call on senators to seriously consider supporting my amendments to make this a better piece of legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Sheldon. Well, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Financial Sector Reform Commission response, the Better Advice Bill 2021. The bill implements recommendation 2.10 uh, of the Hain Royal Commission, which recommended that a single disciplinary body be established for financial advisers. And Labor supports this bill. This bill has been reviewed by the Senate Economics Legislative Committee, and I support the comments made by Senators Chisholm and Walsh in the committee's report, which calls on the government to strongly consider the views of consumer advocates and to consider, and I quote, appointing representatives with appropriate consumer experience and sectorial knowledge to the financial services and credit panel. But, of course, Labor still does support this bill. Indeed, Labor has been very clear that we seek rapidly to progress any legislation that appropriately implements the findings of the Hailing Royal Commission. Unfortunately, this enthusiasm has not been shared by the Morrison government. The Prime Minister infamously voted against a royal commission into the banks 26 times. 26 times. Now, we know that the Prime Minister hates nothing more than being held accountable for his decisions, and he was determined to extend the same courtesy to the big banks, who were found to have engaged in shocking behaviour, ripping off and rorting thousands of Australians, some of the rorting would almost make the Morrison government blush, almost. This is how widespread the rot is in the financial services sector. And the Prime Minister voted against a Royal Commission in that industry 26 times, on 26 separate occasions. And it's very fortunate for the thousands of victims of this exploitation around Australia that Labor and the crossbench were so determined to bring the Royal Commission about. While we were pushing for a Royal Commission, Mr Morrison was going on television and saying, I quote, it's nothing more than a populist whinge. In another interview, he called it, I quote, a reckless distraction. Now, that is very strong language by the Prime Minister. I have never heard him use that sort of language to support hardworking Australians when they're under attack, such as the 2,000 workers whose jobs were outsourced by Qantas last year, while Qantas was receiving $2 billion in taxpayers' money from the Prime Minister to keep them employed. The Prime, Minister, the Prime Minister hasn't lifted a finger to support them. And even after he won their landmark case against Qantas in the federal court earlier this year, and even though many of those Qantas workers live in his own electorate of Cook, it really goes to show what side the Prime Minister is on. If you're an outsourced Qantas worker, you get nothing from Mr Morrison. 
You don't even get access to the latest aviation support the government has announced. The only goes to direct airline employees. But if you're the CEO of the Commonwealth Bank, you're in luck. Mr Morrison will go to bat for you. So let's remind Mr Morrison about the Royal Commission actually discovered was happening in this sector. Here is what some called the populist uh, whinge, as Mr Morrison referred to, actually revealed. The corporate regulator, ASIC, revealed 90 per cent of financial advisers who provide advice to self-managed superannuation funds had failed to comply with the best interests of their clients—90 per cent. Some of the largest companies in Australia, Commonwealth Bank, NAB and AMP, Westpac, had continued to charge clients for advice and life insurance after they had died. AMP alone admitted to continuing to charge life insurance premiums to more than 4,600 of their dead customers. There were widespread reports of fees for no service, not just to the dead, but also to the living. The big banks were forced to pay over $1.2 billion in compensation for fees for no service. The Commission heard that the NAB's introducer program had paid out exorbitant sums of money to accountants, tailors and gym owners to push in their clients into unsuitable home loans. One introducer who worked as a tailor had successfully pushed his clients into $122 million worth of home loans and reaped $488,000 in fees. The Commonwealth Bank admitted to offering repeated credit card limit increases to a customer who was begging them to stop because he had a gambling addiction and was already $30,000 in debt. The Commonwealth Bank also admitted to selling credit card insurance to 60,000 ineligible unemployed customers. Insurance giant Allianz admitted it had sold junk insurance to 68,000 Australians. That is insurance that provided little or, little or no actual benefit. Now, Allianz wasn't alone. IAG also sold junk insurance to 68,000 people as well. Suncorp sold junk insurance to more than 41,000 people. And QBE sold junk insurance to more than 35,000 people. One of the biggest life insurance companies in Australia, TAL, abruptly stopped paying insurance to a woman with cervical cancer because TAL discovered she had sought help for, com for completely unrelated mental health issues years before her cancer diagnosis. AXS listed Freedom Insurance was exposed for cold calling and selling a 26-year-old man with Down syndrome more than $100,000 in life insurance. When the man's father complained, Freedom staff ridiculed him and called him a whinger. That same company was also exposed to hang on to customers when they tried to cancel insurance policies. The Commission has heard about how banks have ripped off small businesses, particularly in regional Australia. ANZ Bank threatened one farming couple with bankruptcy if they didn't sell their sheep, farm and home to come up with $300,000 within eight days, just eight days. And the Commission heard about the disgraceful exploitation of Indigenous Australians by funeral insurance companies. Some families were paying for four or five different funeral insurance policies at a time without their consent or knowledge. These are just a few of the disgraceful stories that came to light through the Banking Royal Commission. The Commission, Mr Morrison, voted against 26 times. The Morrison government could have redeemed itself by quickly implementing the Commissioner's 76 recommendations. But two and a half years after that final report, was handed down just 27 of the 76 recommendations have been implemented. That is just 36 per cent. That is a falling, failing grade in any marking system. If the Morrison government were implementing the Royal Commission recommendations any slower, you could mistake it for their vaccine rollout. If you open up Commissioner Hayne's report and start counting through the recommendations, it doesn't take long to find where the Morrison government lost interest 
Recommendation 1.1, literally the first recommendation, the most basic and fundamental recommendation to come out of the Royal Commission. Recommendation 1.1 said that the government should not water down responsible lending obligations on the banks. And what has the government done? It has introduced a bill to do exactly that. The National Consumer Credit Protection Amendment Supporting Economic Recovery Bill 2020. And it has already passed through the House. It has been lingering on, lingering on the Senate notice paper for months like a bad smell. When the government issued its official response to the Royal Commission, the Treasurer said, and I quote, we commit to taking action on all 76 Royal Commission recommendations and in a number of key areas going further. The Treasurer's press release goes on to say, and I quote, by the end of 2020, remaining Royal Commission recommendations requiring legislation will have been introduced. Now that deadline was 18 months ago, and we've barely scratched the surface. The truth is that the government had had it, never had any intention of implementing most of these recommendations. We know Mr Morrison did not want this Royal Commission. He voted against it 26 times. And we know now that Mr Morrison did not want to implement its recommendations. But why, why does Morrison not want to hold the banks to account? Well, firstly, because if Mr Morrison began holding the banks accountable for their actions, where will it end? The Prime Minister would risk creating an expectation that the rich and powerful in Australia can be held to account. And that would end up coming right back to Mr Morrison's own door. There's another reason the Morrison government won't hold the banks to account. It's because the Morrison government is so close to the big bank lobbyists that they even elected one to the Senate. The, Senate for, the senator for the Financial Services Council, Senator Bragg. Senator Bragg worked at the lobbying group for the financial services industry, the Financial Services Council, for eight years, from 2009 to 2017. So while Mr Morrison was voting against the Royal Commission and calling it a populist whinge in August 2016, Senator Bragg was working as Director of Policy for the Nine Financial Services Council. And now they are in government together. The foxes are well and truly in the henhouse. The only part of the financial services sector that we know that the Morrison government is interested in fighting is industry super funds, which happens to be one part of the financial services sector that came out of the Royal Commission with reputation largely intact. Industry super funds return all profits to their members. They perform better on average. They have lower fees. They have no, not engaged in the sort of disgraceful conduct discovered, uncovered by the Royal Commission. And yet, time and time again, the government introduces bills to try and lure more unsuspecting Australians into the retail super shark tank. None other than the Financial Services Council lobbyist himself, Senator Bragg. When trust in democracy and the trust in parliament is at an all-time low in Australia, this really sums it all up. And of course, who's the chief, you know, the chief attack dog on industry super? Senator Bragg. We have a government that never wanted a royal commission into misconduct by the most powerful companies in Australia, the big banks. When they were finally forced into setting, setting it up, they pretended to accept all the recommendations and only actually implemented 36 per cent of them. And then to cover this all up, they brought the lobbyists for those financial institutions, Senator Bragg, into the Senate. And then the government used the Senator Bragg to attack the one part of the financial services sector that was shown to be doing the right thing, industry super funds. In August, the government quietly dropped new regulations to mislead more Australians into higher fee retail, retail funds. According to this new regulations, super funds will only be assessed on the administrative fee, administration fee they charged in the most recent financial year. The performance test was originally based on average fee charged over the past eight years. So this is beyond an absolute joke. This new performance testing laws was only passed through the Senate a few months ago. And in the space of a month, the government passed a regulation to completely change how the performance testing is conducted. 
by ignoring the fees that high fee retail funds have charged over the last eight years, retail, retail funds will be able to misrepresent the returns they have delivered. The government knows this is a complete misrepresentation. That's why they didn't include it in the legislation that was passed in parliament. They waited a few weeks and snuck into it regulation instead, snuck into regulation instead. This government is not on, this, not on the side of any Australian seeking the best returns for their super money. This government is not on the side of any Australian who wants a fair and equitable relationship with their bank. This is a government which hires bank lobbyists as senators and voted 26 times against the Royal Commission. So setting aside for a moment the 49 Royal Commission recommendations, which are being left to wither and die on the vine, Labor supports this bill. This bill, unfortunately, implements just one recommendation of the Royal Commission. It's a shame it has taken so long, and this is just one of the many overdue recommendations. I also note and support Senator Gallagher's amendment that the Senate notes the government's failure to act on the recommendations more broadly, and Senator Patrick's amendment to require the government to show the Senate its draft regulations before this bill is passed. We have already seen with your future, your super laws, that this government will sneak in despicable regulations whenever it can. And I urge the Morrison government to stand up and hold the hose this time and clean up the banking and financial services sector, not continually to lay doggo on it. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Patrick. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much. And I rise to make a brief uh, contribution uh, to this bill. <clears throat> I just uh, would like to indicate to the chamber <clears throat> that I won't be reading my second reading, uh, moving my second reading amendment, because in actual fact uh, the, the purpose of the second reading amendment was to refer the bill back to committee because the regulations had not been tabled and uh, they, they have now been uh, made available. Uh, but I, uh, I just wanted to make a comment to say uh, thank you to the Senate for standing up. Uh, I know that the Senate had indicated uh, <clears throat> through the WHIPS system, or at least through the, the system we all know that takes place in the back rooms of, of this building, uh, indicating whether or not uh, uh, there is support for uh, a, <clears throat> an amendment such as the one that I made. Uh, the government knew that I had the numbers and uh, then uh, dropped the bill from the list and have gone away and they've uh, produced the regulations. Um, my office has now had some further consultation with the industry there, in fact, and, and indeed with Senator Hume's office. And uh, look, there's been a little bit of argy-bargy and uh, uh, there are some things that I would have liked to have changed further. Uh, I accept I don't have the numbers on those. so. Um, in, ultimately, I will end up uh, supporting the bill. Not uh, not perfect, but I won't let uh, that be the uh, enemy of the good. Just in general, I'd like to say again thank you to the Senate. Um, the, when I made my dissenting report uh, to uh, the committee, um, uh, it was really based around the principle that it is uh, under our constitution, the first, uh, first provision in our constitution, the responsibility of the parliament to make the laws. And uh, whilst regulations have a place, it's, it's not proper to, for uh, someone to uh, walk into this chamber and dump down half law to only provide half the picture because often the detail, the devil is in the detail of the regulations. And uh, um, by indicating support for my second reading uh, speech, what, we, what the Senate has done has forced the government to, to do the right thing. And that's, uh, that's a good thing. And I might just encourage senators that, uh, um, you know, that that probably sends a signal to the government for all future bills that the Senate is at least willing to delay things until such time as uh, the regulations are, uh, are tabled with the bill. And so I guess I, uh, my advisers are now for, uh, forewarned uh, of the fact that if uh, regulations aren't tabled with a bill, I'll re uh, I will automatically uh, move uh, a similar second reader and the minister will have to take a pot shot as to whether or not the, uh, the bill will, will then progress through the, the chamber. So that's a really, really good thing. 
And I just would ask that maybe the senators would consider this in relation to things like referrals to the Privileges Committee, um, the insistence upon uh, compliance with orders of the Senate, the, uh, the, the uh, um, proper answering of questions by officials before the Senate. Uh, we're in a unique situation where you know, our, our boss is, is, is the Australian public. Now, we're at the very, very top of the chain, and so unlike other um, uh, bodies where there's someone you know, looking over saying, no, no, you've got to do things in a particular way, it's up to us. And uh, if we stand firm on things, then we will get a much, much better process uh, occurring. If we stand firm on things, we'll get much better answers. Uh, and so I'm hopeful that uh, when the Privileges Committee considers some of the uh, matters that are before it, uh, it recognises that when the Senate stands together, will actually change the way in which others treat us in this building. And unless we stand together, unless we uh, stand up and make uh, a point, take a stand, then uh, we, we leave ourselves at the mercy of poor process, poor, poor answers, and that doesn't help us with our oversight. Uh, thank you, Minister, for tabling the regulations, uh, and I will be supporting the bill. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the uh, Financial Sector Reform Hain Royal Commission Response Better Advice Bill of 2021. Um, and I note the contribution of my colleague um, in this chamber for the Labor Party uh, here in the Senate, uh, Senator Sheldon, who I think gave a very fine and detailed contribution to the debate about this bill uh, just prior to Senator Patrick's contribution. And for those who are interested in really what's going on and, and the, the great shame of the government's failure to properly respond to the Royal Hain Commission, um, I, I urge you to review Senator Sheldon's words. Uh, in fact, when we look at this title, the Hain Royal Commission Response Better Advice Bill 2021, it's like um, window dressing you know, at a shop and you go inside and it really hasn't got anything that you want to buy. This should be called the one tiny recommendation change from a whole lot of work that hasn't got done by the government around the Hain Royal Commission, despite the fact that they promised you that they would accept it all. That should be what it's titled, because that would be telling the truth. Now, those of you who are in the chamber and in the local community will absolutely know of my long interest in the financial planning industry and the financial services sector and the sustainability of that financial planning industry and its continued operation. However, I'm continually troubled by reports from my contacts in the sector that the regulations are not promoting an ethical and transparent industry. Rather, this government's poor consultation and ignorance of the nuances in final financial planning has meant that advisor numbers have fallen by nearly a third in the last few years. The industry is withering on the vine. And I want to acknowledge um, early work done by Senator Fawcett uh, when he was the chair of the Corporations and Financial Services Committee, uh, and I was very pleased to um, work with him on that committee and deliver a, a bit of a roadmap of how things could roll out. Unfortunately, the care in the rollout wasn't taken by this government, who turned its attention to things like rorts and getting itself re-elected over actually serving the Australian people. And the consequences are what we see today. This broken industry of vital importance to Australians' financial well-being. The Hain Royal Commission, and people can remember it, rocked the entire Australian financial industry to its core, and it ushered in some much-needed and long-overdue changes. It held many white-collar criminals accountable, and it sent a clear message to the industry that practices like overcharging or fees for no service are unacceptable and they will not be tolerated. And that was the, the mega message. You can't charge money for nothing. That was it in a nutshell. However, the best intentions are often not followed through by this government, who have failed to ensure action was taken and deliver appropriate regulation. And this has certainly been the case that's impacted on uh, the financial services providers, the financial advisers who provide such important um, guidance to Australians who want to uh, grow their wealth and manage their finances in a way that gives them 
the best sense of having independence, particularly as they age. I'm hearing very troubling stories of advisor suicides, and I uh, don't say that lightly. And I urge anybody who is triggered by me mentioning that to, to seek advice from Lifeline or any of the other great institutions that provide support in our community, uh, such as the Black Dog Institute. Um, but I am very concerned to hear that people who were running successful businesses have become so despairing of a capacity to run their business that they've seen no way forward. And they tell me also of the ongoing impact of the requirement to pay ASIC payments that are invoiced after the fact, at the end of their year of work, um, and it's really impacting those businesses very significantly. And I can hear noises coming from uh, Senator Hume is here, and I do know that there have been some announcements by the government, but everyone in Australia knows that announcements by the government and action by the government are two very, very different things. So there is a slowly diminishing pool of advisers, and that is further increasing the costs. The Australian Financial Review now predicts that the costs of receiving financial advice have risen 12 per cent in the last year due to a patchwork of poor regulation from a government that says it understands business and actually is good at managing your money, but is proving itself to be absolutely not in line with that articulation of its own version of itself. As reported to me by a local Central Coast advisor, if the government were looking to destroy a profession, drive up fees and push out any non-institutional advice firm, they couldn't have done a better job. We must look towards regulating this industry in a fit-for-purpose manner. Now, that's a voice from the industry itself that has been willing to speak to the government, has been waiting to speak to the government, has been wanting to speak to the government for three years and got the big fend. The big hand says, you know, don't talk to me. And that's the problem. This government is more interested in its own survival than the survival of hard-working Australian business people and the jobs that they provide for our community. The bill, as it sits before us, implements one recommendation, as Senator uh, Sheldon very clearly outlined, just one recommendation. That's 2.10 of the Hain Royal Commission by establishing a single discipline body for financial advisers and legislating the requirement that all financial advisers who provide personal financial advice to retail clients be registered. It also implements uh, Recommendation 7.1 of the Tax Practitioners Review Board, uh, sorry, Board Review, which uh, recommended that a new model be developed for regulating tax uh, financial advisers in alignment with implementation of Recommendation 2.10 of the Financial Services Royal Commission Final Report. The bill is also going to wind up um, FASIA and transfer its functions to the Financial Services and Credit Panel within ASIC to streamline regulation and ensure that all cases of misconduct are dealt with. It also creates new penalties and sanctions for financial advisers who breach their obligations under the Corporations Act, as well as a new registration system for advisers. Now, this regulation was recommended by the Hain Royal Commission after it found that the financial advice sector lacked an appropriate regime for dealing with professional misconduct. So basically it was like a cowboy's, a cowboy's club. You know, you could get away with doing anything. No one was watching. And it fed on itself and competed with itself in a race to the bottom in terms of service provision. The Royal Commission identified a need to streamline all complaints into a one-stop shop rather than the multitude of avenues previously in place and to introduce less severe penalties to deal with minor events. And As ASIC had only investigated and punished serious complaints due to the top heavy penalties available to it. And there you have the reveal of a government that doesn't do its day job properly. Right? It shows up, collects you know, the pay on the way through, uh, comes in to govern as little as possible and just lets the market rip. Even when it's given guidelines and recommendations by its own committees, committees of the Senate, committees of the House, um, experts who want to talk to it, they, they just ignore so much of the really hard work that has to be done and show up for power's sake only. 
Now, I support the implementation of the regulations that are proposed here because for too long malicious financial advisers had engaged in the worst kind of rent-seeking behaviours. Fees for no service, grandfather commissions, in-house product sales that posed as independent advice from planners locked into dealer networks. The Royal Commission revealed that in 2018 roughly 65 per cent of the financial advisers didn't hold a relevant university degree and that the culture uh, was a culture of ensuring revenue before ensuring service. Commissioner Hayne described it as the, th the three most common types of misconduct, and I thought this was very pithy and absolutely accurate. Selling what you can't deliver, selling what you won't deliver, and selling what you don't deliver. That was the practice. That was the practice described by um, Commissioner Hayne into what was going on in the financial services sector. The power imbalance between planners and the dealers group network by which a large financial institution would hold an AFSL and registered planners has come under scrutiny during and after the Royal Commission, particularly regarding the AMP advisers who were profoundly affected by a buyer of last resort catastrophe with AMP. As with franchisees and franchisors, a non-unionised worker and, and a boss, the power imbalance between those two entities resulted in terrible consequences for smaller players and incredible profits for big banks that got, got, you know, got themselves at AFSL and then just brought all these young, uh, inexperienced people with no qualifications in and started trotting them out as financial advisors, some of them with only eight hours online training sent out to take people's entire life savings into their hands and direct it in a pathway that was for the benefit of the banks well farms rather than the benefit of the consumers. Um, with regard to the ASIC levy, on paper it sounds like a great reform, charging financial institutions to, uh, a levy to pay for investigations into malfeasance. But most of the large financial institu institutions, the banks, were the ones who the Royal Commission found were responsible for the type of pay behaviour I just described. Most of the malfeasance um, was theirs, but they rapidly exited the market and exempted themselves from the levy. That left the levy to be paid by the remaining advisers, the decent ones who were still hanging around, lots of them small and medium businesses, and subsequently the costs have been borne by them and risen exponentially. This year it's predicted to rise another 30 per cent, and even the most diligent and careful advisers are being billed for it. Um, small and independent financial advice sectors have been devastated by the government's changes and poor implementation. Um, of the Royal Commission recommendations, and the FASIA exams have been described to me as appalling and irrelevant to the financial services industry despite their good intent and their dire need. Um, there were roughly 28,000 financial advisers, now 19,000, expected more and more of them to fall. ASIC had reported that 6,500 um, left the industry, but only 163 had joined. The big four banks have all retreated from the wealth market um, the wealth management market, and they've jettisoned their advisory arms. And while I support a more independent network that's more agile and less dependent on big financial institutions, this move only reinforces that many financial institutions no longer see the sector as profitable without a large portion of them selling their in-house product for their profit or corrupt and exploitative practices that were exposed during the uh, commission. The bill isn't a panacea. It doesn't fix or resolve the current issues that threaten the sustainability of the Australian financial planning sector. It does propose some noble and needed reforms uh, that will make the sector stronger and more ethical, but it shouldn't stop here. The government can't just wash its hands of the financial planning sector. It needs to actually listen to the financial part planners and adjust the reform package to make the industry more viable. And I particularly want to draw the attention, seeing as we've been talking about regional Australia, and I do live in a region of Australia outside a major city. I know what it's like when your kids can't ever get a bus to work because there's no public transport system, where jobs are hard to come by and they're very insecure, where wages are less than you get in the cities, where we are often overlooked by this government and conveniently on the central coast joined into and out of Greater Sydney at the will of the state government. I live in one of those regional areas and I travel around this wide state very, very frequently. Businesses that were vital, financial planning visitors, businesses vital in places like Dubbo and Albury and Wagga Wagga 
They all got caught up in this. They did not get proper representation by the national members that they sent to this parliament. Their voices weren't heard, and the services that they provided have disappeared. The jobs that they created and provided have disappeared. It's not good enough. This is not a government. This is not a government that looks after small businesses. It is not a government that understands wealth creation for Australians. Because if they did, they would have done a much better job in the eight years that they've been in than this single amendment at this stage. Thank you. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Mariel Smith, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I also rise today to make a short contribution on the Financial Sector Reform Hain Royal Commission Response Better Advice Bill. And before I begin, I just wanted to associate myself with the remarks of Senator O'Neill and acknowledge Senator O'Neill's incredible advocacy and thoughtful work in this area. She has been a true champion of reform here. A uh, few people understand the details better than Senator O'Neill, so I do want to associate myself with her remarks. The Hain Royal Commission made it absolutely clear that the Australian financial industry on too many occasions had failed to adequately serve its customers and in far too many cases operated against the best interests of customers. The Royal Commission rocked Australia as we knew it would. That's why we called for it. We knew how critical it was that the Royal Commission investigated these issues. And we knew that consumers and businesses were being impacted by the unscrupulous conduct of actors in this space. They were telling the government this loudly and clearly, and the government ignored them. 26 times they voted against establishing a royal commission. They only capitulated because of pressure from their own bank bench, but 26 times they voted against this. We saw dud efforts at reform, which didn't work as they tried to protect an industry which desperately needed scrutiny from that scrutiny. It's been nearly three years now since Commissioner Hain handed down his report to the government and frustratingly, the response has been on the go slow. We are still dealing with legislation to deal with individual recommendations contained in this report. And indeed, as Senator Sheldon said, this bill just deals with one, with just one. It is classic Prime Minister Morrison, too little, too late. Dragged there too late because he did not care. He did not care 26 times voting against this. The government put protecting Australian consumers on the back burner and dithered in implementing these reforms just like they dithered in having the Royal Commission. And failing to tackle these reforms head on urgently has real world consequences for families. This kind of acting in this space, that these behaviours when families were being ripped off by financial advisors and institutions, tears apart lives. It takes homes away. It takes futures away. It crushes dignity and security in retirement when institutions fail to act in the best interests of their customers. And the consequences are devastating, not just for individual consumers, but for businesses. Small and medium enterprises who take on risk based on advice, who rely on this advice who rely on honesty and accuracy in their dealings with these institutions. And when these interests aren't protected and those businesses fail, of course, it's not just the operators of these businesses who suffer, but the employees who work in them, the employees who rely on these businesses to be successful because that's how they get their job. That's how they pick up their pay packet at the end of the week as well. We believe that Australian families and businesses should be able to access financial services and advice confident that the law protects them from being taken for granted by bad actors. And we knew this was happening for a long time. That's why we needed the Royal Commission. That's why we called for it. That's why we fought for it. And I'll make the point here that good financial advice really matters. Good financial advice for families can be the difference on delivering their aspirations to them. It can be the difference of delivering financial security, the difference of delivering dignity and retirement, security and retirement. It can be the difference between a family being able to own their own home or not. Advice needs to be high quality. It needs to be high quality, it needs to be accessible and it needs to be affordable. And this is the challenge for government, for regulators. So we don't have a situation which we've seen where customers are getting costed out of getting advice, costed out of the support they need. And to those in the industry struggling, as, as, Denet, as Senator O'Neill acknowledged, I want to acknowledge you too. I want to acknowledge the impacts of this government's delay and dithering and dud efforts of reform on your industry and on your work. Those experienced financial advisors who we know do the right thing by their clients deserve clarity, not uncertainty, not unnecessary costs. 
We need to get this right. We need to get it right for consumers. We need to get it right for those people who have suffered at the hands of unscrupulous actors. We need to get it right for industry to make sure that it's working. We need regulation that is fit for purpose and that gets this balance right. The Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, has always, always stumped up with too little too late. We've seen it in the pandemic response. We've seen it on climate change. We've seen it on aged care. We see it on early education and care. And we see it clearly, crystal clearly, on this important area of financial sector reform. Never forget, he voted against this Royal Commission 26 times. This critical work, which exposed horrific stories, horrific stories for consumers and businesses. I'm pleased this legislation deals with one of those recommendations. It goes part of the way to getting there, but there is more we need to do to be supporting this sector, to be supporting Australian consumers, and make sure that there's a genuine listening to the calls of those who presented to the Royal Commission, those who have suffered. This is urgent reform work, and please get on with it. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Like other Australians, I have had an absolute gutful of wrongdoing in the financial sector. Wrongdoing that could have been abated with a Royal Commission that had been instigated in a timely fashion, instead of this government having voted against it some 26 times. I have seen the very real and tangible losses, uh, absolutely devastating lives, and the tale of that continues to drag on because of this government's failings. Labor's Future of Financial Advice Reforms, or FOFA, which would have required and which required an annual opt-in to commit to commission so that people couldn't simply have money taken out of their accounts without their knowing, was opposed by the Liberal Party year after year. Senator Bragg, who considers himself an expert in these matters, finally confessed that the Liberals had done the wrong thing in opposing it. And their opposition to the Royal Commission demonstrates that for too long we've had a government that's been in the pockets of the financial services industry. This long-awaited bill implements recommendations of the Hain Royal Commission as well as the Tax Practitioners Board Review Final Report. We know we need laws that have a proper framework for disciplinary systems for financial advisers. The previous system failed us manifestly. And finally, we have before us a system that requires financial advisers to provide, that provide financial advice to cl retail clients to be registered. I've seen the dire consequences of a lack of registration in terms of those who uh, have access to um, tribunals like AFCA and whether they will or won't uh, get a hearing and whether they will or won't get compensation. And yet we see uh, in the minds of consumers uh, the difficulties that they have, particularly in the background uh, while uh, the Royal Commission was being called for. As I think about uh, the victims of the sterling financial collapse, they heard in the background they heard in the background, we can't trust financial systems. We can't trust uh, the government. We can't trust what's going on. So I'm going to opt for this particular scheme because it looks like it's going to be bankable and it's guaranteed. Well, in actual fact, as we know, those are the very kinds of schemes that needed uh, ironclad regulation, that needed, uh, that needed the oversight of government, effective oversight of government to prevent their losses. It's really quite telling when you uh, listen to people who've been affected by uh, bad financial advice, uh, the way they have thought about it. In many cases, they've been seeking to opt out of what they see as a bad system. It's particularly telling uh, that the breadth of, the, scheme, of uh, the, the administration of financial advice left 
the most vulnerable in that sense, out in the cold. So I'm pleased that the AFSL uh, holders will need to report serious compliance concerns to the disciplinary body and that clients and stakeholders should be able to report information about the conduct of financial advisers. But while we support this bill, we know there's a lot missing. And the way the government has got to this point is frankly embarrassing. This recommendation comes from a government that for years has actively worked against the, a Royal Commission into this very same sector. It's watered down uh, previous protections from FOFA under the guise of red tape reduction. We've seen uh, of the hearings that actually took place uh, and when the interim report was finally handed down in 2019, we've seen yet again and again awkward displays from the government in implementing these reforms. The Liberals never wanted FOFA. They never wanted a Royal Commission. And the Royal Commission itself, uh, in inquiring into the scandals that were going on in wealth ma management, uh, even now, years later, we are still catching up on the legacy of all of the problems that the Royal Commission revealed. Um, I am going to try and, and truncate my uh, remarks, but I do want to note that uh, my good colleague, Senator O'Neill, has outlined in detail the roller coaster that good financial advisers have been on in jumping the hoops uh, that they are required to do to meet the standards of these reforms. And it's uh, very concerning to me uh, that we've had to go through this over and over again with these debates having happened over many years, with advocacy that's come to our offices over and over and over again, that it's taken all of this time to get to this point. And meanwhile, we see victims of financial collapse, such as the Sterling New Life collapse, still fighting for justice. And I want to thank the Senate for uh, passing a motion to refer this issue to the Senate Economics Committee. I've been speaking to these people for many years. I watched what happened to them at the same time as the Royal Commission uh, started off and started looking uh, at issues. And I can't help but think, if that Royal Commission had started earlier, that there would have been somewhere for these people to go, somewhere some, that, they would have, uh, that their losses could and should have been prevented. Instead, the scheme collapsed and their entire savings were lost. I've seen retirees having to go back into the workforce. I've seen people have to go to court to fight with their landlord in order not to be evicted after they'd paid hundreds of thousands of dollars in rent up front. I've seen people not being able to afford health care. I've seen people kicked out of their homes, homes that they'd already paid more than $200,000 to rent for the rest of their lives. We've, we know that ASIC knew about these problems and we knew that this product was re-registered and re-released. And yet, it later then again uh, collapsed. We've had many complaints about the scheme, but they did not act in a timely manner to prevent further investments uh, before the scheme collapsed. We know victims have been told to apply to the Financial Complaints Authority if they want compensation, but that in 2020 they suspended the processing of these com com claims. And it really does bring into light the importance of this legislation because whether you've the type of financial advisor that you've been through and the extent to which they're registered uh, gives you uh, a claim of compensation, for example, before AFCA. So it's incredibly important to see uh, this now tidied up inside 
uh, this legislation. And I know that it will need to be scrutinised further and more closely. I've seen examples where, uh, that are currently have been before the courts where uh, an advisor uh, working for a financial management firm uh, will sell a product, but because the firm they work for hadn't endorsed the sale of that particular product, they have managed to get away with these people not having a claim before AFCA. Now that is extraordinary, and I need to dig into whether uh, this particular scheme before the Senate now will actually fix those kinds of problems in the future. Because it is absolutely extraordinary to me that a financial services company that is making profit off a product that is being sold can get away with saying we didn't endorse that product and therefore uh, that client has no claim to compensation uh, uh, and we have no liability for it. Some of these retirees have died waiting, waiting for the government to do the right thing. They were told to wait because there was a new scheme that would help them uh, uh, get compensation, and that is the compensation scheme of last resort, which the government, uh, I know, is, uh, is finalising and is yet to bring before this place. It is a scheme that leaves them out, in part because of the nature of financial advice that they did or didn't get. It is unacceptable and it is inhuman to have people lost in a swamp of bureaucracy when they had confidence that these products were properly regulated to be strung along now for years and years and years, waiting for justice and waiting uh, for compensation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. First, oh, sorry, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, first, I would like to thank those senators who have contributed to this debate. Although many of those opposite have demonstrated a profound ignorance or a willful disregard for this important industry, crocodile tears and in, within the same breath a call for even more regulation, conflating unadvised product failure with financial advice and indeed the disrespect and indeed contempt that those opposite have held the financial advice industry in can be no better demonstrated than as recently as June Labor Senator Jenny McAllister labelling financial advisers as shonks in this very chamber. Senator McAllister said that the risk that the people that will benefit most from these arrangements are financial advisers giving shonky advice, the kind of advice we've seen again and again, the kind of advice exposed in the Hain Royal Commission. Now, the Australian Association of Financial Advisers said that these comments were unfair, unreasonable, and doing as much damage to the financial advice profession. Enough is enough, and it must stop. The Morrison government is focused on cutting red tape, cutting regulatory alignment, creating regulatory alignment and reducing regulatory costs for financial advisers and financial advice businesses, which is exactly what the industry has called for. This is the very best way to ensure that, that Australians can continue to access high quality, professional and affordable financial advice. And this bill is simply one piece of that puzzle. The Morrison government is also committed to implementing its response to the Financial Services Royal Commission and is delivering one of its commitments through this legislation. The Hain Royal Commission had 76 recommendations for reform. 54 of those were directed to government. This is number 53, and the final recommendation will be delivered in the form of legislation imminently. The remaining recommendations were to regulators and 10 to the industry, which I think is worth pointing out to Senator Sheldon. The Morrison government is also uh, this bill sorry implements recommendation 2.1 or 2.10 which recommended the establishment of a single disciplinary body for financial advisers and that all financial advisers who provide personal financial advice to retail clients be registered. The bill expands the role of the financial services and credit panel within ASIC to take on the role of the single disciplinary body and gives the panel new sanction powers. The bill also seeks to streamline the number of bodies involved in the oversight of financial advisers by transferring the functions currently undertaken by the Financial Advisor Standards and Ethics Authority to the Minister responsible for the Corporations Act 2001 and to ASIC. 
Finally, the bill provides that tax financial advisers will no longer be regulated by the Tax Practitioners Board and instead will be regulated only under the Corporations Act of 2001. This is consistent with Recommendation 7.1 from the Independent Review of the Tax Practitioners Board. Uh, Madam Deputy President, this bill reaffirms this government's support for the advice industry, building on measures such as the temporary and targeted relief for financial advisers by reducing the cost recovery levies charged by ASIC for the 2020-2021 and 2021-2022 financial years. This relief will see ASIC levies charged for personal advice to retail clients restored to their 2018-19 level of $1,142 per advisor for the next two years. This relief will represent a 63 per cent reduction relative to the level estimated in ASIC's 2020-2021 cost recovery implementation standard of $3,138 per advisor. So this means that advice businesses will save around $1,996 per advisor per year. This government recognises that during the worst days of the pandemic, thousands of Australians turned to their financial advisers. And for so many Australians, considered advice from a professional and experienced advisor was what helped them through the worst of the COVID-induced recession. Ensuring that Australians can continue to access high-quality, professional and affordable financial advice is incredibly important as we emerge from the pandemic, and I commend, commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. And the question is that the amendment moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Are those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. Oh. Okay, sorry, I'll just give the whips a few moments to sort things out. Um, everyone is aware that uh, pairing arrangements in the current circumstances are fairly complex. We're all all right. The question before the chair is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Eyes are passed to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone, teller for the eyes, and Senator McGrath, teller for the nose. President. President. There being 20 ayes, 25 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll just give you a few moments to resume your places and then I will move. The bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to financial services and for related purposes. Uh, now, I believe there have amendments. Amendments have been circulated, so we'll need to ask the deputy chair to step in. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. I'm just. The question now is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Roberts. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, I move uh, Senate, uh, amendments in the name of Senator Hanson on sheet 1468. Uh, are you seeking leave to move them together? Yes. Thank is you. leave granted? There is being no objection, leave is granted. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Roberts by leave uh, that subsections 17 in brackets 4, 1712 and 171A 2 in item 12 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Uh, the noes have it. The noes have it. Senator McAllister. Um, I wonder, Mad Madam Deputy President, if the government is voting in the way that it intends to. It is one of those questions that requires. Thank you. Um, a vote has been put and carried, so I'm in the hands of the Senate. It's not my. Res so the question is 
that subsections 174, 171.2 and 171A2 in item 12 of Schedule 1 standards is printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. So the question is that amendments 4 and 5 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Uh, the noes have it. So the question now is that the bill standard, stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? The ayes have it. The question is that the bill now be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? The ayes have it. The committee has considered the Financial Sector Hain Royal Commission Response Better Advice Bill of 2021 and agreed to it without amendment. Minister. I move that the report of the committee now be adopted. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill now be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. The bill for an act to amend the law in relation to financial services and for related purposes. Uh, Senator McGrath. Oh, okay. oh sorry. Um, on behalf of the Standing Committee on the Scrutiny of Bills, I present Scrutiny Digest 16 of 2021 and I move that the Senate take note of the report. I also seek leave to incorporate a tabling statement in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Um, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McGrath be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Fiavanti Wells. Uh, thank you, Madam De uh, Deputy President. I present delegated legislation monitor 15 of 2021 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. I rise to speak to the tabling of the Committee's delegated legislation monitor 15 of 2021. The first instrument I would like to draw to the Senate's attention is the biosecurity, human biosecurity emergency, human coronavirus with pandemic potential variation, extension number three, instrument 2021. As senators would be well aware, the emergency declaration in relation to COVID-19 was first made on the 18th of March 2020. This instrument extends the human biosecurity emergency period for a further three months. Uh, until 17 December 2021. This means that the emergency period has now been extended on six occasions, separate occasions, with no opportunity for parliamentary oversight through the disallowance process. The effect of this declaration is that the Minister for Health can continue to determine emergency requirements and give directions that he deems necessary to prevent or control COVID-19. The committee is extremely concerned that significant measures at the Commonwealth level, such as the ban on Australian citizens travelling overseas and the India travel pause, have not been subject to parliamentary oversight. During the committee's hearings last year, evidence was provided regarding the cascading effects of the declaration of a Commonwealth pandemic emergency on state and territory laws. Whilst there are diff differing laws, the continued presence of the pandemic emergency period has given succour to the imposition of harsh and draconian measures, which similarly have had little or no scrutiny by state and parliamentary par uh, parliaments. Moreover, the continued extension of the emergency period at the Commonwealth level signals to the states that it remains appropriate for restrictive state public health orders to remain in force. Conversely, an end to the Commonwealth emergency period would send a strong message that it is time to return to some level of normality. It is the com committee's view that emergency delegated legislation must be subject to appropriate parliamentary oversight. 
by continuing to make instruments under the Biosecurity Act, which are exempt from disallowance, Parliament's constitutional role as the primary institution responsible for making law is undermined. The committee appreciates that during an emergency, urgent and decisive action must be taken. However, we are now well into the second year of this pandemic, and that excuse is no longer valid. Parliament needs oversight over these critical decisions now and into the future. In the committee's previous monitor, the committee sought Minister Hunt's advice about whether the government will consider amending the Biosecurity Act to provide that any future emergency determinations and extensions to the emergency period will be subject to disallowance. Yesterday, Minister Hunt advised that he considers that such amendments are not necessary. For these reasons, not only will the committee be seeking the minister's advice about this instrument's exemption from disallowance, but the committee also intends to move amendments to the Biosecurity Amendment Enhanced Risk Management Bill 2021 that is currently before the parliament to reflect the committee's unanimous view that any future determinations and extensions should be subject to disallowance. I would like to further note that in December last year, the committee tabled its interim report of its inquiry into the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight, which details the concerns which I have raised again today. It is with deep concern that I advise the chamber that the government has still not responded to this report 10 months later, despite the urgent and significant concerns detailed in this report. On this note, I thank the Chamber for agreeing to an order for production of documents earlier today requiring this response to be tabled on the next sitting day. The second instrument I raise is the Legislation Exemptions and Other Matters Amendment 2021 Measures No. 1 Regulations 2021. This instrument amends the Legislation Exemptions and Other Matters Regulation 2015 to extend exemptions to disallowance and sunsetting in relation to certain legislative instruments. In, this includes extending an exemption from disallowance for instructions given under the Air Services Regulation 2019 and exemption of motor vehicle standards under the Road Vehicle Standards 28, 2018 from sunsetting. The committee considers that exemptions from essential parliamentary oversight mechanisms such as disallowance and sunsetting should be outlined in primary rather than delegated legislation and soundly justified in the explanatory materials. Further, as acknowledged by the Chamber in June, exemptions from these crucial oversight mechanisms should only be made in the most limited circumstances. The committee has previously raised these concerns with the Attorney-General. However, the committee considers the AG's response did not sufficiently address these concerns, particularly about the justification for these exemptions and their inclusion in delegated legislation. It is unsatisfactory that the committee's detailed scrutiny concerns and recommendations in this report about the inappropriateness of the most, exist of the most existing exemptions from disallowance appear to have been wholly disregarded in the making of this instrument. For this reason, the committee is seeking the AG's further advice regarding why these exemptions from parliamentary oversight are appropriate and necessary, and if they truly are necessary, whether they can at least be included in primary legislation. On the issue of disallowance, I note that since the changes to the committee's standing orders came into effect on 1 July, the committee has so far considered 35 instruments which are exempt from disallowance. Of these 35, only one has met the committee's standards and is appropriately exempt. That is less than 3 per cent, and it is not good enough. This is an issue that the committee will continue to rigorous, rigorously pursue into the future. Finally, I would like to mention the Australian Renewable Energy Agency implementing the Technology Investment Roadmap Regulations 2021. The Chamber will recall disallowing a similar instrument on 22 June last year. In this monitor, the committee draws the Senate's attention to a third instrument made under the ARENA Act, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency General Funding Strategy Determination 2021. Concerningly, this is yet another significant M uh, instrument that is exempt from disallowance. The committee has the same concerns in relation to all three ARENA instruments, noting that all three are made under the ARENA Act, the object of which is, which is to improve the competitiveness and supply of renewable energy in Australia. The committee is recommending that the Senate disallow the Technology Investment Roadmap regulations for two primary reasons. 
first on the basis that it may be expanding the remit of the Australian Renewable Energy Agency beyond the power of its enabling legislation. And secondly, we are concerned that the regulations deal with the significant matter of expanding the jurisdiction of ARENA from investing in renewable energy technologies to programs relating to energy efficiency and low emissions technology. It is therefore the committee's strong view that the measures set out in the regulations are more appropriate for parliamentary enactment. Before concluding, I would like to briefly update the Senate on the committee's consideration of the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission Amendment 2021 Measures No. 2 Regulations 2021. The committee is very cognisant of the concerns that have been raised in relation to these regulations, including with the committee directly. I expect many colleagues also share these concerns. The instrument amends the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission Regulation 2013 to alter certain governance standards relating to charities' engagement in or promotion of unlawful activities. The committee's most significant outstanding scrutiny concerns centre on a provision of the instrument which requires charities to maintain reasonable internal control procedures to ensure that its resources are neither used nor continued to be used to actively promote another, another entity's unlawful acts or omissions. The committee is concerned that this provision appears to enable the ACNC Commissioner to exercise a broad discretion in determining compliance with the governance standards. In addition, the lack of clarity on what will constitute reasonable internal control procedures may inhibit charities' ability to understand their obligations under the instrument. Due to these substantive scrutiny concerns, the committee is recommending that the Senate disallow the instrument. With these comments, I commend the committee's delegated legislation monitor 15 of 2021 to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Carr. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, I would like to say a few words in support of the chair of the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee. I'm the deputy chair of that committee. This is a committee that has a long history in this place, and throughout its 90 years of work, the Senate Standing Committee on the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation has played an essential role in ensuring that there is an effective parliamentary scrutiny of executive-made laws a role which all of us in this chamber have a constitutional obligation to undertake. We are, of course, to quote Odgers, a house of review and reflection. It is this tradition that this committee has conducted in its work on a bipartisan basis, with a focus on holding the executive's exercise of lawmaking powers to account, so that in its 90-year history the committee has never taken the unprecedented action that we are seeing before the Senate today. In its, con in its concurrence with a statement that has been made by the Deputy Chair of the Scrutiny of Bills Committee about matters arising from the Biosecurity Act of 2015. And Senator Smith was act is the acting chair of that committee, and he has incorporated a statement to the chamber shortly before these remarks. Parliament's role in overseeing the delegated legislation is made in response to COVID-19 has been unquestionably constrained since the beginning of the pandemic. The powers of the Biosecurity Act have been the government's main legislative vehicle. And this has allowed the Minister for Health to make a human biosecurity emergency declaration with its provision to take effect despite any other law. Perhaps I could ask the colleagues in the corner here if they could perhaps reduce it to a loud shout. Order, uh, please. This, is, uh, as I say, has allowed the Minister for Health to change any other piece of legislation within this Commonwealth. The Minister is uh, seeking now to extend the powers of the Human Biosecurity Emergency Declaration to the extent for a sixth time, notionally ending on the 17th of December 2021. And I don't think we will know if that will be the last time that he will be seeking that. And if it isn't, 
There's nothing in this chamber can do about that, given that these instruments are not disallowable. The committee has previously raised significant concerns about the exemption from disallowance of legislative instruments made under the Biosecurity Act. The committee has suggested that the minister uh, the amendments that should be moved under the Biosecurity Amendment, Enhanced Risk Management Bill 2021, be amended, that is section 7476 of the Biosecurity Act, to provide that any future variations to extend the human biosecurity emergency period be subject to disallowance. That is subject to this chamber or the House of Representatives actually being able to address that matter. Now, in that correspondence, the ministers replied that he had told the committee that he thought there had been extensive and robust debate through both houses of parliament when the bill was introduced in 2015, and that therefore the possibility of down disallowance was not necessary. Now that was a bill that was, introduced, was, was debated in 2015, which is essentially about fauna and fauna, not about pandemics. Neither the bill nor the explanatory memorandum even mentioned the word pandemic. So it's hardly uh, received the extensive debate that the minister contended. The House of Representatives and the Senate both spent about five hours considering that bill, a bill which has fundamentally changed the regulatory regime in this country and had the effect of changing the way in which the states and territories have dealt with that issue right across the Commonwealth. And with only minor amendments, the bills was both passed the House of the Parliament on the 14th of May 2015. And Senator Smith's pointed out in the chamber in the tabled statement, we're seeing more and more examples of coercive powers being bestowed upon a minister without parliamentary oversight. These include that uh, provisions where individuals are provided to take uh, medical examinations and provide body samples through that coercive powers. So time and time again, in the correspondence from ministers, this action is taken in the name of so-called administrative flexibility. And the committee is being told that it's being subject to disallowance would only undermine the government's ability to respond to emergency threats. Now, the committee acknowledges there are genuine emergencies and that there should be exemptions in its specific cases, but not a blanket principle of exemption or disallowance in all circumstances, which is the way in which this position has been put by, in the correspondence so often from ministerial officers. It is unfortunate that we are seeing a growing contemptuous tone from the executive about the concerns that the, this committee and a sister committee have raised. The committee has taken its unprecedented steps in holding public hearings for the first time in, the, in its history into the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight in 2020 with its 11 recommendations which have been made and which uh, Senator uh, the chair of the committee has already indicated have not yet been responded to by the government. Now I note that the committee has moved a motion tonight to gain a, a commitment from the executive and I'm sure that uh, I'm, I'm advised by other members of the government the government will respond. I look forward to that. Parliament and the public should be able and to be able to rely upon proper public administration, but it should also be able to rely upon proper parliamentary scrutiny of that legislation. At the start of the pandemic, when human biosecurity emergency was declared, the committee uh, chose to facilitate public scrutiny of COVID-19 related delegated legislation. A table of the committee's website lists all the delegated legislation registered on the Federal Parliamentary Register of Legislation since the 18th of March 2020. And as of the 15th of October 2021, 578 legislative instruments have been made in response to COVID-19. The committee has long stressed its concern about the growth of disallowable instruments uh, and, and, of course, the issue of the way in which the executive is ruling by decree as a result 
of this fundamental change in the way in which legislation is moved through this parliament. Now, in March, the committee's inquiry reported that the volume of delegated legislation made each year has increased over time, from an average in the mid-1980s of around 850 disallowable instruments table each year, and it currently sits around 1,500 each year. This is not a trend we should be proud of, particularly when we consider the number of those legis pieces of uh, these instruments which cannot be in any way uh, overturned through the processes of the parliament. That to me is a matter of deep concern. Senators, if we do not do our duty, take up our responsibilities to correct this dangerous state of affairs, we are rightly, properly accused of negligence, and so we should be. I commend the report to the chamber. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you. On behalf of the Joint Committee on Human— Sorry, I just need to put the question oh. on the previous um, uh, motion. Uh, the, uh, the motion moved by uh, Senator Firibanti Wells. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Davey. Sorry, Senator Firibanti Wells. Thank you. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, I present Human Rights Scrutiny Report 12 of 2021. Uh, and on behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Law Enforcement, I present the report of the committee on its examination of the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission Annual Report 2019 to 2020, together with accompanying documents. Senator Ayres. On behalf of the Chair of the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee, Senator Stirl, I present the report of the committee on the federal government's drought response together with accompanying documents, and I move that the Senate take note of the report, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, there being no objection, leave is granted. All right, we move to consideration of documents. The Senate will now concede, uh, proceed to consideration of documents which are listed on page 8 to 11 of the notice paper. Uh, any document which no senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. Senate Minister, are you seeking the call? I'm looking to table some government responses. Well, do we um, consideration of documents? Is there any Senator Ayres? Uh, Mr. President, I um, move, if that's the right phrase, it would take I, I take note of documents one, two and four on page 8 and 5, 8, 9 and 10 on page 9 and documents 16, 23, 25 and 29 on page 10 and documents 34, 35 and 37 on page 11. And, uh, mm. seek, leave. seek leave to continue my remarks. There being no objection, leave is granted. Were there any other documents? No? All right, we shall move on then. Minister, will you seek the call? I will now. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I present two government responses to the following committee reports, the 484th report of the Joint Committee on Public Accounts and Audit relating to administration of government grants, and Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade report on def Australia's defence relationships with Pacific Island nations. In accordance with the usual practice, I seek leave to have the documents incorporated in Hansard. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Ayres. Mr President, I take note of uh, committee reports 1 and 3 on page 11, uh, and 11, 13 and 15 on page 12, uh, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Do I now deal with the Auditor General's? Or is that the next in the? I know that's that's part. Thank of you, and and also take note of item one and two in the Auditor General's reports. Uh, there being no and seek leave to, con to continue. My there remarks. being no objection, leave is granted. I will just point out that we are in uh, consideration of reports and responses. Uh, was there any other, Senator Cox? Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I rise to make a contribution. On the tabling of the Joint Standing Committee on Northern Australia's final report, A Way Forward, 
I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land uh, I'm on and the traditional owners all over the country. I pay my respects to the elders past and present and the continued practice of caring for country and culture. This was a significant inquiry that shone a light in so many ways in which First Nations cultural heritage is destroyed and sometimes even encouraged in this country. While Duke and Gorge was a wake-up call for many Australians, the willful and legal destruction of cultural heritage is not new for First Nations people. As the final report clearly shows, First Nations people across Western Australia have been experiencing the impact of inadequate legislation for decades. Commonwealth and state governments are prioritising the interests of mining companies over the protection of cultural heritage. Gag clauses have been used for decades to pre prevent First Nations people from speaking out on activities that are happening on country. I was pleased to see the committee recommend that the gag clauses and clauses restricting First Nations people's access to Commonwealth heritage protections should be prohibited. The committee has made important recommendations that, if enacted, have the power to change the way we protect and preserve tangible and intangible heritage. The committee recommends the implementation of new Commonwealth legislation, legislative framework for cultural heritage protection at a national level, developed through a co-design process with First Nations people. As my colleague Senator Thorpe noted, it's important that this entire process is First Nations-led. The committee also recommends that this new legislation is set to set out a minimum standard for states and territory heritage protections that are consistent with the relative international law, including the International Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and the Daru Nalu a Vision for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage in Australia. I would like to highlight what's going on in my home state, Western Australia, to demonstrate why a national framework for cultural heritage protection is so important. As outlined in the final report, the main legal framework for cultural heritage in WA is currently the Aboriginal Heritage Act of 1972 WA. This is completely inadequate. This act enables the legal destruction of cultural heritage and does not respect the right of self-determination or free prior informed consent. It serves the interests of mining companies and not of the community. There is a strong agreement that new legislation and regulations are needed to replace the current Act, with the WA government embarking on a reform process over the past 18 months. However, draft legislation has been, has been presented to the community is not strong enough to prevent the destruction that occurred at Duke and Gorge. Claims of consultation have been nothing more than one-way stakeholder engagement, frustrating many First Nations people to the point that they walked out. The WA Cultural Heritage Alliance, which rep has representation of cultural owners from across the state, have met with the minister but have been told that the consultation period is now closed and no further comments on the draft will be accepted. Community hasn't even seen the final draft of this bill and are afraid that it will be introduced and rushed through by a majority Labor government without the voices of First Nations people being heard, and this is simply unacceptable. The draft bill does not meet best practice international standards. It is incompatible with the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination and does not meet the minimum standards set out in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The core problem with this bill is that it fails to recognise First Nations people as the primary decision makers in the protection of their cultural heritage. There are strong concerns that the bill will make it worse and actually take us backwards. In part, this is because the bill gives proponents the power to decide on what constitutes First Nations cultural heritage and to make critical judgments about whether their proposed activities will actually destroy heritage. Proponents should not be making decisions about cultural heritage. This does not meet the principle of free prior informed consent. The draft bill will also give the minister the final say over the destruction of First Nations cultural heritage and does not include an appeals process. Any decision-making can be overturned by the minister in the social and economic interests of the state. This enables the minister to authorise the destruction of cultural heritage and risks replicating the process we've had with the 18C, Section 18Cs all over again. All decision-making around cultural heritage must rest with the traditional owners, not mining companies or the minister. In my home state, 
18, the Section 18Cs has become a damage by permit system, which actually facilitates the capacity of mining companies to legally destroy First Senator, Nations cultural heritage. Thank you, Senator. Senator Cox, are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? Yeah, I seek leave to continue. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. No objection. Sure, leave bit. is granted. Now, I'll just confirm that there are no more contributions for reports and responses. Any report or response to which no senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. Are there any ministerial statements? I table a document relating to the order of production of documents concerning the government response to the report of the scrutiny of delegated legislation committee on the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight. Thank you, Minister. No further ministerial statements? All right. We're just going to have a quick change of chair. The President has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. Minister. I leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Uh, there being no objection, leave is granted. I move that sen senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. The question before the chair is as moved by the minister. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Counter-Terrorism Legislation Amendment High-Risk Terrorist Offenders Bill 2021 for concurrence. Minister. Uh, I move this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the bill will be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to counter-terrorism and for related purposes. Minister. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that the debate be now adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Minister. I move the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. Uh, the question is that the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Scrutiny Legislation Security Legislation Amendment, Critical Infrastructure Bill 2021, for concurrence. Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, I move this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is the bill be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. The bill for an act to amend legislation relating to critical infrastructure and for other purposes. Minister. Uh, I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to 22nd of November 2021. Clark. General Business Notice of Motion 1256 standing in the name of Senator Rice relating to income support. Senator Rice. You Thanks, have Acting Deputy President. So I move General Business Notice of Motion number 1256 about Anti Poverty Week. This motion notes that this week is Anti Poverty Week and that currently more than 2.65 million people in Australia live below the poverty line, with many at risk of homelessness. During 2020, around 3 million Australians were protected from poverty when the federal government increased the income support rates, doubling JobSeeker. My motion calls on the federal government to take immediate action to increase income support above the poverty line and to invest in social housing. The rate of people living in a pov poverty in Australia is appalling, and it's particularly appalling because we've seen so recently that can be different. In 2020, we saw payment rates lifted for the first time in years above the poverty line. We heard from people who were trapped in poverty what a difference that made to their lives, what a difference the coronavirus supplement made. Connie Lenneberg, the director of the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, she wrote, 
one family told us that for the first time they were, they were able to eat three meals a day. Previously, there were only three or four days in the week when they could all afford to eat meals. Sitting down to breakfast together each morning was a new experience. A father of two young children, Tim, told us that for the first time he could afford nappies and formula for his seven-month-old, food and clothes for his three-year-old, and still have enough for himself and his wife to eat well. And others have spoken about being able to afford fresh food for the first time, of being able to buy their medicines and pay their rent on time. All of these things that the rest of us who aren't living in poverty take for granted. This government has made a choice. After seeing the difference, the demonstrable difference that raising the rate of income support made to people's lives, the government chose to once again to slash the level of income support and force people back into poverty. I also want to share the story of Melissa, who is one of the people forced to live on a payment below the poverty line. Uh, about six months after being put on job seeker, I made a suicide attempt. When I was asked why I'd done this, my only response at the time was, because I can't afford to live. Worst part after losing mum was going on to job seeker because I was thrown into even more poverty. It felt like everything was falling down beside me and all of a sudden I didn't have the money to support me. We are not bludgers. There are real barriers to working and we are just doing the best we can to survive. I emailed a lot of people who have previously had been supporting our Greens campaigns and supporting the fantastic work that Senator Rachel Seward has done over the last six years on poverty and on raising the rate. I emailed them during the week in introducing myself as the Greens' new spokesperson for community affairs and asked them to share their stories with me about the importance of and what it would mean to them if JobSeeker was doubled, what it would mean to them to be no longer living in poverty, and what their experience of living in poverty while living on, on JobSeeker currently was. And I had many people that immediately got, got back to me. And some of the things they told me, that how they often had to choose whether to buy food or medication or to keep the lights or heat on. Someone said, I had to stop medications I should be taking because I cannot afford them. My consumption has, of food has been reduced by so much in the last eight months that I have lost 30 kilograms. Someone else said, I have managed to keep a roof over my head, but at the expense of everything else. This has affected my mental health, and now I now spend most of my time in the house, unable to go out. Another person, I have a car I can't afford to run, so basically I'm in this house 24 hours a day. Someone else, I'm a diabetic. So lack of food causes my sugars to go down often, resulting in coma-like episodes. I can't afford physio, said another person. I can't afford medication all the time. And then, when job seeker payments were increased last year, I could afford to pay my bills and not worry so much about having to work in pain in work that I'm no longer suited to. Then we had what happens to people who find themselves through no fault of their own not being able to work. Some, this person said after they had been living on JobKeeper, JobSeeker for the last year, since then my savings, which are mostly made up of super money I withdrew, have gone down at a rapid rate. I've had to take out around $1,000 a month to get by. My employment provider, they've done nothing. Literally, they refuse to help with PPE, uniform, self-education expenses. So, with Indu making around 12k a year from me because they are on the debit ca cashless debit card, and the DES provider getting around $400 once a fortnight from me for having to visit them, they are getting the exact same amount I receive in payments for, for these companies. The rate of job seeker payment is designed to punish people and to force them to work for bad employers who should not be in business. And then one other person said, being on Job Seeker feels like a punishment, a punishment for not being able to find work when there simply aren't enough jobs to go around. You see people around you enjoying the most basic things, like catching up with friends for, for a coffee, and you feel like you've been kicked when you're already down. It's a punishment, and it is killing people. And what's particularly appalling when you hear these heartbreaking stories is in the midst of the COVID pandemic, 
the major corporations were raking in the funding hand over fist. They were making out like bandits. Costings by the Parliamentary Budget Office estimate that if just 65 corporations who paid executive bonuses or made excessive profits returned the JobKeeper funds that they got, it would involve returning over a billion dollars. But JobKeeper isn't the only program that corporations made very, made very well out of. The last budget set out $11.4 billion in subsidies to keep burning fossil fuels and $1.1 billion for new coal and gas projects. So this government can afford to pay subsidies for the biggest polluters in a climate crisis, but cannot, it says it cannot afford to rescue people from the whirlpool of poverty that they are trapped in. And of course, there are so many other forms of support for corporations and the ultra-rich. Research commissioned by Anglicare estimated the cost of tax concessions for the wealthiest 20 per cent in our community amounted to $68 billion every year. And that research was several years ago, and I feel confident that the number hasn't gone down. But while the government is making this choice to reward billionaires and big corporations, they're also making another choice to force people into poverty, to force people to live on a payment whose rate is below the poverty line. So I also want to share some accounts of people who have faced Centrelink debts. I mean, earlier today, in, re in answer to my question at question time, the minister told me that no, they weren't going to be going after corporations who had made profits out of JobKeeper, um, but then said that the people who had inadvertently got both JobSeeker and JobKeeper, that they, they potentially had committed fraud, that yes, they were going to go after them because they had committed fraud. I want to share the voices that this government has made the choice to punish. This is what one person had to say to me. I was initially told that I didn't qualify for JobKeeper, along with 120 other casual employees. As it turns out, I did. In the meantime, I got JobSeeker. When JobKeeper came through, I was back paid and rang Centrelink to let them know. In that conversation, I explained the details of having to fight for JobKeeper. They informed me that they could not collect debt at that time by law and that I'd be asked to return overpayments when they were able to collect again. Even voluntary payment wasn't allowed. And many months later, I get an incredibly rude phone call. You didn't declare your job keeper from date X to date Y. And I had to go through the entire thing again, stating clearly that this should be all on the record. I'd written down dates and amounts approximately six months earlier and said I needed to find all that paperwork because the phone call was out of the blue. The amount they wanted returned was well over what I had recorded and I went through it with a fine tooth comb. It was two fortnights only, but they were attempting to get three. This did eventually get sorted and I paid the correct amount. But I'm in Melbourne where we've spent around 43 per cent of our lives in lockdown since the 30th of March 2020. I have a casual dog job in retail. They dock my pay per fortnight that I get to work, but don't account for the times I'm legally not allowed to. I'm earning well under the, the annual amounts for pay docking. No system has been introduced to help us or to account for this. They are very quick to take our earnings, but in, in, ignore completely when they owe us. This is how our government treats some of the most vulnerable people in our society, the poorest people, people who are really living on the edge. Look, I think there are stories after stories after stories of people living in poverty, and it's a choice. It's a political choice. We could lift people out of poverty. It is possible. It's a political choice. We could raise the rate, like we did last year, when people suddenly discovered that they could live life again, suddenly discovered that they could get by, suddenly discovered that they could actually earn enough, they had enough money to eat well, to be able to get themselves to jobs, to be able to feed their kids. This is a political choice. The Greens are calling for our income support rate to be lifted above the poverty line. It's the least we can do in the rich country that we live in. It's the least we can do. And the, the response from this government that we need, instead of doing this, that's going to discourage people from, from getting work is just such a furphy.
Those jobs aren't there. It's really just labelling people as, as dull bludgers when, in fact, we have got people who are doing everything they can to be keeping their heads above water. It is the least we can be doing to be looking after people in our society. We are a wealthy country. We can afford to be doubling our income support rate, to be lifting people out of poverty, to be giving everybody the opportunity to be living meaningful and fulfilling lives. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Hughes. President. I mean, I just, it's just a groundhog day. Here we are again. And I know Senator Seawitt's left, so someone else has got to start to make their mark. But I mean, this is just getting beyond a joke. But I do know that the Greens love to share stories. So I thought I'd start with a couple of stories of my own. I want to talk about John, down in Jarvis Bay, who owns a motel, who called me as he was making the beds because he cannot get staff. And one of the reasons he couldn't get staff in rural and regional areas when we had the additional job seeker supplements being paid, it was actually more beneficial for people to go lie on the beach rather than work. So all of these businesses that were requiring staff could not get them because they were earning more money or pretty good, you know, pretty good rate, not having to work, not having to participate in the economy or in the community in any meaningful way. Then we've got you know, friends of mine up in Moree. I, I know I was referred to, I think, from Senator McAllister today as the senator for Sydney, a little bit offensive, uh, after the decade and a half I spent in Moree, uh, cannot get a worker into one of the, as they prep the cotton gins for a boom harvest of cotton next year, let alone where they are with the current grain harvest. So if we want to talk about opportunities, there is more work available than ever before. The post-pandemic economy is absolutely booming. And there are plenty of jobs at every level of skill. So we don't need to talk about the fact that some of them are highly skilled jobs. There's plenty of jobs across the board. There's plenty of opportunity for people who want to work. And this is the difference between us and those that sit at the far end of the chamber, because we, say, we see our social security system as a safety net, something that is there for everyday Australians when they need it, not a living wage, not a substitute for participating in the economy and contributing to this country. The social security safety net that we provide is paid for by taxpayers. So we owe it to every single taxpayer to ensure that not only is the safety net sustainable, that it is viable and accessible to everybody should they need it, that it's not a permanent stop. It's somewhere where we encourage people to do training. We offer job training and courses and resumes and how to dress for an interview. All of those skills are provided because we know the best form of welfare is a job. And it's not just the cash side of it that helps. It's the community engagement. It's the interaction with workers. It's the boost to your own self-esteem and mental health. It's also a fantastic example to show your children, because we do know too many children in this country grow up in a cycle of unemployment that leads to unemployment from generation to generation to generation. And whilst there is a job seeker rate, there are also substantial additional payments on top of that. And never mentioned by the Greens at the end of the chamber. They forget about those. They forget about the rental assistance, forget about the phone assistance, they forget about uh, the uh, FTB Part A, Family Tax Benefit Part A and Part B that a lot of these families can access. They forget about the pharmaceutical allowance. They forget about the health care card. They forget about bulk billing and medical services. All of these things are never mentioned because we just want to talk about one rate and one rate alone. But I'm not going to keep everyone here all night because I do know we've had our hours extended already. But I just wanted to read you out a tweet today from a girlfriend of mine. And she grew up in public housing. And what she tweeted was, I managed to crawl out of that hellhole of public housing life, work and study since 17, buy a house, have a family, travel the world and even eat in fancy restaurants while doing interesting things for a living. She is an absolutely outstanding example of someone who worked hard to pull herself up and contribute back to this country. Uh, not only does she have herself made a contribution, she has a beautiful son and a gorgeous dog, Scout, 
and she's contributing into this country in a very significant way. Our social security system is there as a safety net. It is there for all Australians. It is paid for for all Australians. Unlike other countries, there's no limit, no time limit. But we encourage Australians to take up the supports that we provide and to look at getting back into the workforce because that is where they are going to be most happy. Thank you very much, Senator Hughes. Uh, Senator Grogan, you have the call. Thank you. Um, I am also going to abandon what I was going to say and just respond to what has been said across the chamber uh, just now. There are so many people in this country who rely on those support payments and all the other additional support payments that were referred to, and they also would like a job. The understanding of those on the other side of the chamber that anyone who is unemployed is just a dull blunder, who is just lazy, who just cannot be bothered, is a total and utter falsehood. There are people who are living below the poverty line in this country, and they want a hand up. They want an education. They want to be able to get a job. And I can assure you that those employment services that have been had their praises sung are not delivering on those promises. They are not providing the support that people need. So I would just say that it is anti-poverty week, and the biggest problem we have in this country is the attitude of some people to those who are disadvantaged, to those who are unwell, to those who cannot find a job. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Grogan. Uh, Senator Cox. I rise also to make my contribution to today's general business debate on anti-poverty week. Um, provides everyone in this, in this chamber an opportunity to stop and reflect. And uh, I echo uh, Senator Grogan's comments as well. Um, as we we've been in a state of permanent living in poverty is actually a permanent state of lockdown for people, and we have to um, we have to see that as a reality for some of our Australians. It, it has a devastating impact on your health and your mental health, your relationships, your family, your ability to thrive and have a full life. It impacts on your ability to access safe housing, good education and health services. And as others have said, this is a wealth, wealthy country and no one should be living below the poverty line. Yet we've got a government that chooses income support payments below the poverty line. We have a social security system that fails First Nations people. This is com compounded by the fact that this government willfully chooses to put people in place, uh, put in place punitive projects or programs that hurt our mob, and they include the cashless debit card and the um, CDP program. Until recently, CDP imposed harsher penalties and onerous conditions on First Nations people, particularly living in remote areas. CDP actually exacerbated poverty and food insecurity and even led to First Nations people disengaging with the system altogether. While people welcomed Minister Wyatt's announcement on CDP uh, that would recently be rehauled and replaced, I'm sad to say that the new program doesn't look any better. The government hasn't announced what communities will trial in the next program and how they were selected. In fact, the Coalition of Peaks and the Aboriginal Peak organisations of the Northern Territory only learnt about this bill when it was tabled in Parliament. And this doesn't embody the partnership and shared decision making that we've been told um, with First Nations people should happen uh, by governments agreeing under the National Partnership Agreement to close the gap. It's, it's ridiculous. First Nation communities, elders, leaders and organisations have long demanded that all levels of government work in true partnership to create sustainable jobs that pay a living wage in remote communities. If the government listened, they would learn about the proposals from the community and address the job situation in remote communities. For example, the Aboriginal peak organisations of the Northern Territory have put forward their proposal on a fair work, strong communities uh, program to address the lack of good, sustainable jobs in remote communities. Under this plan, 12,000 jobs in community-controlled organisations would be created while valuing the strength, resilience, cultural, environmental and community care work that is done every single day in their communities. This is what is possible when First Nations people are in the driving seat delivering those solutions. We are all aware of the devastating impacts that poverty can have on your mental health. Living in poverty means you are under constant stress. People who are trapped in the cycle of poverty often find it impossible 
to access long-term mental health treatments. Mental health services in Australia are out of reach for too many people who cannot afford to access them. It is not only the lack of mental health system services, it's also the inadequacy of the income support payments and the punitive approach that to Social Security. Cutting or suspending someone's income support payment doesn't work. It hurts people in the long run and compounds their tra trauma and suffering. Recently, the Greens announced our plan to create universal, unlimited and available mental health care through Medicare. Funded by taxing the billionaires and the big corporations who are making the big profits, imagine the positive impact that would have in our communities. When everyone can access free mental health support, our whole community will benefit through an improved quality of life, improved relationships, a better performance while studying or working. One of the key solutions to addressing poverty is raising the rate of income support payments above the poverty line, which this government has failed to do. First Nations people experience poverty at a higher rate than non-Indigenous people. This is a direct re result of the ongoing legacy of colonisation and intergenerational trauma. Raising the rate of income support payments above the poverty line will have a direct impact in our communities. During the Senate inquiry into the adequacy of New Start, Naja provided event, evidence from an, a client who lived in their remote community of Beswick. And they said, I went back to work yesterday, finding it hard to pay my bills and housing, finding it hard to buy food. When you're on New Start, it's, an, it's not enough. It's making me feel hurt inside. You've not got enough to pay your bills, power, or even buy food. Just recently, I got a debit from my bank. When I went to take it out, I only had $54. It caused me and my son to fight and argue about money that I had. When you're struggling with New Start allowance, it hurts inside. How are you going to buy food and power? I like to share my money, even though it's small. I like to buy food and share with my family. It makes me sad inside when I can't do this. It makes me feel worried about what to do. It makes me feel like I want to hurt myself. It makes me feel stressed and I sometimes run out of money. Now, if that doesn't hit you right in the chest, hearing that this amount of stress is caused because people are living below the poverty line. We all saw what happened last year when the government doubled the rate of JobKeeper payment. People across the country finally had enough money to put food on the table, afford essential medications and pay their rent. This extra income had a huge impact on families doing it tough as a result of the pandemic. It meant they had enough to cover the basics like healthy food, warm clothes in winter and after-school activities like sport and music. Importantly, it relieved stress on parents and children, which compounds hardship. And As a single mother, I can attest to that. Some of it was meant to escape was, it was also as a means to escape violence. I'm proud to be a part of the only party in this place that has consistently called for an increase in income support payments. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cox. The question is that the... Uh, I'll just deal with this and then I'll come to you, uh, Senator Stoker. Uh, the question is that the motion moved by Senator Rice now be agreed. Those at opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. A uh, nice habit. Would so are you going to defer it? Do you want to seek leave to defer it, Senator Kim? Chair, Seeking leave I, to I defer it. Is leave granted? Right. Leave is granted. Thank you. Thank did I? No, I did. I did. I called the noes, have it, but Senator McKim sought leave to defer it to later. That's okay. I might not have been clear. Thank you. Uh, Senator Stoker. Mr Acting Deputy President, I seek leave pursuant to Standing Order 190 to raise a matter of personal explanation of no longer than two minutes. Is leave granted? For two minutes, leave is granted. Thank you. Earlier today, Senator Sheldon compared my views on industrial relations to the callous cruelty displayed on the popular Netflix show Squid Game. But in doing so, he's misled this chamber, falsely claiming that I had called particular Qantas staff, quote, inflexible and unreasonable, close quote. Referring to the take note debate in December last year, Senator Sheldon claimed I had accused 2,000 Qantas workers 
whose jobs had been outsourced, of being inflexible and unreasonable. He claimed I supported forcing workers into work arrangements or rates of pay, regardless of how unfair they may be, with those who resisted to be turfed out onto the street. Um, if it's not obvious from its absurdity, this could not be any further from the truth. My only statement about the Qantas workers who had tragically lost their jobs was to say that it was a disaster. I explained that this was why the Morrison government had put so much effort and so much of the public's resources into trying to keep businesses afloat during COVID so they could keep on their staff. And far from forcing people into the situations Senator Sheldon described, I was arguing in favour of a healthy and vibrant economy so we have fewer vulnerable people in our society. When I use the terms inflexible and unreasonable to describe um, something in my take note contribution, it was to describe the approach of Senator Sheldon and his Labor colleagues to industrial relations, not to the 2000 Qantas workers. I described how rigid and inflexible workplace relations laws risk making it harder for businesses to employ people, depriving them of the dignity of work. No one wants to see the kind of gore that is shown in Squid Game in, in the world of real life, uh, but we ought to be able to disagree without running scare campaigns and without comparing each other to fictional psychopaths who prey Senator, on the vulnerable for Senator. sport. Thank you. Pursuant to order, the Senate will now stand adjourned. I remind honourable senators that legislation committees will meet to consider estimates commencing on Monday 25 October 2021 at 9am. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again on Monday 22 November at 10am. <laughs>